broadcasting a classic production from the archives in which Ralph Richardson plays the storyteller and Scrooge with music composed by Christopher Whelan. A Christmas Carol. Marley was dead to begin with. There was no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. But Scrooge never painted out his name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. Scrooge made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, My dear Scrooge, how are you? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. And no man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Once upon a time, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, and the fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole. The door in Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that he put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle. Suddenly, the street door opened, and a cheerful voice, the voice of Scrooge's nephew, cried, A Merry Christmas, Uncle! Christmas? Bah! Humbug! Christmas a humbug? Oh, oh you don't mean that, I'm sure, Uncle. I do. Merry Christmas. What reason have you to be merry? What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? Bah! Every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Come, Uncle, dine with us tomorrow. I'll see you damn first. But why? Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry for you, Uncle, with all my heart. But I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. A Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew left, only stopping to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. And a very Merry Christmas to you too, sir. There's another fellow, my clerk, with 15 shillings a week, a wife and family, talking about a merry Christmas. Ha! I'll retire to Bedlam. But this lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let someone else in. It was a portly gentleman, pleasant to behold, who now stood with his hat off in Scrooge's office. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe... Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley's been dead these seven years. Seven years this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor? Both very busy, sir. I'm glad to hear it. I don't make merry myself at Christmas and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I hope to support the establishments I've mentioned and those who are badly off must go there. Many would rather die. If they would rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, sir. Seeing that it would be useless to pursue the matter further, the gentleman withdrew 
and Scrooge resumed his labors with an improved opinion of himself. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head. The cold became intense. The brightness of the shops, where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows, made pale faces ruddy as they passed. The Lord Mayor, in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should. And even the little tailor, whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret while his lean wife and baby sallied out to buy the beef. In the piercing, searching, biting cold, a boy stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. But at the first sound of God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay, Scrooge seized a ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool, and the expectant clerk in the tank snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, Cratchit? If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. I'll be bound. It's only once a year, sir. Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no greatcoat, went down a slide on Cornhill twenty times in honor of its being Christmas Eve and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at blind man's buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard, with a fog and frost hung about the black old gateway. There was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large, and Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. But when he put his key in the lock, he saw in the knocker Marley's face. Marley's face. It was not in impenetrable shadow, as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by a breath or hot air. And though the eyes were wide open, they were motionless. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it became a knocker again. To say that he was not startled or that his blood was not conscious of a terrible sensation would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key, turned it, walked in, and lighted his candle. He did pause with a moment's irresolution, and he did look cautiously behind the door, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, Oh, oh, and closed it with a bang which resounded through the house like thunder. He fastened the door, walked across the hall and up the stairs, trimming his candle as he went. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But this night, 
Before he shut his own heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. His glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell, that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound. But soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. They ceased as suddenly as they had begun, and were succeeded by a clanking noise, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the cellar, the door of which flew open with a booming sound. Then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door, then through the door and into the room. It was Marley. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, and with a kerchief bound around his head and chin. The chain he drew was long and wound about him like a tail was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. I won't believe it, said Scrooge to himself. And then, aloud, What do you want with me? But who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life I was Jacob Marley, your partner. Can you... can you sit down? I can. Do it, then. You don't believe in me. I don't. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug. At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage round its head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees, clasping his hands before his face. Do you believe in me or not? I must, I must. You are fettered. Why? I wear the chain I forged in life. Is its pattern strange to you? Jacob, old Jacob Marley, oh, speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge. But my time is nearly gone, hear me. I will, but don't be too hard on me, Jacob, pray. I am here to tell you, Ebenezer, that you have yet a chance of escaping my fate. You're always a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you, thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. The second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night on the last stroke of twelve. Remember what has passed between us. The spectre took its wrapper from the table, bound it round its head as before, rose, 
wound its chain over its arm and walked backwards towards the window, which, at every step, raised itself a little, so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. Scrooge became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, and of wailing inexpressibly sorrowful. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in a mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Desperate in his curiosity, Scrooge ran to the window. The air filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither, moaning as they went. Each one wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some were linked together, none were free. Their misery was that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded. And Scrooge, closing the window, examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say, hum, uh, but stopped at the first syllable. And being from the emotions he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep. When he awoke, it was so dark that he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. to bed. An icicle must have got into the works. I can't have slept through a whole day and into another night. He scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. All he could make out that it was still very foggy and extremely cold. He went to bed again and thought and thought and thought it over and over and over. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly and he remembered on a sudden that he'd been warned of a visitation when the bell tolled one. A quarter past. Half past. Quarter two. The hour itself and nothing else. But as the bell sounded... Light flashed up in the room. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside. And Scrooge, starting up, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. What has brought you here? Your welfare. Come. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the bed was warm, the thermometer a long way below freezing. He was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown and nightcap, that he had a cold upon him. They passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, but it was a clear, cold winter day with snow upon the ground. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. You recollect the way? I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. 
They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate and post and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance with its bridge, its church, and winding river. Some shaggy ponies were trotting towards them with boys upon their backs who called to other boys in country gigs and carts. All were in great spirits and shouted to each other until the broad fields were so full of merry music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why did his cold eye glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas. What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? What good had it ever done to him? They left the high road by a well-remembered lane and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes. The walls were damp and mossy, the windows broken and the gates decayed. Fowls clucked and strutted in the stables and the coach houses and sheds were overrun with grass. There was an earthy savour in the air, a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candlelight and not too much to eat. They went across the hall to a door which opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room made barer still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. At one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire. And Scrooge sat down and wept to see his poor, forgotten self. What is the matter? Nothing. I wish... There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waving its hand said... Let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked. Fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and the naked laths were shown instead. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you. He only knew that there he was, alone again. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge turned to the ghost and then glanced anxiously towards the door. Fun! Dear, dear brother, I have come to bring you home. Home, Fun? Yes, home. Father is so much kinder than he used to be. He spoke so gently to me one night that I was not afraid to ask if you might come home. And he said yes and sent me to bring you. <laughs> she clapped her hands and laughed and dragged him in her childish eagerness towards the door. When at last his trunk was tied up on the top of the chaise, they bade the schoolmaster goodbye and drove gaily away, the quick wheels dashing the hoarfrost and snow off the dark leaves of the evergreens like spray. She died. But had, I think, children. One child. True. Your nephew. Yes. Although they had but that moment left the school behind, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city, where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, and shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? said Scrooge. I was apprenticed here. They went in, and at the sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk that if he'd been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling, Scrooge cried in great excitement, Why, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again. Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, and laughed all over himself, and called out, Yo-ho there! Ebenezer! Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice, Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge. 
bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me with Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, the Christmas Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three. Had them up in their places. Four, five, six. Barred them and pinned them. Seven, eight, nine. And came back before you could have got to twelve. Panting like racehorses. Hey ho, clear away, my lads. Let's have lots of room here. Hey ho, Dick. Shut up, Ebenezer. Clear away. There's nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped on the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright as a ballroom should be. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way. In they all came, one after another. Some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came, anyhow and everyhow. There were dances, there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boil, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and the boil, when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley and old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. When the clock struck eleven, they took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two apprentices, they did the same to them. And so the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under the counter in the back shop. A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small? He gave great happiness. What is the matter? Nothing. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. My time grows short. Come. Again, Scrooge saw himself. He was older now. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in whose eyes were tears. A golden idol has displaced me. If it can cheer and comfort you as I would have done, I have no cause to grieve. May you be happy in the life you've chosen. Spirit, why do you torture me? Do not blame me. These were shadows of things that have been. Haunt me no longer. Scrooge turned upon the ghost. And seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which there were fragments of all the faces it had shown him, wrestled with it. It did not resist. But he, overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Awakening in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. But being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing. Consequently, when the bell struck and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came.
But all this time he lay upon his bed in a blaze of light, which was more alarming than a dozen ghosts. At last he began to think that the source of this ghostly light must be in the adjoining room. So he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his room. There was no doubt about that. But walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there. Heaped on the floor were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch. And amongst them sat a jolly giant, glorious to see. Come in! I am the ghost of Christmas present. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion and learned a lesson which is working now. If you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did what he was told and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings and fruit all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning. The sky was gloomy, and the shortest streets were choked with a dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in a shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had, by one consent, caught fire and were blazing away to their heart's content. The poulterers' shops were still half open, and the fruiterers were radiant in their glory. There were great round pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts, shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the street in their apoplectic opulence. There were ruddy, brown-faced, broad-girthed Spanish onions, shining in the fatness of their growth like Spanish friars and winking from their shelves in wanton slyness at the girls as they went by, glancing demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids. There were bunches of grapes made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods and pleasant shufflings ankle-deep through withered leaves. There were Norfolk biffins, squab and swarthy, setting off the yellow of the oranges and lemons, and in the great compactness of their juicy person, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The grocers... Oh, the grocers, nearly closed, but perhaps two shutters down or one. But through those gaps, such glimpses. It was not alone that the scales descending on the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly, or that the canisters were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose, or that the raisins were so plentiful and rare the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sugar as to make the coldest looker-on feel faint and subsequently bilious. Nor was it that the figs were moist and pulpy, or that the French plums blushed in modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes that everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress. But the customers were all so hurried and so eager, in hopeful promise of the day, that they tumbled up against each other, crashing their wicker baskets wildly, and left their purchases on the counter, and came running back to fetch them, and committed a hundred of the like mistakes in the best humour possible. 
They went on, invisible, straight to his clerk's dwelling, where they saw Mrs. Cratchit, Bob Cratchit's wife, dressed out poorly in a twice-termed gown, but brave in ribbons which make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honour of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired. And now the two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they'd smelt the goose and known it for their own. And, basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, whilst he blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. Where's your precious father and your brother, Tony Tim? Is Martha, Mother? Oh, Hurrah! Mother. There's such a goose, Martha. Oh, God bless your heart alive, me dear. How late you are. Oh, we did a deal of work to finish, Mother. Oh, well, never mind so long as you come. Sit you down before the fire and have a warm, Lord oh, bless you. No! No, his father coming in Tony Tim. Hide, Martha. Hide! <laughs> so Martha hid herself. And in came little Bob Cratchit, with at least three feet of comforter, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him. And his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable. Why, where's our Martha? Not coming. Not coming? Not coming upon Christmas Day? Here I am, Father! (laughs) Martha, my dear! (laughs) And how did little Tim behave? Well, as good as gold and better. He gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church, because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. Soon the active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and in came tiny Tim, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire. And while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made any more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer, Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened the apple sauce and Martha dusted the hot plates. Then Bob took tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner of the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons in their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast of the goose. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, a murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even tiny Tim beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were themes of universal admiration. Eked out by apple sauce and mashed potatoes, it was sufficient dinner for the whole family. Everyone had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now the plates being changed, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone to bring in the pudding. In half a minute she returned flushed, but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball blazing in a half-quartern of ignited brandy. Oh, a wonderful pudding. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, 
the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew around the hearth and Bob proposed. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. Oh. <laughs> Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the chimney corner and a crutch without an owner. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no. What of it? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head overcome with penitence and grief, but raised it speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge! I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast oh, upon. Oh, my dear, the children. Christmas Day. An odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man is Mr. Scrooge, but I'll drink his health for your sake in the days, not for his. Long life to him, a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. <laughs> Merry Christmas! They were not a handsome family. They were not well-dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. And Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded, Scrooge had his eyes upon them, especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. But now it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily. And as they went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires in kitchens, parlours, and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. They came at last to a bright, dry, gleaming room in which sat Scrooge's nephew and his pretty, dimpled wife. <laughs> he said that Christmas was a humbug as I live. And he believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred. Ah, he's a comical old fellow, and to tell truth, not so pleasant as he might be. Mm. I'm sure he is very rich. But his wealth is of no use to him. He don't do any good with it. He don't even make himself comfortable. I have no patience with him. I'm sorry for him. Who suffers by his ill whims? Always himself. He takes it into his head to dislike us and won't come and dine with us. So he loses some pleasant moments which would do him no harm. Oh, but I pity him. And she'll give him the same chance every year whether he likes it or not. Mm -hmm. He may rail as much as he will at Christmas, but he can't help thinking better of it if I go there in good temper year after year and take his hand and say, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk 50 pounds, that's something. Oh, it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. <laughs> Here. Here is a glass of mulled wine, and I say, Uncle Scrooge, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. The scene faded, and the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost, and saw it not. But as the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which, concealing its head and form, left nothing visible save one outstretched hand. Are you the ghost of Christmas yet to come? cried Scrooge. The spirit didn't answer, but pointed onward with its hand. You're about to show me things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us? Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant, as if the spirit had inclined its head. Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him, and he could hardly stand when the hand again pointed straight before them. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, but rather it seemed to spring up about them and encompass them of its own act. There they were, in the heart of it, among the merchants. The spirit stopped beside some businessmen 
and Scrooge advanced to listen to them. I don't know much about it. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. What was the matter with him? God knows. What's he done with his money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. <laughs> he hasn't left it to me. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's likely to be a very cheap funeral. I don't know of anybody to go to it. Cold, isn't it? Seasonable for Christmas. Good morning. That was their meeting, their conversation, and their parting. Quiet and dark beside him stood the phantom with its hand outstretched. They went into an obscure part of the town where the ways were foul and narrow. The shops and houses wretched. The people half-naked, drunken, slipshod, ugly. To a low-browed beetling shop where iron, old rags, bottles, bones and greasy offal were bought. Sitting among the wares he dealt in, by a charcoal stove made of old bricks, was a grey-haired rascal who took his pipe from his mouth as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. Open it, Joe, and tell me the value. <coughs> Every person has a right to take care of themselves. They always do. What you call these? Bed curtains? No, bed curtains. You, you don't mean you took them down, rings and all, with him lying there dead? Why not? Uh, you were born to make your fortune. Don't drop that oil on a blanket. His blankets? No, he isn't likely to take cold without them. <laughs> <coughs> The scene changed to a dark room with a bare, uncurtained bed on which there lay a something covered up. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand was pointing to the head. The motion of a finger would have disclosed the face. Scrooge had longed to do it, but he had no more power to withdraw the veil than to dismiss the spectre at his side. Spirit... This is a fearful place. Who is the man? The ghost of Christmas yet to come still did not speak, but conveyed him to a churchyard. Walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down. Answer me one question, said Scrooge. Are those the shadows of things that will be... Or are they shadows of things that may be only? The ghost, immovable as ever, pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Scrooge crept forward trembling, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. No, spirit, no. I'm not the man I was. I will honor Christmas in my heart and keep it all the year. Tell me I may sponge away the writing on the stone. In his agony, he clutched the robes and caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrank, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Blessed and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. Oh, oh, oh Jacob Marley, heaven and Christmas time be praised. He was so flattered and so glowing with his good intentions that his broken voice could scarcely answer to his call and his face was wet with tears. They're not torn down, he cried, folding one of the bed curtains in his arms. They're here. The shadow of things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will. His hands were busy with his garments, tearing them inside out, putting them on upside down, tearing them and mislaying them. I, I, I don't know what to do, he cried, making a perfectly cool of himself with his stockings. I'm as light as a feather, as happy as an angel, merry as a schoolboy. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. Hello there. Whoop. Hello. <laughs> really. 
of a man who'd been out of practice for so many years, it was a splendid laugh, a most illustrious laugh, the father of a long, long line of brilliant laughs. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. I'm a baby. Oh, 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 the churches rang out the lustiest peals he'd ever heard. Clash, clang, hammer, ding, dong, bell. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, clear, bright, jovial, stirring, cold. Golden sunlight, sweet, fresh air, merry bells. Hey, boy, what's today? Hi. What's today, my fine fellow? It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it after all. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope so. Oh, an intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes. Is it? Go and buy it. Walker! No, no, no. I mean earnest. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you a half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's, whispered Crude, rubbing his hands and splitting with a laugh. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did, somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the poulterer's man. Here's the turkey. Hello! Whoop! How are you? Merry Christmas! It was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He'd have snapped him off in a minute, like sticks of sealing wax. It's impossible to carry that to Camden Town. You must have a cab. <laughs> the chuckle with which he said this, the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab, and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy, were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again and chuckles till he cried. Shaving was not easy, but his hand shook very much. And shaving requires attention, even when you don't dance while you're at it. But if he'd cut off the end of his nose, he'd have put a piece of sticking plaster over it and been quite satisfied. He dressed himself all at his best and at last got out into the streets. The people were pouring forth. And Scrooge looked so irresistibly pleasant that three or four good-humoured fellows said, Good morning, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. He'd not gone far when, coming towards him, he beheld the portly gentleman who had walked into his counting house the day before. My dear sir, said Scrooge, quickening his pace and taking the old gentleman by both his hands, how do you do? I hope we succeeded yesterday. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, that is my name, and I fear it may not be very pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon. Will you have the goodness to accept two hundred guineas? Lord bless me. Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? Not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included. Will you do me that favor? I don't know what to say to such munificence. Don't say anything. Come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will indeed. Thank you. I'm very much obliged to you. Thank you fifty times. Bless you. He went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro, and patted children on the head, and questioned beggars, and looked down into the kitchens of houses, and up to the windows. He never dreamt that any walk, that anything, could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? Yes, sir. 
Where is he? My love? He's in the dining room, sir, along with mistress. I'll show you if you please. Thank you. He knows me. I'll go in, my dear. Fred. It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in. It was a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be the first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. He was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. His hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter, too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got nearer to the ruler. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help and a straight waistcoat. A Merry Christmas, Bob! A merrier Christmas, my good fellow, than I've given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary. We'll discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking Bishop Bob. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him. But he let them laugh and little heeded them. For his own heart laughed. And that was good enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Ralph Richardson played both the storyteller and Scrooge in A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, with music composed and conducted by Christopher Whelan. Bob Cratchit was played by Frederick Treves, Mrs. Cratchit by Mary Wimbush, Jacob Marley, John Ruddock. The Ghost of Christmas Present was played by Rafe Truman, and The Ghost of Christmas Past by Wilfred Carter. Fred, Bruce Beebe, and Tiny Tim, Sheila Grant with Eric Anderson, Joe Manning-Wilson, and Rosalind Shanks. The Adventure of the Christmas Pudding by Agatha Christie I regret exceedingly 
said Monsieur Hercule Poirot. He was interrupted. Not rudely interrupted. The interruption was suave, dexterous, persuasive rather than contradictory. Please don't refuse offhand, Monsieur Poirot. There are grave issues of state. Your cooperation will be appreciated in the highest quarters. You are too kind, Hercule Poirot waved a hand. But I really cannot undertake to do as you ask. At this season of the year, again, Mr. Jasmine interrupted. Christmas time, he said persuasively. An old-fashioned Christmas in the English countryside. Hercule Poirot shivered. The thought of an English countryside at this season of the year did not attract him. A good old-fashioned Christmas, Mr. Jasmine stressed it. Me, I am not an Englishman, said Hercule Poirot. In my country, Christmas, it is for children. The New Year, that is what we celebrate. Ah, said Mr. Jasmine. But Christmas in England is a great institution, and I assure you at King's Lacey you would see it at its best. It's a wonderful old house, you know, why one wing of it dates from the 14th century. Again Poirot shivered. The thought of a 14th century English manor house filled him with apprehension. He had suffered too often in the historic country houses of England. He looked round appreciatively at his comfortable modern flat with its radiators and the latest patent devices for excluding any kind of draft. In the winter, he said firmly, I do not leave London. I don't think you quite appreciate, Monsieur Poirot, what a, a very serious matter this is. Mr. Jasmine glanced at his companion, then back at Poirot. Poirot's second visitor had, up to now, said nothing but a polite and formal, how do you do? He sat now, gazing down at his well-polished shoes with an air of the utmost dejection on his coffee-colored face. He was a young man, not more than twenty-three, and he was clearly in a state of complete misery. Yes, yes, said Hercule Poirot. Of course, the matter is serious. I, I do appreciate that. His Highness has my heartfelt sympathy. The position is one of the utmost delicacy, said Mr. Jasmond. Poirot transferred his gaze from the young man to his older companion. If one wanted to sum up Mr. Jesmond in a word, the word would have been discretion. Everything about Mr. Jesmond was discreet. His well-cut but inconspicuous clothes, his pleasant, well-bred voice, which rarely soared out of an agreeable monotone, his light brown hair just thinning a little at the temples, his pale, serious face... It seemed to Hercule Poirot that he had known not one Mr. Jasmine, but a dozen Mr. Jasmines in his time, all using sooner or later the same phrase, a position of the utmost delicacy. The police, said Hercule Poirot, can be very discreet, you know. Mr. Jasmine shook his head firmly. Not the police, he said. To recover the... Uh, <clears throat> What we want to recover will almost inevitably invoke taking proceedings in the law courts, and we know so little. We suspect, but we do not know. You have my sympathy, said Hercule Poirot again. If he imagined that his sympathy was going to mean anything to his two visitors, he was wrong. They did not want sympathy. They wanted practical help. Mr. Jesmond began once more to talk about the delights of an English Christmas. It's dying out, you know, he said, the real old-fashioned type of Christmas. People spend it at hotels nowadays. But an English Christmas with all the family gathered round, the children in their stockings, the Christmas tree, the turkey, the plum pudding, the crackers, the snowman outside the window. In the interests of exactitude, Hercule Poirot intervened. To make a snowman, one has to have the snow, he remarked severely, and one cannot have snow to order even for an English Christmas. I was talking to a friend of mine in the meteorological office today, said Mr. Jasmond, and he tells me that it is highly probable there will be snow this Christmas. It was the wrong thing to have said. Hercule Poirot shuddered more forcefully than ever. Snow in the country. That would be still more abominable. A large, cold, stone manor house? Not at all, said Mr. Jasmine. Things have changed very much in the last ten years or so. Oil fired, central heating. Is there have oil fired, central heating at King's Lacey? asked Poirot. For the first time, he seemed to waver. 
Mr. Jasmine seized this opportunity. Yes, indeed, and a splendid hot water system, radiators in every bedroom. I assure you, my dear Monsieur Poirot, King's Lacey is comfort itself in the winter time. You might even find the house too warm. Uh, that is most unlikely, said Hercule Poirot. With practiced dexterity, Mr. Jasmine shifted his ground a little. You can appreciate the terrible dilemma we are in, he said in a confidential manner. Hercule Poirot nodded. The problem was indeed not a happy one. A young potentate to be, the only son of a ruler of a rich and important native state, had arrived in London a few weeks ago. His country had been passing through a period of restlessness and discontent. Though loyal to the father whose way of life had remained persistently Eastern, popular opinion was somewhat dubious of the younger generation. His follies had been Western ones, and as such looked upon with disapproval. Recently, however, his betrothal had been announced. He was to marry a cousin of the same blood, a young woman who, though educated at Cambridge, was careful to display no Western influence in her own country. The wedding day was announced, and the young prince had made a journey to England, bringing with him some of the famous jewels of his house to be reset in appropriate modern settings by Cartier. These had included a very famous ruby, which had been removed from its cumbersome old-fashioned necklace, and had been given a new look by the famous jewelers. So far, so good. But after this came the snag. It was not to be supposed that a young man possessed of much wealth and convivial taste should not commit a few follies of the pleasanter type. As to that, there would have been no censure. Young princes were supposed to amuse themselves in this fashion. For the prince to take the girlfriend of the moment for a walk down Bond Street and bestow upon her an emerald bracelet or a diamond clip as a reward for the pleasure she had afforded him would have been regarded as quite natural and suitable, corresponding, in fact, to the Cadillac cars which his father invariably presented to his favorite dancing girl of the moment. But the prince had been far more indiscreet than that. Flattered by the lady's interest, he had displayed to her the famous ruby in its new setting, and had finally been so unwise as to accede to her request to be allowed to wear it, just for one evening. The sequel was short and sad. The lady had retired from their supper table to powder her nose. Time passed. She did not return. She had left the establishment by another door, and since then had disappeared into space. The important and distressing thing was that the ruby, in its new setting, had disappeared with her. These were the facts that could not possibly be made public without the most dire consequences. The ruby was something more than a ruby. It was an historical possession of great significance, and the circumstances of its disappearance were such that any undue publicity about them might result in the most serious political consequences. Mr. Jasmine was not the man to put these facts into simple language. He wrapped them up, as it were, in a great deal of verbiage. Who exactly Mr. Jasmine was, Hercule Poirot did not know. He had met other Mr. Jasmines in the course of his career. Whether he was connected with the Home Office, the Foreign Secretary, or some more discreet branch of public service was not specified. He was acting in the interests of the Commonwealth. The ruby must be recovered. Monsieur Poirot, so Mr. Jasmine delicately insisted, was the man to recover it. Perhaps, yes, Hercule Poirot admitted, but you can tell me so little. Suggestion, suspicion, all that is not very much to go upon. Come now, Monsieur Poirot, surely it is not beyond your powers. Ah, oh, come now. I do not always succeed. <laughs> But this was mock modesty. It was clear enough from Poirot's tone that for him to undertake a mission was almost synonymous with succeeding in it. His Highness is very young, Mr. Jasmine said. It will be sad if his whole life is to be blighted for a mere youthful indiscretion. Poirot looked kindly at the downcast young man. It is a time for follies when one is young, he said encouragingly. And for... The ordinary man, it does not matter so much. The good papa he pays up. The family lawyer, he helps to disentangle the inconvenience. The young man, he learns by experience, and all ends for the best. In a position such as yours, it is hard indeed. You are approaching marriage. That is it. That is it exactly. For the first time, words poured from the young man. 
You see, she is very, very serious. She takes life very seriously. She has acquired at Cambridge many very serious ideas. There is to be an education in my country. There are to be schools. There are to be many things, all in the name of progress, you understand, of democracy. It will not be, she says, like in my father's time. Naturally, she knows that I will have diversions in London, but not the scandal. No, it, it is the scandal that matters. You see, it is very, very famous, this ruby. There is a long trail behind it, a uh, history, much bloodshed, many deaths. Deaths, said Hercule Poirot thoughtfully. He looked at Mr. Jasmine. One hopes it will not come to that. Mr. Jasmine made a peculiar noise, rather like a hen who has decided to lay an egg, and then thought better of it. No, no, indeed, he said sounding rather prim. There is no question. I'm sure of anything of that kind. You cannot be sure. Whoever has the ruby now, there may be others who want to gain possession of it, and who will not stick at a trifle, my friend. I really don't think, said Mr. Jasmine, sounding more prim than ever, that we need enter into speculation of that kind. It is quite unprofitable. I can take it that it is settled, Monsieur Poirot. You will go to King's Lacey. And uh, how do I explain myself there? asked Hercule Poirot. Mr. Jasmine smiled with confidence. That, I think, can be arranged very easily, he said. I can assure you that it will all seem quite natural. You will find the Laceys most charming, delightful people. And you do not deceive me about the oil fire central heating? No, no, indeed, Mr. Jasmine sounded quite pained. I assure you, you will find every comfort. Tout comfort moderne, murmured Poirot to himself reminiscently. Eh bien, I accept. The temperature in the long drawing room at King's Lacey was a comfortable 68 as Sir Hercule Poirot sat talking to Mrs. Lacey by one of the big mullioned windows. Mrs. Lacey was engaged in needlework. She was not doing pettipoint or embroidered flowers upon silk. Instead, she appeared to be engaged in the prosaic task of hemming dishcloths. As she sewed, she talked in a soft, reflective voice that Poirot found very charming. I hope you will enjoy our Christmas party here, Monsieur Poirot. It's only the family, you know. My granddaughter and a grandson and a friend of his and Bridget, who's my great niece, and Diana, who's a cousin, and David Welwyn, who's a very old friend. Just a family party. But Edwina Morecambe said that that's what you really wanted to see, an old-fashioned Christmas. Nothing could be more old-fashioned than we are. My husband, you know, absolutely lives in the past. He likes everything to be just as it was when he was a boy of twelve years old and used to come here for his holidays. She smiled to herself. All the old things, the Christmas tree and the stockings hung up and the oyster soup and the turkey, two turkeys, one boiled and one roast, and plum pudding with the ring and bachelor's button and all the rest of it. We can't have sixpences nowadays because they're not pure silver anymore. But all the old desserts, the Elvis plums and the Carlsbad plums and almonds and raisins and crystallized fruit and ginger. Dear me, I sound like a catalogue from Fortnum and Mason. You arouse my gastronomic juices, madame. I expect we'll all have frightful indigestion by tomorrow evening, said Mrs. Lacey. One isn't used to eating so much nowadays, is one? She was interrupted by some loud shouts and whoops of laughter outside the window. She glanced out. I don't know what they're doing out there, playing some game or other, I suppose. I've always been so afraid, you know, that these young people would be bored by our Christmas here. But not at all. It's just the opposite. Now, my own son and daughter and their friends, they used to be rather sophisticated about Christmas. Say it was all nonsense and too much fuss, and it would be far better to go out to a hotel somewhere and dance. But the younger generation seem to find all this terribly attractive. Besides, added Mrs. Lacey practically, schoolboys and schoolgirls are always hungry, aren't they? I think they must starve them at these schools. After all, one does know children of that age eat about as much as three strong men. <laughs> Poirot laughed and said, It is most kind of you and your husband, madame, to include me in this way in your family party. Oh, we're both delighted, I'm sure, said Mrs. Lacey. And if you find Horace a little gruff, she continued, pay no attention. 
It's just this manner, you know. What her husband, Colonel Lacey, had actually said was, Can't think of why you want one of these damned foreigners here cluttering up Christmas. Why can't we have him in some other time? Can't stick foreigners. All right, all right. So Edwina Morecambe wished him on us. What's it got to do with her, I should like to know? Why doesn't she have him for Christmas? Because you know very well, Mrs. Lacey had said, that Edwina always goes up to Claridge's. Her husband had looked at her piercingly and said, Not up to something, are you, Em? Up to something, said Em, opening very blue eyes. Of course not. Why should I be? Old Colonel Lacey laughed a deep, rumbling laugh. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past you, Em, he said. When you look your most innocent is when you are up to something. Revolving these things in her mind, Mrs. Lacey went on. Edwina said she thought perhaps you might help us. I, I'm sure I don't know quite how, but she said that friends of yours at once found you very helpful in... in a case something like ours. I... well, perhaps you don't know what I'm talking about. Poirot looked at her encouragingly. Mrs. Lacey was close on seventy, as upright as a ramrod with snow-white hair, pink cheeks, blue eyes, a ridiculous nose, and a determined chin. If there is anything I can do, I shall only be too happy to do it, said Poirot. It is, I understand, a rather unfortunate matter of uh, a young girl's infatuation. Mrs. Lacey nodded. Yes, it, it seems extraordinary that I should... <laughs> want to talk to you about it. After all, you are a perfect stranger. And a foreigner, said Poirot, in an understanding manner. Yes, said Mrs. Lacey, but perhaps that makes it easier in a way. Anyhow, Edwina seemed to think that you might perhaps know something, how shall I put it, something useful about this young Desmond Lee Wortley. Poirot paused a moment to admire the ingenuity of Mr. Jesmond and the ease with which he had made use of Lady Morecambe to further his own purposes. He has not, uh, I understand, a very good reputation, this young man, he began delicately. No, indeed he hasn't. A very bad reputation, but that's no help so far as Sarah is concerned. It's never any good, is it, telling young girls that men have a bad reputation. It, it, it just spurs them on. You are so very right, said Poirot. In my young day, went on Mrs. Lacey, oh dear, that's a very long time ago, we used to be warned, you know, against certain young men, and of course it did heighten one's interest in them, and if one could possibly manage to dance with them, or to be alone with them in a dark conservatory. <laughs> she laughed. That's why I wouldn't let Horace do any of the things he wanted to do. Tell me, said Poirot, exactly what is it that troubles you? Our son was killed in the war, said Mrs. Lacey. My daughter-in-law died when Sarah was born, so that she has always been with us, and we've brought her up. Uh, perhaps we've brought her up unwisely. I don't know. But we thought we ought always to leave her as free as possible. That is desirable, I think, said Poirot. One cannot go against the spirit of the times. No, said Mrs. Lacey, that's just what I felt about it, and of course, girls nowadays do these sort of things. Poirot looked at her inquiringly. I think the way one expresses it, said Mrs. Lacey, is that Sarah has got in with what they call the coffee bar set. She won't go to dances or come out properly or be a deb or anything of that kind. Instead, she has rather two unpleasant rooms in Chelsea down by the river and wears these funny clothes that they like to wear and black stockings or bright green ones, very thick stockings, so prickly, I always think. And she goes about without washing or combing her hair. Ça, c'est tout à fait naturel, said Poirot. It is the fashion of the moment. Eh? They grow out of it. Yes, I know, said Mrs. Lacey. I, I wouldn't worry about that sort of thing. But you see, she's taken up with this Desmond Lee Wortley, and he, he really has a very unsavory reputation. He lives more or less on well-to-do girls. They seem to go quite mad about him. He very nearly married the Hope Girl, but her people got her made a ward in court or something. And of course, that's what Horace wants to do. He says he must do it for her protection. But I don't think it's really a good idea, Monsieur Poirot. I mean, they'll just run away together and go to Scotland or Ireland or the Argentine or somewhere, and, 
and either get married or else live together without getting married. And, and although it may be contempt of court and all that, well, it isn't really an answer, is it, in the end? Especially if a baby's coming. One has to give in then and let them get married. And, and then nearly always, it seems to me, after a year or two, there's a divorce. And then the girl comes home, and usually after a year or two, she marries someone so nice he's almost dull and settles down. But it's particularly sad, it seems to me, if there's a child, because it's not the same thing being brought up by a stepfather, however nice. No, I, I think it's much better if we did as we did in my young days. I, I mean, the first young man one fell in love with was always someone undesirable. I remember I had a horrible passion for a young man called... Now, what was his name now? How strange it is, I can't remember his Christian name at all. Tibbet. That was his surname. Young Tibbet, of course. My father more or less forbade him the house, but he used to get asked to the same dances, and we used to dance together. <laughs> and sometimes we'd escape and sit out together, and occasionally friends would arrange picnics to which we both went. Of course, it was all very exciting and forbidden, and one enjoyed it enormously. But one didn't go to the, well, to the lengths that girls go nowadays. And so, after a while, the Mr. Tibbets faded out. And, do you know, when I saw him four years later, I was surprised what I could ever have seen in him. He seemed to be such a dull young man. Flashy, you know. No, no interesting conversation. One always thinks the days of one's youth are the best, said Poirot, somewhat sententiously. I know, said Miss Lacey, it's tiresome, isn't it? I mustn't be tiresome. But all the same, I don't want Sarah, who's a dear girl, really, to marry Desmond Lee Wortley. She and David Welwyn, who's staying here, were always such friends and so fond of each other, and we did hope, Horace and I, that they would grow up and marry... But of course she just finds him dull now, and she's absolutely infatuated with Desmond. I do not quite understand, madame, said Poirot. You have him here now, staying in the house, this uh, Desmond Lee Wortley. That's my doing, said Mrs. Lacey. Horace was all for forbidding her to see him and, and all that. Of course, in Horace's day, the father or guardian would have called round at the young man's lodgings with a horsewhip. Horace was all for forbidding the fellow the house and forbidding the girl to see him. I told him that was quite the wrong attitude to take. No, I said, ask him down here. We'll have him for Christmas with the family party. Of course, my husband said I was mad. But I said, at any rate, dear, let's try it. Let us see him in our atmosphere and our house, and we'll be very nice to him and very polite, and perhaps then he'll seem less interesting to her. I think, as they say... You have something there, madame, said Poirot. I think your point of view is very wise. Wiser than your husband's. Well, I hope it is, said Mrs. Lacey doubtfully. He doesn't seem to be working much yet. But, of course, he's only been here a couple of days. A sudden dimple showed in her wrinkled cheek. I'll confess something to you, Monsieur Poirot. I myself can't help liking him. I don't mean I really like him with my mind. But I can feel the charm, all right. Oh, yes, I can see what Sarah sees in him. But I'm an old enough woman and have enough experience to know that he's absolutely no good, even if I do enjoy his company. Though I do think, added Mrs. Lacey, rather wistfully, he has some good points. He asked if he might bring his sister here, you know. She's had an operation and was in hospital. He said it was so sad for her, being in a nursing home over Christmas, and he wondered if it would be too much trouble if he could bring her with him. He said he'd take all her meals up to her and all that. Well, now, I do think that was rather nice of him, don't you, Monsieur Poirot? It shows a consideration, said Poirot thoughtfully, which seems almost out of character. Oh, I don't know. You can have family affections at the same time as wishing to prey on a rich young girl. Sarah will be very rich, you know, not only with what we leave her, and of course that won't be very much because most of the money goes with the place to Colin, my grandson. But her mother was a very rich woman, and Sarah will inherit all her money when she's twenty-one. She's only twenty now. No, I do think it was nice of Desmond to mind about his sister, and he didn't pretend that she was anything very wonderful or that. She's a shorthand typist. I rather... Uh, does secretarial work in London... 
and he's been as good as his word and does carry up trays to her. Not all the time, of course, but quite often. So I think he has some nice points, but all the same, said Mrs. Lacey with great decision. I don't want Sarah to marry him. From all I have heard and been told, said Poirot, uh, that would indeed be a disaster. Do you think it would be possible for you to help us in any way? asked Mrs. Lacey. I think it is possible, yes, said Hercule Poirot, but I do not wish to uh, promise too much, for the Mr. Desmond Lee Wortleys of this world are clever, madam. But do not despair. One can perhaps do a little something. I shall at any rate put forth my best endeavors, if only in gratitude for your kindness, in asking me here for this Christmas festivity. He looked round him. And it cannot be so easy these days to have Christmas festivities. No, indeed, Mrs. Lacey sighed. She leaned forward. Do you know, Monsieur Poirot, what I really dream of, what I would love to have? But tell me, madam, I simply long to have a small modern bungalow. No, perhaps not a bungalow exactly, but a, a small modern easy-to-run house built somewhere in the park here and live in it with an absolutely up-to-date kitchen and no long passages. Everything easy and simple. It is a very practical idea, madam. It is not practical for me, said Mrs. Lacey. My husband adores this place. He loves living here. He doesn't mind being slightly uncomfortable. He doesn't mind the inconveniences, and he would hate, simply hate, to live in a small modern house in the park. So you sacrifice yourself to his wishes. Mrs. Lacey drew herself up. I do not consider it a sacrifice, Monsieur Poirot, she said. I married my husband with the wish to make him happy. He's been a good husband to me and made me very happy all these years, and I wish to give happiness to him. So you will continue to live here, said Poirot. It is not really too uncomfortable, said Mrs. Lacey. No, no, said Poirot hastily. On the contrary, it is uh, most comfortable. Your central heating and your bath water are perfection. We spent a lot of money in making the house comfortable to live in, said Mrs. Lacey. We were able to sell some land, ripe for development, I think they call it. Fortunately, right out of sight of the house on the other side of the park, really rather an ugly bit of ground with no nice view, but we got a very good price for it, so that we've been able to have as many improvements as possible. But the service, madame? Oh, well, that presents less difficulty than you might think. Of course, one cannot expect to be looked after and waited upon as one used to be. Different people come in from the village. Two women in the morning, another two to cook lunch and wash it up, and different ones again in the evening. There are plenty of people who want to come and work for a few hours a day. Of course, for Christmas we are very lucky. My dear Mrs. Ross always comes in every Christmas. She's a wonderful cook, really first class. She retired about ten years ago, but she comes in to help us in any emergency. Then there is dear Peveril. Uh, your butler? Yes. He is pensioned off and lives in the little house near the lodge, but he is so devoted and he insists on coming to wait on us at Christmas. Really, I'm terrified, Monsieur Poirot, because he's so old and shaky that I feel certain that if he carries anything heavy, he will drop it. It's really an agony to watch him, and his heart is not good, and I'm afraid of his doing too much. But it would hurt his feelings dreadfully if I did not let him come. He hems and haws and makes disapproving noises when he sees the state our silver is in, and within three days of being here, it's all wonderful again. Yes, he is a dear, faithful friend, she smiled at Poirot. So, you see, we are all set for a happy Christmas. A white Christmas, too, she added as she looked out of the window. See? It's beginning to snow. Ah, the children are coming in. You must meet them, Monsieur Poirot. Poirot was introduced with due ceremony. First to Colin and Michael, the schoolboy grandson and his friend. Nice, polite lads of fifteen. One dark, one fair. Then to their cousin, Bridget, a black-haired girl of about the same age with enormous vitality. And this is my granddaughter, Sarah, said Mrs. Lacey. Poirot looked with some interest at Sarah, an attractive girl with a mop of red hair, her manner seemed to him nervy and a trifle defiant, but she showed real affection for her grandmother. And this is Mr. Lee Wortley. Mr. Lee Wortley wore a fisherman's jersey and tight black jeans. His hair was rather long, and it seemed doubtful whether he had shaved that morning. 
In contrast to him was a young man introduced as David Wellman, who was solid and quiet, with a pleasant smile, and rather obviously addicted to soap and water. There was one other member of the party, a handsome, rather intense-looking girl, who was introduced as Diana Middleton. Tea was brought in. A hearty meal of scones, crumpets, sandwiches, and three kinds of cake. The younger members of the party appreciated the tea. Colonel Lacey came in last, remarking in a non-committal voice, Eh, yeah, tea. Oh, yes, tea. He received his cup of tea from his wife's hand, helped himself to two scones, cast a look of aversion at Desmond Lee Wortley, and sat down as far away from him as he could. He was a big man with bushy eyebrows and a red, weather-beaten face. He might have been taken for a farmer rather than the lord of the manor. Started to snow, he said. It's going to be a white Christmas, all right. After tea, the party dispersed. I expect they'll go and play with their tape recorders now, said Mrs. Lacey to Poirot. She looked indulgently after her grandson as he left the room. Her tone was that of one who says, The children are going to play with their toy soldiers. They're frightfully technical, of course, she said, and very grand about it all. The boys in Bridget, however, decided to go along to the lake and see if the ice on it was likely to make skating possible. I thought we could have skated on it this morning, said Colin, but old Hodgkins said no. He's always so terribly careful. Come for a walk, David, said Diana Middleton softly. David hesitated for half a moment, his eyes on Sarah's red head. She was standing by Desmond Lee Wortley, her hand on his arm, looking up into his face. All right, said David Wellwin. Yes, that's... Diana slipped a quick hand through his arm, and they turned toward the door into the garden. Sarah said, Shall we go too, Desmond? It's fearfully stuffy in the house. Who wants to walk, said Desmond. I'll get my car out. We'll go along to the speckled boar. Have a drink. Sarah hesitated for a moment before saying, Let's go to the market Ledbury, to the White Hart. It's much more fun. Though for all the world she would not have put it into words, Sarah had an instinctive revulsion from going down to the local pub with Desmond. It was somehow not in the tradition of King's Lacey. The women of King's Lacey had never frequented the bar of the speckled boar. She had an obscure feeling that to go there would be to let old Colonel Lacey and his wife down. And why not, Desmond Lee Wortley would have said. For a moment of exasperation, Sarah felt he ought to know why not. One didn't upset such old darlings as grandfather and dear old Em unless it was necessary. They'd been very sweet, really, letting her lead her own life, not understanding in the least why she wanted to live in Chelsea, in the way she did, but accepting it. That was due to Em, of course. Grandfather would have kicked up no end of a row. Sarah had no illusions about her grandfather's attitude. It was not his doing that Desmond had been asked to stay at King's Lacey. That was Em, and Em was a darling, and always had been. When Desmond had gone to fetch his car, Sarah popped her head into the drawing room again. We're going over to the market Ledbury, she said. We thought we'd have a drink there at the White Hart. There was a slight amount of defiance in her voice, but Mrs. Lacey did not seem to notice it. Well, dear, she said, I'm sure that would be very nice. David and Diana have gone for a walk, I see. I'm so glad. I really think it was a brainwave on my part to ask Diana here. So sad being left a widow so young. Only twenty-two. I do hope she marries again soon. Sarah looked at her sharply. What are you up to, Em? It's my little plan, said Mrs. Lacey gleefully. I think she's just right for David. Of course, I know he was terribly in love with you, Sarah dear, but you'd no use for him, and I realize he isn't your type. But I don't want him to go on being unhappy, and I really think Diana will suit him. What a matchmaker you are, Em, said Sarah. I know, said Mrs. Lacey. Old women always are. Diana's quite keen on him already, I think. Don't you think she'd be just right for him? I shouldn't say so, said Sarah. I think Diana's far too, well, too intense, too serious. I should think David would find it terribly boring being married to her. Well, we'll see, said Mrs. Lacey. Anyway, you don't want him, do you, dear? No, indeed, said Sarah, very quickly. She added in a sudden rush. You do like Desmond, don't you, Em? I'm sure he's very nice indeed, said Mrs. Lacey. Grandfather doesn't like him, said Sarah. Well, you could hardly expect him to, could you, said Mrs. Lacey reasonably. But I dare say he'll come round when he gets used to the idea. You mustn't rush him, Sarah, dear. Old people are very slow to change their minds, and your grandfather is rather obstinate. 
I don't care what Grandfather thinks or says, said Sarah. I shall get married to Desmond whenever I like. I know, dear, I know. But do try and be realistic about it. Your grandfather could cause a lot of trouble, you know. You're not of age yet. In another year you can do as you please. I expect Chorus will have come round long before that. You're on my side, aren't you, darling? said Sarah. She flung her arms round her grandmother's neck and gave her an affectionate kiss. I want you to be happy, said Mrs. Lacey. Ah, there's your young man bringing his car round. You know, I like these very tight trousers these young men wear nowadays. They look so smart. Dear, only, of course, it does accentuate knocked knees. Yes, Sarah thought. Desmond had got knocked knees. She'd never noticed it before. Go on, dear. Enjoy yourself, said Mrs. Lacey. She watched her go out to the car. Then, remembering her foreign guest, she went along to the library. Looking in, however, she saw that Hercule Poirot was taking a pleasant little nap. And, smiling to herself, she went across the hall and out into the kitchen to have a conference with Mrs. Ross. Come on, beautiful, said Desmond. Your family's cutting up rough because you're coming out to a pub. Years behind the times here, aren't they? Of course, they're not making a fuss, said Sarah sharply as she got into the car. What's the idea of having that foreign fellow down? He's a detective, isn't he? What... What needs detecting here? Oh, he's not here professionally, said Sarah. Edwina Morker, my grandmother, asked us to have him. I think he's retired from professional work long ago. Sounds like a broken-down old cab horse, said Desmond. He wanted to see an old-fashioned English Christmas, I believe, said Sarah vaguely. Desmond laughed scornfully. Such a lot of tribe, that sort of thing. How can you stand it? I don't know. Sarah's red hair was tossed back and her aggressive chin shot up. I enjoy it, she said defiantly. You can't, baby. Let's cut the whole thing tomorrow. Go over to Scarborough somewhere. I couldn't possibly do that. Why not? Oh, it would hurt their feelings. Oh, Bilge, you know you don't enjoy this childish, sentimental bosh. Well, not really, perhaps, but... Sarah broke off. She realized with a feeling of guilt that she was looking forward a good deal to the Christmas celebration. She enjoyed the whole thing, but she was ashamed to admit that to Desmond. It was not the thing to enjoy Christmas and family life. Just for a moment she wished that Desmond had not come down here at Christmas time. In fact, she almost wished that Desmond had not come down here at all. It was much more fun seeing Desmond in London than here at home. In the meantime, the boys and Bridget were walking back from the lake, still discussing earnestly the problems of skating. Flecks of snow had been falling, and looking up at the sky, it could be prophesied that before long there was going to be a heavy snowfall. It's going to snow all night, said Colin. Bet you by Christmas morning we have a couple of feet of snow. The prospect was a pleasurable one. Let's make a snowman, said Michael. Good Lord, said Colin. I haven't made a snowman since, well, since I was about four years old. I don't believe it's a bit easy to do, said Bridget. I mean, you have to know how. We might have an effigy of Monsieur Poirot, said Colin. Give it a big black moustache. There's one in the dressing-up box. I don't see, you know, said Michael thoughtfully, how Monsieur Poirot could ever have been a detective. I, I don't see how he'd ever been able to disguise himself. I know, said Bridget, and one can't imagine him running about with a microscope looking for clues or measuring footprints. I've got an idea, said Colin. Let's put on a show for him. What do you mean, a show? asked Bridget. Well, arrange a murder for him. What a gorgeous idea, said Bridget. Do you mean a body in the snow, that sort of thing? Yes, it would make him feel at home, wouldn't it? Bridget giggled. I don't know that I'd go as far as that. If it snows, said Colin, we'll have the perfect setting, a body and footprints. We'll have to think that out rather carefully and, and pinch one of Grandfather's daggers and, and make some blood... They came to a halt, and oblivious to the rapidly falling snow, entered into an excited discussion. There's a paint box in the old schoolroom. We could mix up some blood. Um, Crimson Lake, I should think. Crimson Lake's a bit too pink, I think, said Bridget. It ought to be a bit browner. Who's going to be the body? asked Michael. I'll be the body, said Bridget quickly. Oh, look here, said Colin. I thought of it. Oh, no, 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 said Bridget. It must be me. It's got to be a girl. It's more exciting. Beautiful girl lying lifeless in the snow. Beautiful girl. Ha, ha, said Michael in derision. I've got black hair, too, said Bridget. What's that got to do with it? 
Well, it'll show up so well in the snow. And I shall wear my red pyjamas. If you wear red pyjamas, they won't show the bloodstains, said Michael in a practical manner. But they'd look so effective against the snow, said Bridget. And they've got white facings, you know, so the blood could be on that. Oh, won't it be gorgeous? Do you think he will really be taken in? He will, if we do it well enough, said Michael. We'll just have your footprints in the snow, and one other person's going to the body and coming away from it. A man's, of course. He won't want to disturb them, so he won't know that you're not really dead. You don't think... Michael stopped, struck by a sudden idea. The others looked at him. You don't think he'll be annoyed about it? Oh, I shouldn't think so, said Bridget, with facile optimism. I'm sure he'll understand that we've just done it to entertain him. A sort of Christmas treat. I don't think we ought to do it on Christmas Day, said Colin reflectively. I don't think Grandfather would like that very much. Boxing Day, then, said Bridget. Boxing Day would be just right, said Michael. And it'll give us more time, too, pursued Bridget. After all, there are lots of things to arrange. Let's go have a look at all the props. They hurried into the house. The evening was a busy one. Holly and mistletoe had been brought in in large quantities, and a Christmas tree had been set up at one end of the dining room. Everyone helped to decorate it, to put up the branches of holly behind pictures, and to hang mistletoe in a convenient position in the hall. I had no idea anything so archaic still went on, murmured Desmond to Sarah with a sneer. We've always done it, said Sarah defensively. What a reason. Oh, don't be tiresome, Desmond. I think it's fun. Sarah, my sweet, you can't. Well, not, not really, perhaps, but I do in a way. Who's going to brave the snow and go to midnight mass, asked Mrs. Lacey at twenty minutes to twelve. Not me, said Desmond. Come on, Sarah. With a hand on her arm, he guided her into the library, and he went over to the record case. There are limits, darling, said Desmond. Midnight mass. Yes, said Sarah. Oh, yes. With a good deal of laughter, donning of coats and stamping of feet, most of the others got off. The two boys, Bridget, David and Diana, set out for the ten minutes' walk to the church through the falling snow. Their laughter died away in the distance. Midnight Mass, said Colonel Lacey, snorting. Never went to Midnight Mass in my young days. Mass, indeed. Popish, that is. Oh, uh, I beg your pardon, Monsieur Poirot. Poirot waved a hand. It is uh, quite all right. Do not mind me. Muttons is good enough for anybody, I should say, said the Colonel. Proper Sunday morning service. Hark the herald angels sing all the good old Christmas hymns. And then back to Christmas dinner. That's right, isn't it, Em? Yes, dear, said Mrs. Lacey. That's what we do. But the young ones enjoy the midnight service. And it's nice, really, that they want to go. Sarah and that fellow don't want to go. Well, there, dear, I think you're wrong, said Mrs. Lacey. Sarah, you know, did want to go, but she didn't like to say so. Beats me why she cares what that fellow's opinion is. She's very young, really, said Mrs. Lacey placidly. Are you going to bed, Monsieur Poirot? Good night. I hope you'll sleep well. And you, madame, are you not going to bed yet? Not just yet. I've got the stockings to fill, you see. <laughs> I know they're all practically grown up, but they do like their stockings. One puts uh, jokes in them. Silly little things, but it all makes for a lot of fun. You work very hard to make this a happy house at Christmas time, said Poirot. I honor you. He raised her hand to his lips in a courtly fashion. Hm, grunted Colonel Lacey as Poirot departed. Flowery sort of fellow. Still, he appreciates you. Mrs. Lacey dimpled up at him. Have you noticed, Horace, that I'm standing under the mistletoe? She asked with the demureness of a girl of nineteen. Hercule Poirot entered his bedroom. It was a large room, well provided with radiators. As he went over towards the big four-poster bed, he noticed an envelope lying on his pillow. He opened it and drew out a piece of paper. On it was a shakily printed message in capital letters. Don't eat none of the plum pudding. One as wishes you well. Hercule Poirot stared at it. His eyebrows rose. Hmm, cryptic, he murmured. 
and uh, most unexpected. Christmas dinner took place at 2 p.m. and was a feast indeed. Enormous logs crackled merrily in the wide fireplace, and above their crackling rose the babble of many tongues talking together. Oyster soup had been consumed, two enormous turkeys had come and gone, mere carcasses of their former selves. Now the supreme moment. The Christmas pudding was brought in in state. Old Peveril, his hands and his knees shaking with the weakness of eighty years, permitted no one but himself to bear it in. Mrs. Lacey sat, her hands pressed together in a nervous apprehension. One Christmas she felt sure Peveril would fall down dead, having either to take the risk of letting him fall down dead, or of hurting his feelings to such an extent that he would probably prefer to be dead than alive. She had so far chosen the former alternative. On a silver dish, the Christmas pudding reposed in its glory. A large football of a pudding. A piece of holly stuck in it like a triumphant flag, and glorious flames of blue and red rising round it. There was a cheer and cries of, ooh, ah. One thing Mrs. Lacey had done, prevailed upon Peveril to place the pudding in front of her, so that she could help it rather than hand it in turn round the table. She breathed a sigh of relief as it was deposited safely in front of her. Rapidly, the plates were passed round, flames still licking the portions. "'Wish, Monsieur Poirot,' cried Bridget. "'Wish before the flame goes. Quick, Grand Darling, quick!' Mrs. Lacey leant back with a sigh of satisfaction. Operation Pudding had been a success. In front of everyone was a helping with flames still licking it. There was a momentary silence all round the table as everyone wished hard. There was nobody to notice the rather curious expression on the face of Monsieur Poirot as he surveyed the portion of pudding on his plate. Don't eat none of the plum pudding. What on earth did that sinister warning mean? There could be nothing different about his portion of plum pudding from that of everyone else. Sighing, as he admitted himself baffled, and Hercule Poirot never liked to admit himself baffled, he picked up his spoon and fork. Hard sauce, Monsieur Poirot. Poirot helped himself appreciatively to the hard sauce. Swiped my best brandy again, eh, M? said the colonel good-humouredly from the other end of the table. Mrs. Lacey twinkled at him. "'Mrs. Ross insists on having the best brandy, dear,' she said. "'She says it makes all the difference.' "'Well,' said Colonel Lacey, "'Christmas comes but once a year, and Mrs. Ross is a great woman. "'A great woman, and a great cook.' "'She is indeed,' said Colin. "'Smashing plum pudding, this. "'Oh!' he filled an appreciative mouth. "'Gently, almost gingerly, Hercule Poirot attacked his portion of pudding. "'He ate a mouthful.' It was delicious. He ate another. Something tinkled on his plate. He investigated with a fork. Bridget, on his left, came to his aid. You've got something, Monsieur Poirot, she said. I wonder what it is. Poirot detached a little silver object from the surrounding raisins that clung to it. Oh, said Bridget, it's the bachelor's button. Monsieur Poirot's got the bachelor's button. Hercule Poirot dipped the small silver button into the finger glass of water that stood by his plate and washed it clear of pudding crumbs. It is very pretty, he observed. That means you're going to be a bachelor, Monsieur Poirot, explained Colin helpfully. Uh, that is to be expected, said Poirot gravely. I have been a bachelor for many long years, and it is unlikely that I shall change that status now. Oh, never say die, said Michael. I saw in the paper that someone of ninety-five married a girl of twenty-two the other day. You encourage me, said Hercule Poirot. Colonel Lacey uttered a sudden exclamation. His face became purple, and his hand went to his mouth. Confound it, Emily. Why on earth do you let the cook put glass in the pudding? Glass, cried Mrs. Lacey, astonished. Colonel Lacey withdrew the offending substance from his mouth. Might have broken a tooth, he grumbled, or swallowed the damned thing and had appendicitis. He dropped the piece of glass into a finger bowl, rinsed it, and held it up. God bless my soul, he ejaculated. It's a red stone out of one of the cracker brooches. He held it aloft. You uh, permit, very deftly. Monsieur Poirot stretched across his neighbor, took it from Colonel Lacey's fingers, and examined it attentively. As the squire had said, it was an enormous red stone, the color of a ruby. The light gleamed from its facets as he turned it about. Somewhere round the table... 
A chair was pushed sharply back and then drawn in again. Phew, cried Michael. How is it it would be if it was real? Perhaps it is real, said Bridget hopefully. Oh, don't be an ass, Bridget. Why, a ruby of that size would be worth thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds, wouldn't it, Mr. Poirot? It would indeed, said Poirot. But what I can't understand, said Mrs. Lacey, is how it got into the pudding. Ooh, said Colin, diverted by his last mouthful. I've, I've got the pig. It isn't fair, Bridget chanted immediately. Colin's got the pig. Colin's got the pig. Colin is a greedy, guzzling pig. I've got the ring, said Diana, in a clear, high voice. Good for you, Diana. You'll be married first of us all. I've got the thimble, wailed Bridget. Bridget's going to be an old maid, chanted the two boys. Yeah, Bridget's going to be an old maid. Who's got the money, demanded David. There's a real ten-shilling piece, gold in this pudding. I know, Mrs. Ross told me so. I think I'm the lucky one, said Desmond Lee Wortley. Colonel Lacey's two next-door neighbors heard him mutter, Yes, you would be. I've got a ring, too, said David. He looked across at Diana. <laughs> it's quite a coincidence, isn't it? The laughter went on. Nobody noticed that Monsieur Poirot, carelessly, as though thinking of something else, had dropped the red stone into his pocket. Mince pies and Christmas dessert followed the pudding. The older members of the party then retired for a welcome siesta before the tea-time ceremony of the lighting of the Christmas tree. Hercule Poirot, however, did not take a siesta. Instead, he made his way to the enormous old-fashioned kitchen. It is permitted, he asked, looking round and beaming, that I congratulate the cook on this marvellous meal I have just eaten. There was a moment's pause, and then Mrs. Ross came forward in a stately manner to greet him. She was a large woman, nobly built with all the dignity of a state duchess. Two lean, grey-haired women were beyond in the scullery washing up, and a tow-haired girl was moving to and fro between the scullery and the kitchen, but these were obviously mere myrmidons. Mrs. Ross was the queen of the kitchen quarters. I am glad to hear you enjoyed it, sir, she said graciously. Enjoyed it, cried Hercule Poirot. With an extravagant foreign gesture, he raised his hand to his lips, kissed it, and wafted the kiss to the ceiling. But you are a genius, Mrs. Ross, a genius. Never have I tasted such a wonderful meal. The oyster soup, he made an expressive noise with his lips. And the stuffing, the chestnut stuffing in the turkeys, that, that was quite unique in my experience. Well, it's funny that you should say that, sir, said Mrs. Ross graciously. It's a very special recipe, at stuffing. It was given me by an Austrian chef that I worked with a good many years ago. But all the rest, she added, is just good plain English cooking. And is there anything better? demanded Hercule Poirot. Well, it's nice of you to say so, sir. Of course, you being a foreign gentleman might have preferred the continental style. Not but what I can't manage continental dishes, too. I am sure, Mrs. Ross, you could manage anything. But you must know that English cooking, good English cooking, not the cooking one gets in the second-class hotels or, or restaurants, is much appreciated by gourmets on the continent. And I believe I am correct in saying that a special expedition was made to London in the early 1800s and the report sent back to France of the wonders of English puddings. We have nothing like that in France, they wrote. It is worth making a journey to London just to taste the varieties and excellencies of the English puddings. And above all puddings, continued Poirot, well launched now on a kind of rhapsody, is the Christmas plum pudding such as we have eaten today. That was a homemade pudding, was it not? Not a bought one. Yes, indeed, sir, of my own making, and my own recipe, such as I've made for many years. When I came here, Mrs. Lysy said she'd ordered a pudding from a London store to save me the trouble. But no, madam, I said, that may be kind of you, but no bought pudding from a store can equal a homemade Christmas one. Mind you, said Mrs. Ross, warming to a subject like the artist she was, it was my too soon before the day. A good Christmas pudding should be made some weeks before and allowed to wait. The longer they're kept within reason, the better they are. 
I mind now that when I was a child and we went to church every Sunday, we'd start listening for the collect that begins, Stir up, O Lord, we beseech thee, because that collect was the signal, as it were, that the pudding should be made that week. And so they always were. We had the collect on the Sunday, and that week, sure enough, my mother would make the Christmas puddings. And so it should have been here this year. As it was, that pudding was only made three days ago, the day before you arrived, sir. However, I kept to the old custom. Everyone in the house had to come out into the kitchen and have a stir and make a wish. That's an old custom, sir, and I've always held to it. Most interesting, said Hercule Poirot. Most interesting. And so everyone came out into the kitchen. Yes, sir. The young gentleman, Miss Bridget, and the London gentleman who's staying here, and his sister, and Mr. David, and Miss Diana, Mrs. Middleton, I should say, all had a stir, they did. How many puddings did you make? Is this the only one? No, sir, I made four. Two large ones and two smaller ones. The other large ones I planned to serve on New Year's Day, and the smaller ones were for Colonel and Mrs. Lysey, when they're alone like, and not so many in the family. I see, I see, said Poirot. As a matter of fact, sir, said Mrs. Ross, it was the wrong pudding you had for lunch today. The wrong pudding? Poirot frowned. How is that? Well, sir, we have a big Christmas mould, a china mould with a pattern of holly and, and mistletoe on top, and we always have the Christmas Day pudding boiled in that. But there was a most unfortunate accident. This morning, when Annie was getting it down from the shelf in the larder, she slipped and dropped it, and it broke. Well, sir, naturally, I couldn't serve that, could I? There might have been splinters in it. So we had to use the other one, the New Year's Day one, which was in a plain bowl. Makes a nice round, but it's not so decorative as the Christmas mould. Really, where we get another mould like that, I don't know. They don't make things in that size nowadays. All tiddly bits of things. Why, you can't even buy a breakfast dish. It'll take a proper eight to ten eggs and bacon. Ah, things aren't what they were. No, indeed, said Poirot. But today, that is not so. This Christmas day has been like the Christmas day of old. Is that not true? Mrs. Ross sighed. Well, I'm glad you say so, sir, but of course I haven't the help now that I used to have. Not skilled help, that is. The girls nowadays, she lowered her voice slightly, they mean very well, and they're very willing, but they've not been trained, sir, if you understand what I mean. Uh, times change, yes, said Hercule Poirot. I too find it uh, sad sometimes. This house, sir, said Mrs. Ross, it's too large, you know, for the mistress and the colonel. The mistress, she knows that, living in a corner of it as they do, it's not the same thing at all. It only comes alive, as you might say, at Christmas time when all the family come. It is uh, the first time, I think, that Mr. Lee Wortley and his sister have been here. Yes, sir, a note of slight reserve crept into Mrs. Ross's voice. A very nice gentleman he is, but, well, he seems a funny friend for Miss Sarah to have, according to our ideas. But there, London ways are different. It's said that his sister so poorly, and an operation she had. She seemed all right the first day she was here, but that very day, after we'd been stirring the pudding, she was took bad again, and she's been in bed ever since. Got up too soon after her operation, I expect. Oh, doctors nowadays, they have you out of the hospital before you can hardly stand on your feet. Why, my very own nephew's wife and Mrs. Ross went into a long and spirited tale of a hospital treatment as accorded to her relations, comparing it unfavorably with the consideration that had been lavished upon them in older times. Poirot duly commiserated with her. It remains to thank you for this exquisite and sumptuous meal. You permit a little acknowledgment of my appreciation. A crisp five-pound note passed from his hand into that of Mrs. Ross, who said perfunctorily, well, You really shouldn't do that, sir. I insist, I insist. Well, it's very kind of you indeed, sir. Mrs. Ross accepted the tribute as no more than her due. And I wish you, sir, a very happy Christmas and a prosperous new year. The end of Christmas Day was like the end of most Christmas days. The tree was lighted, a splendid Christmas cake came in for tea, was greeted with approval, but was partaken of only moderately. There was cold supper. Both Poirot and his host and his hostess went to bed early. 
Good night, Monsieur Prorogue, said Mrs. Lacey. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. It has been a wonderful day, madame. Wonderful. You're looking very thoughtful, said Mrs. Lacey. It is the English pudding that I consider. You found it a little heavy, perhaps, asked Mrs. Lacey delicately. No, no, I, I do not speak gastronomically. I consider its significance. It's traditional, of course, said Mrs. Lacey. Well, good night, Monsieur Poirot. And don't dream too much of Christmas puddings and mince pies. Yes, murmured Poirot to himself as he undressed. It is a problem, certainly, that Christmas plum pudding... There is here something I do not understand at all. He shook his head in a vexed manner. Well, we shall see. After making certain preparations, Poirot went to bed, but not to sleep. It was some two hours later that his patience was rewarded. The door of his bedroom opened very gently. He smiled to himself. It was as he had thought it would be. His mind went back fleetingly to the cup of coffee so politely handed him by Desmond Lee Wortley. A little later, when Desmond's back was turned, he had laid the cup down for a few moments on the table. He had then apparently picked it up again, and Desmond had had the satisfaction, if satisfaction it was, of seeing him drink the coffee to the last drop. But a little smile lifted Poirot's mustache as he reflected that it was not he, but someone else who was sleeping a good, sound sleep tonight. Is that a pleasant young David, said Poirot to himself. He is worried, unhappy. It will do him no harm to have a night's really sound sleep. And now, let us see what will happen. He lay quite still, breathing in an even manner, with occasionally a suggestion, but the faintest suggestion, of a snore. Someone came up to the bed and bent over him. Then, satisfied, that someone turned away and went to the dressing table. By the light of a tiny torch, the visitor was examining Poirot's belongings, neatly arranged on top of the dressing table. Fingers explored the wallet, gently pulled open the drawers of the dressing table, then extended the search to the pockets of Poirot's clothes. Finally, the visitor approached the bed and, with great caution, slid his hand under the pillow. Withdrawing his hand, he stood for a moment or two as though uncertain what to do next. He walked round the room, looking inside ornaments, went into the adjoining bathroom from whence he presently returned. Then, with a faint exclamation of disgust, he went out of the room. Ah, said Poirot under his breath. You have a disappointment. Yes, yes, a serious disappointment. Bah, to imagine even that Hercule Poirot would hide something where you could find it. Then, turning over on his other side, he went peacefully to sleep. He was aroused next morning by an urgent, soft tapping on his door. Qui est là? Come in, come in. Monsieur Poirot, Monsieur Poirot. But yes, Poirot sat up in bed. It is the early tea? But no, it, it is you, Colin. What has occurred? Colin was for a moment speechless. He seemed to be under the grip of some strong emotion. In actual fact, it was the sight of the nightcap that Hercule Poirot wore that affected for the moment his organs of speech. Presently, he controlled himself and spoke. I think, Monsieur Poirot, could you help us? Something rather awful has happened. Something has happened, but what? It's, it's Bridget. She's out there in the snow. I think she doesn't move or speak and... Oh, you better come and look for yourself. I, I, I'm terribly afraid she may be dead. What? Poirot cast aside his bed covers. Mademoiselle Bridget, dead? I think, I think somebody's killed her. There, there's blood and... Oh, do come. But certainly, certainly, I come on the instant. With great practicality, Poirot inserted his feet into his outdoor shoes and pulled a fur-lined overcoat over his pajamas. I come, he said. I come on the moment. You have aroused the house. No. No, so far I haven't told anyone but you. I thought it would be better. Grandfather and Gran aren't up yet. They're laying breakfast downstairs, but I didn't say anything to Peveril. She, uh, Bridget, she's round the other side of the house, near the terrace at the library window. I see. Uh, Lead the way. I will follow. Turning away to hide his delighted grin, Colin led the way downstairs. They went out through the side door. It was a clear morning, with the sun not yet high over the horizon. It was not snowing now, but it had snowed heavily during the night, and everywhere round was an unbroken carpet of thick snow. The world looked very pure and white and beautiful. There, said Colin breathlessly. I, it's, 
There, he pointed dramatically. The scene was indeed dramatic enough. A few yards away, Bridget lay in the snow. She was wearing scarlet pajamas and a white wool wrap thrown round her shoulders. The white wool wrap was stained with crimson. Her head was turned aside and hidden by the mass of her outspread black hair. One arm was under her body. The other lay flung out, the fingers clenched, and, standing up in the center of the crimson stain, was the hilt of a large, curved Kurdish knife, which Colonel Lacey had shown to his guests only the evening before. Mon Dieu, ejaculated Monsieur Poirot. It is like something on the stage. There was a faint choking noise from Michael. Colin thrust himself quickly into the breach. I know, he said. It, it, it doesn't seem real somehow, does it? Do you see those footprints? I suppose we mustn't disturb them. Ah, oh, yes, the footprints. No, we must be careful not to disturb those footprints. That's what I thought, said Colin. That's why I wouldn't let anyone go near her until we got you. I thought you'd know what to do. All the same, said Hercule Poirot briskly. First, we must see if she is still alive. Is not that so? Well, yes, of course, said Michael, a little doubtfully. But, you see, we thought... I mean, we didn't like... Ah, you have the prudence... You have read the detective stories. It is most important that nothing should be touched, and that the body should be uh, left as it is. But we cannot be sure as yet if it is a body, can we? After all, although prudence is admirable, common humanity comes first. We must think of the doctor, must we not? Before we think of the police. Oh, yes, of course, said Colin, still a little taken aback. We only thought... I mean, we, we thought we'd better get you before we did anything, said Michael hastily. Then you will both remain here, said Poirot. I will approach from the other side so as not to disturb the footprints. Such excellent footprints. Are they not so very clear? The footprints of a man and a girl going out together to the place where she lies, and then the man's footsteps come back. But the girls do not. They must be the footprints of the murderer, said Colin, with bated breath. Exactly, said Poirot. The footprints of the murderer. A long, narrow foot with a rather peculiar type of shoe. Very interesting. Easy, I think, to, to recognize. Yes, those footprints will be very important. At that moment, Desmond Lee Wortley came out of the house with Sarah and joined them. What on earth are you all doing here, he demanded in a somewhat theatrical manner. I saw you from my bedroom window. What's up? Good Lord, what's this? It, it, it looks like... Exactly, said Hercule Poirot. It looks like murder, does it not? Sarah gave a gasp, then shot a quick suspicious glance at the two boys. You mean someone's killed the girl? What's her name? Bridget? demanded Desmond. Who on earth would want to kill her? It's unbelievable. There are many things that are unbelievable, said Poirot. Especially before breakfast, is it not? That is what one of your classics say. Six impossible things before breakfast. He added, Please wait here, all of you. Carefully making a circuit, he approached Bridget and bent for a moment down over the body. Colin and Michael were now both shaking with suppressed laughter. Sarah joined them, murmuring, What have you two been up to? Good old Bridget, whispered Colin. Isn't she wonderful? Not a twitch. I've never seen anything look so dead as Bridget does, whispered Michael. Hercule Poirot straightened up again. This is a terrible thing, he said. His voice held an emotion it had not held before. Overcome by mirth, Michael and Colin both turned away. In a choked voice, Michael said, What, what must we do? There is only one thing to do, said Poirot. We must send for the police. Will one of you telephone, or would you prefer me to do it? I think, said Colin, I, I think... What about it, Michael? Yes, said Michael. I, I think the jig's up now. He came forward. For the first time, he seemed a little unsure of himself. I'm awfully sorry, he said. I, I hope you won't mind too much. It's a, um, it was a sort of joke uh, for Christmas and all that. You know, we, we thought we'd, well, lay on a murder for you. You thought that you would lay on a murder for me? Then this... Then this... Uh, it's just a show we put on, explained Colin, to make you feel at home, you know. Aha, said Hercule Poirot. I understand you make of me the April Fool, is that it? But today is not uh, April the 1st, it is December the 26th. I suppose 
We oughtn't to have done it, really," said Colin. "But, but you don't mind very much, do you, Monsieur Poirot? Come on, Bridget," he called. "Get up. You, you must be half frozen to death already." The figure in the snow, however, did not stir. "It is odd," said Hercule Poirot. "She does not seem to hear you." He looked thoughtfully at them. "It is a, a joke," you say. "You are sure this is a joke?" "Why, yes." Colin spoke uncomfortably. We, we didn't mean any harm. But why then does Mademoiselle Bridget not get up? I can't imagine," said Colin. "Come on, Bridget," said Sarah impatiently. "Don't go on lying there, playing the fool." "We really are sorry, Monsieur Poirot," said Colin apprehensively. "We, we do really apologize."、Uh, "You need not apologize," said Poirot in a peculiar tone. "What do you mean?" Colin stared at him. He turned again. Bridget, Bridget, what's the matter? Why doesn't she get up? Why does she go on lying there? Poirot beckoned to Desmond. You, Mister Lee Wortley,、uh, come here. Desmond joined him. Feel her pulse, said Poirot. Desmond Lee Wortley bent down. He touched the arm, the wrist. There's no pulse. He stared at Poirot. Her arm stiff. Good God! She really is dead. Poirot nodded. Yes, she is dead. He said, "Someone has turned a comedy into a tragedy." Someone? Who? There is a set of footprints going and returning. A set of、uh, footprints that bears a strong resemblance to the footprint you have just made, Mister Lee Wortley, coming from the path to this spot. Desmond Lee Wortley wheeled around. What on earth are you accusing me? Me? You're crazy. Why on earth would I want to kill the girl? Ah, why? I wonder. Let us see. He bent down and very gently pried open the stiff fingers of the girl's clenched hand. Desmond drew a sharp breath. He gazed down unbelievingly. In the palm of the dead girl's hand was what appeared to be a large ruby. It's a Damn thing out of the pudding! He cried. Is it? Said Poirot. Are you sure? Of course it is. With a swift movement, Desmond bent down and plucked the red stone out of Bridget's hand.、Uh, you should not do that,、uh, said Poirot reproachfully. Nothing should have been disturbed. I haven't disturbed the body, have I? But this thing might might get lost, and it's it's evidence. The great thing is to get to the police here as soon as possible. I'll go at once and telephone. He wheeled round and ran sharply toward the house. Sarah came swiftly to Poirot's side. "I don't understand," she whispered. Her face was dead white. "I don't understand." She caught at Poirot's arm. "What did you mean about about the footprints?"、Uh, "Look for yourself, Mademoiselle. The footprints that led to the body and back again were the same as the ones just made accompanying Poirot to the girl's body and back." "You mean that it was Desmond?" Nonsense! Suddenly, the noise of a car came through the clear air. They wheeled round. They saw the car clearly enough, driving at a furious pace down the drive. And Sarah recognized what car it was. It's Desmond, she said. It's Desmond's car. He must have gone to fetch the police instead of telephoning. Diana Middleton came running out of the house to join them. What's happened? She cried in a breathless voice. Desmond just came rushing into the house. He said something about Bridget being killed, and then he rattled the telephone. But he was dead. He couldn't get an answer. He said the wires must have been cut. He said the only thing was to take a car and go for the police. Why the police? Poirot made a gesture. Bridget. Diana stared at him. But surely, isn't it a joke of some kind? I heard something, something last night. I. I thought that they were going to play a joke on you, Monsieur Poirot. Yes, said Poirot. That was the idea to play a joke on me. But now, come into the house, all of you. We shall catch our deaths of cold out here, and and there is nothing to be done until Mister Lee Wortley returns with the、uh, the police. But look here, said Colin. We can't, we can't leave Bridget here alone. You can do her no good by remaining, said Poirot gently. Come. It is a sad, a very sad tragedy. But there is nothing we can do any more to help Mademoiselle Bridget. So let us come in and get warm and have perhaps a cup of tea or of coffee.
they followed him obediently into the house. Peveril was just about to strike the gong. If he thought it extraordinary for most of the household to be outside, and for Poirot to make an appearance in pajamas and an overcoat, he displayed no sign of it. Peveril, in his old age, was still the perfect butler. He noticed nothing that he was not asked to notice. They went into the dining room and sat down. When they all had a cup of coffee in front of them and were sipping it, Poirot spoke. I have to recount to you a little history. I, I cannot tell you all the details, uh, no, but I can give you the main outline. It concerns a young princeling who came to this country. He brought with him a famous jewel which he was to have reset for the lady he was going to marry. But unfortunately, before that, he made uh, friends with a very pretty young lady. This uh, pretty young lady did not care very much for the man, but she did care for his jewel. So much so that one day she disappeared with the historic possession which had uh, belonged to his house for generations. So the poor young man, he is in a quandary, you see. Above all, he cannot have a scandal. Impossible to go to the police... Therefore he comes to me, to Hercule Poirot. Recover for me, he says, my historic ruby. Eh bien, is this young lady, she has a friend, and the friend he has put through several questionable transactions. He has been concerned with the blackmail, and he has been concerned with the sale of jewelry abroad. Always he has been clever. He is suspected, yes, but nothing can be proved. It comes to my knowledge that this very clever gentleman, he is spending Christmas here in this house. It is important that the pretty young lady, once she has acquired the jewel, should disappear for a while from circulation, so that no pressure can be put upon her, uh, no questions can be asked her. It is arranged, therefore, that she come here to King's Lacey, ostensibly as the sister of the clever gentleman. Sarah drew a sharp breath. Oh, no. Oh, no, n not here. Not with me here. But uh, so it is, said Poirot. And by a little manipulation, I too become a guest here for Christmas. This young lady, she is supposed to have just come out of the hospital. She is much better when she arrives here, but then comes the news that I too arrive, a detective, a well-known detective. At once, she has what you call um, the wind up. She hides the ruby in the first place she can think of. And then, uh, very quickly, she has a relapse and takes to her bed again. She does not want that I should see her, for doubtless I have a photograph I shall recognize here. It is very boring for her, yes, but uh, she has to stay in her room, and her brother, he brings her up the trays. And the ruby, demanded Michael. I think, said Poirot, that at the moment it is mentioned I arrive, the young lady was in the kitchen with uh, the rest of you, all laughing and talking and stirring the uh, Christmas puddings. The Christmas puddings are put into bowls, and the young lady, she hides the ruby, pressing it down into one of the pudding bowls. Not the one that we are going to have on Christmas Day, oh no. That one, she knows, is in a special mold. She put it in the other one, the one that is destined to be eaten on New Year's Day. Before then, she will be ready to leave, and when she leaves, no doubt that uh, Christmas pudding will go with her. But see, her fate takes her hand. On the very morning of Christmas Day, there is an accident. The Christmas pudding in its uh, fancy mold is dropped on the stone floor, and uh, the mold is shattered to pieces. So, what can be done? The good Mrs. Ross, she takes another pudding and sends it in. Good Lord, said Colin, do you mean that on Christmas Day, when Grandfather was eating his pudding, that that was a real ruby he got in his mouth? Precisely, said Poirot. And you can imagine the emotions of Mr. Desmond Lee Wortley when he saw that, eh? Eh bien, what happens next? Uh, the ruby has passed around. I examined it, and I managed uh, unobtrusively to slip it in my pocket. In a careless way, as so I were not interested. But one person at least observes what I have done. When I lie in bed, that person searches my room. He searches me. He does not find the ruby. Why? Because, said Michael breathlessly, you had given it to Bridget. That's what you mean. And so that's why. But, 
But I don't understand quite. I, I mean... Look here. What did happen? Poirot smiled at him. Come now into the library, he said, and, and look out of the window, and I will show you something that uh, may explain the mystery. He led the way, and they followed him. Consider once again, said Poirot, the scene of the crime. He pointed out of the window. A simultaneous gasp broke from the lips of all of them. There was no body lying on the snow. No trace of the tragedy seemed to remain, except a mass of scuffled snow. It wasn't all a dream, was it? said Colin faintly. I... Has someone taken the body away? Ah, said Poirot, you see, the mystery of the disappearing body. He nodded his head, and his eyes twinkled gently. Good Lord, cried Michael. Monsieur Poirot, you are... You haven't... Oh, look here. He's been having us on all this time. Poirot twinkled more than ever. It is true, my children. I also have had my little joke. I knew about your little plot, you see, and so I arranged a counterplot of my own, and voila, Mademoiselle Brigitte. None the worse, I hope, for your exposure in the snow. Never should I forgive myself if you were trapped in fluxion de poitrine. Bridget had just come into the room. She was wearing a thick skirt and a woolen sweater. She was laughing. Uh, send a tisane to your room, said Poirot severely. You have drunk it? One sip was enough, said Bridget. I'm all right. Did I do it well, Monsieur Poirot? Goodness, my arm hurts still after that tourniquet you made me put on it. You were splendid, my child, said Poirot. Splendid. But see, the others are still in the fog. Last night I went to Mademoiselle Brigitte. I told her that I knew about your little complot, and I asked her if she would act a part for me. She did it uh, cleverly. She made the footprints with a pair of Mr. Lee Wortley's shoes. Sarah said in a harsh voice, But what's the point of it all, Monsieur Poirot? What's the point of sending Desmond off to fetch the police? They'll be very angry when they find out it's nothing but a hoax. Poirot shook his head gently. But I do not think for one moment, mademoiselle, that Mr. Lee Wortley went to fetch the police. Murder is a thing in which Mr. Lee Wortley does not want to be mixed up. He lost his nerve badly. All he could see was his chance to get to Ruby. He snatched that, but he pretended the telephone was out of order, and rushed off in a car on the pretense of fetching the police. I think myself it is the last you will see of him for some time. He has, I understand, his own ways of getting out of England. He has his own uh, plane, has he not, mademoiselle? Sarah nodded. Yes, she said. We were thinking of... She stopped. He wanted you to elope with him that way, did he not? Eh bien, that is a very good way of smuggling a jewel out of the country. When you are eloping with a girl and the fact is publicized, then you will not be suspected of also smuggling a historic jewel out of the country. Oh, yes, that would have made a very good camouflage. I don't believe it, said Sarah. I don't believe a word of it. Then ask his sister, said Poirot, gently nodding his head over her shoulder. Sarah turned her head sharply. A platinum blonde stood in the doorway. She wore a fur coat and was scowling. She was clearly in a furious temper. Sister, my foot, she said with a short, unpleasant laugh. That swine's no brother of mine, so he's beaten it, I see, and left me to carry the can. The whole thing was his idea. He put me up to it, said it was the money for jam. They'd never prosecute because of the scandal. I could always threaten to say that Ali had given me his historic jewel. Des and I were to have shared the swag in Paris, and now the swine runs out on me. I'd like to murder him. She switched abruptly. The sooner I get out of here. Can someone telephone for a taxi? A, a car is waiting at the front door to take you to the station, mademoiselle, said Poirot. When he returned to the dining room, after assisting the spurious Miss Lee Wortley into the waiting car, Colin was waiting for him. There was a frown on his boyish face. And look here, Monsieur Poirot, what about them ruby? Do you mean to say you've let him get away with it? Poirot's face fell. He twirled his mustaches. He seemed ill at ease. I shall recover it yet, he said weakly. There are other ways. I shall still... Well, I do think, said Michael, to let that swine get away with Ruby. Bridget was sharper. He's having us on again, she cried. You are, aren't you, Monsieur Poirot? 
Shall we do a final conjuring trick, mademoiselle? Feel in my left-hand pocket. Bridget thrust her hand in. She drew it out again with a scream of triumph and held aloft a large ruby blinking in crimson splendor. You comprehend, explained Poirot. The one that was clasped in your hand was a paste replica. I bought it from London in case it was uh, possible to make a substitute. You understand? We do not want the scandal. Monsieur Desmond will try and dispose of that ruby in uh, Paris or in Belgium or wherever it is he has his contacts, and then it will be discovered that the stone is not real. What could be more excellent? Or... Avoided. My princeling uh, receives his ruby back, he returns to his country and makes a sober and, we hope, a happy marriage. Uh, all ends well. Except for me, Sarah murmured under her breath. She spoke so low that no one heard her, but Poirot, he shook his head gently. You are in error, Mademoiselle Sarah, in what you say there. You have gained experience. All experience is valuable. Ahead of you, I prophesy, there lies happiness. That's what you say, said Sarah. But look here, Monsieur Poirot, Colin was frowning. How did you know about the show we were going to put on for you? It is uh, my business to know things, said Hercule Poirot. He twirled his mustache. Yes, but I, I don't see how you could have managed it. Did, did someone split? Did, did someone come and tell you? No, 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 not that. Well, then how? Tell us how. They all chorused. Yes, tell us how. But no, Poirot protested. But no, if I tell you how I deduce that, you will think nothing of it. It is like the conjurer who shows how his tricks are done. Tell us, Monsieur Poirot. Go on, tell us, tell us. You really wish that I should solve uh, for you this last mystery? Yes, go on, tell us. Ah, I do not think I can. Uh, you will be so disappointed. Now, come on, Monsieur Poirot, tell us, how did you know? Well, you see, I was sitting in the library by the window in a chair after tea the other day, and I was reposing myself. I had been asleep, and when I woke, you were discussing your plans just outside the window close to me. And the window was open at the top. Is that all? cried Colin, disgusted. How simple! Is it not? said Hercule Poirot, smiling. You see, you are disappointed. Oh, well, said Michael, at any rate, we know everything now. Do we? murmured Hercule Poirot to himself. I do not. I, whose business it is to know things... He walked out into the hall, shaking his head a little. For perhaps the twentieth time, he drew from his pocket a rather dirty piece of paper. Don't eat none of the plum pudding. One as wishes you well. Hercule Poirot shook his head reflectively. He who could explain everything could not explain this. Humiliating. Who had written it? Why had it been written? Until he found that out, he would never know a moment's peace. Suddenly, he came out of his reverie to be aware of a peculiar, gasping noise. He looked sharply down. On the floor, busy with a dustpan and brush, was a tow-headed creature in a flowered overall. She was staring at the paper in his hand with large, round eyes. Oh, sir, said this apparition. Oh, sir, please, sir. And who may you be, mon enfant, inquired Monsieur Poirot genially. I need that, sir. Please don't. I, I come here to help Mrs. Ross. I didn't mean, sir. I, I didn't mean to, to do anything what I shouldn't do. I, I didn't mean it well, sir. For your good, I mean. Enlightenment came to Pavo. He held out the dirty piece of paper. Did you write that any? I didn't mean any harm, sir. Really, I didn't. Of course, you didn't any. He smiled at her. But uh, tell me about it. Why did you write this? Well, it was him too, sir, Mr. Lee Wortley and his sister. Not that she was his sister, I'm sure. None of us thought so. And she wasn't ill a bit. We could all tell that. We thought, we, we all thought something queer was going on. I tell you straight, sir, I was in her bathroom taking in the clean towels and I listened at the door. He was in her room and they was talking together. I heard what they said, plain is plain. This detective, he was saying, this fellow Poirot who's coming here, we've got to do something about it. We've got to get him out of the way as soon as possible. And then he says to her in a nasty, sinister sort of way, lowering his voice, where did you put it? And she answered him, in the pudding. 
Oh, sir, my heart gave such a leap, I thought it would stop beating. I thought they meant to poison you in a Christmas pudding. I don't know what to do. Mrs. Ross, she wouldn't listen to the likes of me. Then the idea came to me as I'd write you a warning, and, and, and I did. I put it in your pillow where you'd find it when you went in bed. Annie paused breathlessly. Poirot surveyed her gravely for some minutes. You see, too many sensational films, I think, Annie, he said at last. Well, perhaps it is the television that affects you, but the important thing is that you have the good heart and a certain amount of ingenuity. When I return to London, I will send you a present. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. What would you like, Annie, as a present? Anything I like, sir? Could, could I have anything I like? Uh, within reason, said Hercule Poirot prudently. Uh, yes. Oh, sir, could I have a vanity box? A real posh, slap-up vanity box, like the one Mr. Lee Wortley's sister, what wasn't his sister, had? Yes, said Poirot. Yes, I, I think uh, that could be managed. It is interesting, he mused. I was in a museum the other day, uh, observing some antiquities from uh, Babylon, or uh, one of those places thousands of years old, and among them were cosmetic boxes. <laughs> the heart of a woman does not change. I beg pardon, sir, said Annie. It is nothing, said Poirot. I reflect you shall have your vanity box, child. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, thank you very much indeed, sir. Annie departed ecstatically. Poirot looked after her, nodding his head in satisfaction. Ah, oh, he said to himself, And now I do... There is nothing more to be done here. A pair of arms slipped round his shoulders unexpectedly. If you will stand just under the mistletoe, said Bridget. Hercule Poirot enjoyed it. He enjoyed it very much. He said to himself that he had had a very good Christmas. The Signal Oil Program... The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the whistler. And remember... Let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Decision. Months later, when he finally got a chance to think about it clearly, he decided that if it hadn't happened so suddenly, it might not have happened at all. It was April, of course. That might have had something to do with it. The rhododendrons were blooming in Golden Gate Park, the kids playing ball on the green lawns, and spring sifting in the open window of his office on the 20th floor of the Hamilton Building. As Dr. Paul Evans sat looking at an uninspiring assortment of x-rays of Mrs. Harrison's chest cavity. Excuse me, Dr. Evans. 
Oh, what is it, nurse? There's a phone call from Mrs. John Cameron. Can you see her today? Is it important? She says so. Well, they all do. When am I free? Well, there's 12.30. All right, I'll see her then. But what about lunch? I'll have to skip it. Mrs. Cameron's heart is undoubtedly more important than my lunch. Yes, it could have been the way that it happened. It's startling suddenness, throwing you off balance. Or maybe it was just spring in San Francisco. But most of all, it was a black-haired girl with blue eyes, standing by the window when you looked up from your x-rays a half hour later. You remember exactly how she looked. The jersey dress with a gold belt and clip. The smart little felt hat, accenting her dark hair, making you realize in a split second what was wrong with all the girls you ever knew. She must have come in while you sat at the film illuminator, looking at negative evidence, micro making notes. minor valvular lesions, plus slight enlargement. You're Dr. Evans. All uh, right, I'll be with you in just a moment. Request detailed cardiograph immediately. There we are. Please sit down. I'll get rid of this stuff. Now, you must... The... Oh. Hello. How do you do? I'm Carol Cameron. Yes, I... The nurse said you were rather concerned about yourself. Oh, it's not about myself. It's... Well, it's about my... My husband. I see. John Cameron. Perhaps you've heard of him? Stocks and bonds, isn't it? Yes. Few too many, I'm afraid. Oh? He's... Well, he's been under a terrible strain recently. The night before last, he had a rather severe attack. His heart? Yes. Dr. Miles, our family physician, suggested I see you about it. Uh, where is your husband now? Oh, at, at home. In bed. Didn't Dr. Miles recommend the hospital? Oh, well, John's awfully unreasonable. He wouldn't hear of it. Insisted he'd be up and around in a day or two. That is unreasonable. You'll see him, Dr. Evans. Of course. I'll be glad to do what I can. Just like that, Paul. A minute or so and she's gone. You look up, you see her. And 30 seconds later, she could ask if you'd mind going to the North Pole for her. And you'd tell her you'd be glad to. All afternoon, you try to shrug it off. Tell yourself it's fantastic. That this is the sort of thing that keeps you away from second-rate movies. But that evening, when you call on John Cameron, it's still there. Lucinda Withers, the housekeeper, is waiting outside the door after you finish your examination. Where's Mrs. Cameron, Lucinda? She went out for a moment, sir. Tell me, is it serious? I'm afraid it is. I knew it. I could see it coming on. He's like a son to me, Doctor. I've been with the family for 20 years now, since way before she came. I see. He was never like this before. What do you mean by that? She's not good for him. Worries him. Makes him nervous. Keeps him thinking about the 15 years between them. Uh, I'll have a prescription set over in the morning. I better be going now. My taxi's waiting outside. Just keep him as quiet as you can, and I'll check him again tomorrow. Very well, Doctor. Oh, Dr. Evan, just a minute. I wondered what happened to you. I was just about to go. I left instructions with the maid. How is he? And John Epectorus. It's rather serious, I'm afraid. Oh, he hasn't been taking very good care of himself. He's got to now. I see. Must you go right away? I'm afraid I'd better. My taxi's waiting. Oh, I thought it was waiting. It doesn't seem to be there now. That's odd. I told him to wait. I didn't even pay him. Oh, I, I'd be glad to take you. I can't understand. Oh, I... the car's down at the curb. Oh, no, I couldn't. It'll only take a minute to call. Oh, please, I... please let me. It's really no trouble. All right. I'll get my coat. <laughs> There you are, Doctor. 
right to the door. It was awfully nice of you, Mrs. Cameron. Well, I... I guess the next thing to do is get out. Oh, just a minute. Well, I... I want to tell you I lied about the taxi. I told him to go. Why? Because I wanted to take you home. I'm very flattered. That's all. I just wanted to tell you. It happened to you too, didn't it? Yes. There's a friend of mine, Dr. Andrews, awfully good heart man. I'm sure he'll take oh, the Oh, please. Case. Please don't do that. What else can I do? It's only going to make it worse if Oh, I... I know, but you... Well, you just can't throw away what's happened to us, can you? It'd be wrong It'd be to... wrong to do anything else, Carol. Is that what we're here for? Spend our lives looking for something that isn't there. Then to suddenly find it. Throw it away. Please, Carol. Well, shall we forget it? I'll... I'll be around tomorrow with the prescription. So that's the way it started, Paul. Yes, it was easy to analyze it, to list a million reasons why it was wrong. But the trouble was that when you were all through analyzing, it was still there, stronger than ever. You visit John Cameron the next day, and the day after that. And before you know it, the days have grown into weeks. And the night you arrange to meet her secretly at that little French cafe on Washington Street leads to a lot more of them. The two of you at the little corner table, Pierre reserves especially. Not saying much. Just watching the flickering candles all around the room. Listening to the music. Well... Been over a month now, Carol. Yes. Hard to realize it. Are you happy? Happy and miserable. Did you expect anything else? No. I knew it was going to be this way. Oh, it's just that I I feel so so helpless. I'm glad you could come tonight, Carol, because I Because what? Because I think this is going to be the last time. I was afraid you were going to say that. Don't you see how impossible it all is? We're both beating our heads against the stone wall. You're right, Carol. We are helpless. The only thing we can do is try and be square with ourselves. It just won't work any other way. I suppose not. He'll probably go on like this for years. He might if he's careful. Oh, it's terrible to feel this way. What way? I, well, I can't help it, Paul. I... I almost wish he'd... Carol. Oh, it's true. I never loved him, Paul. My family thought he'd be good for me. I didn't want any part of it. I know, I know. You don't have to tell me. He's unhappy. He's sick and miserable. It'll always be that way. Why should Please, he... Please, Carol. This is going to be the last time. I mean it. I think I can get Andrews on the case next week. Look at me, Carol. It's going to work out somehow. In the right way. Will you believe that? All right, Paul. If you say so. Yes, Paul. It was the only thing to do. The honorable thing. Approved 100% by the Medical Association. But it doesn't help you sleep that night. And it doesn't help the next day when you make your regular call on John Cameron. Examine him. Find him the same. Leave his prescription bottle with Carol and go. Yes, it had to end, Paul. Because you were both beginning to think the thing that Carol almost said at the restaurant. That you both wished John would die. Then at ten o'clock that night... Hello? Dr. Evans? Yes? You must come at once, doctor. Mr. Cameron's had an attack. I'll be right over, Lucinda. Now, listen carefully. There's a bottle of amyl nitrite in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Break up a tablet and a handkerchief and make him inhale it. Is that clear? It's too late for that, doctor. I'm afraid he's dead. With the prologue of tonight's story, Decision... 
The Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But first, a word of thanks to you for a very special honor you have bestowed on The Whistler. In the most recent radio survey, The Whistler received the highest popularity rating in all radio history for a West Coast program. Not just top popularity, mind you, but by far the highest popularity rating in the entire history of West Coast shows. That's an honor never before received by any other program. An honor for which we of the cast and all signal dealers who bring you The Whistler want to thank you. For after all, we realize it's your loyalty to The Whistler that has made this honor possible. And believe me, with such an incentive, you can count on all of us to keep every performance our very best performance. So you'll continue to tune in the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Monday night. And incidentally, next time you're out driving, we also hope you'll stop at one of the friendly service stations displaying Signal's familiar yellow and black circle sign. And try that other current Signal success, the new Signal gasoline. There's no better way to tune in top performance for your car than with that power-packed new super fuel that now helps you go farther than ever. New Signal gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. finally happened, Paul. John Cameron is dead. But it hasn't affected you as you thought it would. There was something so sudden about it. It happened so soon after you and Carol had decided to call it off. After she'd almost said what you'd both been thinking. Yes, there's something wrong with it. It just feels wrong. That's why after you've examined him, you turn to Lucinda. Lucinda? Yes, Doctor. You were here when it happened? Yes. Mrs. Cameron had given him his medicine and gone to bed. I heard him call. What happened then? He'd been violently sick. Said his throat was burning. What do you mean? That's right, sir. And he was all doubled up with cramps. Oh, you're wrong. You must be. It's the truth, sir. Did you give him anything? No. It was my night out. And I'd only just come in when all of the... I see. Excuse me a minute. Well, Paul... Don't go in there. There's nothing you can do now. I know. Well, it's... It's over. Carol... Oh, don't say anything, Paul. I don't want to talk about it or think about it anymore. Ever. We've got to think about it. I know. You don't have to tell me. Oh, he... He was all right this morning. Just as well as could be expected. All right, Carol. What happens now? I... I won't say any more. You know what's ahead, I guess. Of course. I'll be all right. Oh, it's just You better get to bed. You need some rest. I'll take care of everything. It's almost midnight when you get back to the office and take the prescription bottle out of your pocket, the one you took from Carol's medicine cabinet. You forget to take off your hat and overcoat as you throw a few pieces of laboratory equipment together, dissolve the powder in water, and make a test. A very simple test. Thiocyanin. I knew it. Poison. Well, Paul, it's quite a decision, isn't it? You look down at the blank death certificate on your desk until the letters burn into your brain and you can see them when you close your eyes. It's the most important decision you'll ever have to make, Paul. Is that what we're here for? To spend our lives looking for something that isn't there? Then to suddenly find it and throw it away? Two o'clock. Three, four. All you can do is sit and stare at the desk, trying to think it through. Your medical certificate's on one wall. The Hippocratic Oath in a neat black frame on the other. Six o'clock, seven, eight. Then your nurse arrives. 
Why, Doctor, you've been here all night? Yes, had an important case. Cameron. He's dead. Well, well, it was only a matter of time. Yes, I guess it was. You were filling out the certificate? You can fill it out for me. Death from natural causes. And Gina Pectoris, acute. Just fill out the death certificate. Heart disease? Yes. Do you think they'll investigate? You've got to be careful, awfully careful. I will. Poison isn't easy to cover up, Carol. They'd find it in a second if they ever got suspicious, so listen. I'll send the certificate over this morning. Take it to a mortuary right away and ask for cremation. If nobody gets curious during the next week, I think we'll be safe. All right, Paul. We mustn't be seen together under any circumstances. I don't want you to even telephone me if you can possibly help it. Okay? Okay. That's all, then. Good luck, darling. Hello, Evans. Oh, hello, Miles. How are you? A little puzzled at the moment. Thought I'd drop in for a minute. Sure, have a chair. Thanks. It's about Cameron. I've had a rather distressing experience. Oh? You know, I've been their family doctor for some time. I didn't know Mrs. Cameron before she married John some years ago. But I've always thought her a rather charming person. She seems to be. You, uh, you know her pretty well, Paul? Well, naturally, in attending her husband, I... Of course. You think she's a woman of character? I'd say so. So would I. Miss Lucinda Withers, however, seems to think she's a murderess. What does that mean? I don't know. The woman was completely confusing, a lot of rambling, disconnected remarks that seemed to imply that uh, you and Mrs. Cameron were in love. But there was a practical reason for her requesting cremation. And Cameron had always been against it. Oh, what's wrong with that? Supposing she didn't know. I just think, Paul, that you ought to do something about Miss Withers. You know as well as I that this sort of thing can ruin you. Hello. Hello, Carol. Listen, darling. You've got to get Withers out of town. Yes, I know it'll make it look worse, but it's the only thing we can do. Where's her family? Idaho, good. Tell her she needs a rest, anything. I know it sounds crazy, but it's better than sitting around waiting for the axe to fall. That's it. Good luck, darling. You're walking on thin ice, Paul. You can almost hear it cracking under your feet. And it seems to be getting thinner. The funeral on Thursday, then Friday, Saturday, and Lucinda's still in town. Carol was right. It only made it worse to try and get her to leave. You're just waiting now. It's only a matter of time. And then bright and early Monday morning... Hello, Doctor. I'm Willard Stevens. How do you do? I'm afraid I don't... I'm John Cameron's cousin. Flew out from New York. I see. I have a rather delicate problem on my hands, Doctor. I hope you'll understand. I'll try to. About John's death, I had a letter from him indicating he planned to make certain changes in his will. It arrived just a day or two before he died. Does that suggest anything to you? No, I'm afraid it doesn't. You naturally ascribed his death to his heart condition. Yes, naturally. Well, I realize it would be embarrassing for me to contest your diagnosis... Uh, I'm hoping you'll work with me in... In what? Well, I had a talk with Miss Withers the night I arrived. She's a meddlesome old fool. No? How did you know? Dr. Miles told me. Does that answer your question? It answers that question. I assume you have others, then. Indeed, I have. And I'm afraid, Doctor, there's only one way to answer them. What's that? An exhumation and an autopsy. <laughs> So that's it, Paul. It's all over now but the trial. The next decision is easy, isn't it? It would be useless to try and run away. It would never lead to anything. 
You and Carol could never find happiness with an axe hanging over your head. So the next day, during the autopsy, you sit at home quietly in the chair by the phone, waiting for it to ring. Hello? Hello, darling. Is it over? Yes. They're waiting downstairs to take me to the coroner's office. Paul. Paul, would you do me a favor? Anything, Carol. Will you leave now? What do you mean? Oh, look. If it's going to happen, there's no reason for it happening to... to both of us. Well, that's about the most ridiculous thing you ever Paul, said. Paul, please, please Go with them, Carol. I'll be down there in an but hour. It's, it's... Carol, there's only one thing in the world right now. When that's gone, I... I don't want to be here anymore. I hoped you'd say that. Keep your chin up, darling. I'll see you in an hour. Yes? I'm Paul Evans. Oh, this way. All right, Lieutenant. There he is. Just a minute, Miss Withers. Make him admit it. He's in love with her. It's been going on I for... said just a minute. What about it, Dr. Evans? It's written all over his face. All right, all right. I'm in love with Mrs. Cameron. So what? The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. But first, a question. Why do you suppose it is that almost 5,000 of today's overaged cars are dying, going out of service each day? Are they completely worn out? Definitely not. But certain vital parts are worn out which can't be replaced today. That's why signal dealers take no chance of overlooking even one part when they lubricate your car. Instead, they use Signal's famous lubrication chart, on which the maker of your car shows every lubrication point and specifies which of Signal's nine specialized oils and greases each part should have for long, trouble-free service. And to make doubly sure not a single part is missed, your Signal dealer checks each part against this chart not just once, but twice, which is why it's called Signal Double Check Lubrication. This is just another example of the more thorough, more conscientious service your car gets from an independently operated signal station. Another reason your signal man is a mighty good man for you to know now, when you really want your car to go farther. And now, back to the whistle. <laughs> So you stand there, Paul, shouting to the high heavens that you're in love with Carol, with all of them clustered around you like vultures. It doesn't seem to matter anymore, does it? There's a long silence, and then the police lieutenant slowly walks over to Lucinda Winter. All right, Miss Withers. Now that we're all here, maybe you'll tell us why you tried to frame Mrs. Cameron. I... I, I don't know what you're talking about. On April 5th, you bought 100 grains of thiocyanin at the black and white pharmacy on O'Farrell Street, right? I did no such thing. You signed Evelyn Jones on the register. That's a lie. Is this the woman, Mr. Thurston? That's the woman. I, I make a practice of remembering the faces of people who buy poison. Oh, excuse me, Lieutenant. I, I'd like to sit down. Oh, sure, Doctor. Take a chair over there. Now, Miss Withers... Why did you try to frame Mrs. Cameron? Why did you put poison in the medicine you knew she had to give him? I didn't. I didn't Don't do it. Don't lie to me. What did you do with the bottle? I didn't do anything with it. I left it in the... Oh. You did have the bottle, huh? Now, why did you try to frame Mrs. Cameron? Why did you try to frame her? She killed him. She killed him just as surely as if... As if she put the poison in the bottle instead of you. That's it, isn't it? She didn't love him. She never did. He was as good as dead. So you thought you'd finish the job and hang it around her neck? I've got to see Mrs. Cameron, Lieutenant. Where is she? In the next room, lying down. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Evans. Now, Miss Withers. We're going to take this all down right from the first. Carol. Oh. Darling, I'm a fool. I thought all the time that you'd killed him after what oh, you said. Oh, I know you had every reason. When I think how I acted after it happened, but well, I thought it was you. You gave me his prescription that morning, and... An hour after I gave it to him, he was dead. So Lucinda killed him. She thinks she did. 
They say they'll have a better case against her if they let her confess at first, before they tell her. Tell her what? Well, when, when you brought the new prescription that morning, the old bottle was still half full. And that's the one she put the poison in. What? That's the way it happened, Paul. You see, I used the new one the night he died. That's why I was so sure you did it. But the prescription was perfectly all right. There was oh, nothing... Of course it was. I was so sure he was poisoned. Those symptoms... Oh, Lucinda was lying, Paul. About the burning in his throat and the cramps. Don't you see? Then the autopsy was okay. There was no murder? They're going to charge her with attempted murder, Paul. You see, your diagnosis was correct. John died of natural causes. Angina pectoris. Acute. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, produced by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Hey, Ethelbert. Oh, hello, Casey. What's Tony Marvin worrying about over there? Why, he's writing a holiday poem. <laughs> And he's stuck for something to rhyme with Christmas stocking. But, Ethelbert, are you kidding? Certainly not. Oh, you mean... Anchor, Anchor Hawking. Oh, gee, fellas, that's wonderful. Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole. Our adventure for tonight, Christmas Shopping. Late afternoon, a crowded aisle in one of our city's largest department stores. Making slow headway through the jostling shoppers are... Casey, I've never seen the store so crowded. Yeah, we say that every year during the week before Christmas, Annie. Where, where are you taking me now, huh? Well, you haven't anything for your Aunt Harriet yet, oh, so I thought right. we'd look at umbrellas there. On this side of the store somewhere. Yeah. Annie, look, uh, you can pick up a much nicer umbrella for Aunt Harriet than I can. I trust your judgment absolutely, Annie. So suppose, suppose you... I shop for all the uninteresting items while you go up to the toy department and watch the electric trains again. Uh, well, you know I've still got to pick up a few more things for my sister's kids, Annie. Mm -hmm. and, uh, hey, Annie, wait a minute. Hang on to your pocketbook. Keep an eye on that little guy in the black overcoat just ahead of us. Who? That's Fingers Fogarty. One of the best-known dips in the city. Pickpocket? Yep. Shove through this mob a little faster, Annie. Now keep him in sight. I think he's closing in on a prospect. You mean he's made up his mind about whose pocket he's going to pick? Sure, smart dips like fingers don't dive into just anybody's pocket. They hang around bars and wait for some guy to flash a roll, and they tail him. And if he gets into a crowd like this... Look, 
Fogarty's doing his stuff now, Henny. No. Yeah. That big fat guy he just bumped into, Fingers took a wallet from his inside pocket. Well, I didn't see him. Neither did the fat guy. Fingers is a smooth worker. Come on. You'll feel very badly when we stop his special brand of Christmas shopping, but pocket picking is considered antisocial. I've got to get Mr. Fogarty. Well, he squeezed through the crowd. I can't see him anymore. Huh? Neither can I. Look, Casey, mm. yell out for somebody to stop him. Well, I yell, stop thief. Well, you can't let him get away. He won't get away. Uh uh-uh. uh. Every cop in this precinct knows fingers. He'll be picked up quick after a charge is brought against him. I'll help that guy who lost his wallet bring the charge. Yes, too. if you appear as a witness. I will. There's the fat man. Excuse me, mister. Huh? <laughs> Something happened to you a minute ago that I don't think you know about. Mm, what do you mean? Your pocket was picked. My pocket? Yeah. A little guy bumped into you, and as he did, I saw his hand go into your inside pocket and come out with a wallet. Well, I happen to know who he is, and when you report your loss to the cops, I'll be glad... You're to... mistaken, mister. I didn't lose my wallet. Huh? I'm sure I... I'm more sure. I tell you, I saw him. When a guy sees something that couldn't be seen, he's either goofy or drunk. On your way, fella. Well, I'll be... Hmm. Good thing you didn't get your hands on fingers, Fogarty. What, what he could have this? plastered you with a nice suit for false arrest. And I know he took a wallet from that fat guy's pocket. I was watching every move that fingers made. Well, I was watching him, too, and I didn't see him take anything. And that fat man says he didn't lose a wallet, so... Okay, I'm goofy or drunk. Or maybe you only need glasses. Well, I do after this. Several glasses. Let's head for the blue note. <laughs> You and Casey get your Christmas shopping done this afternoon, Miss Williams? Well, I accomplished quite a lot, Ethelbert, but not Casey. He got sore, and after that, nothing would please him. What'd you get sore about, pal? Nothing. Oh, he had a little eye trouble. Oh, gee, that's too bad. Did you see spots floating in front of you, Casey? My eyes are okay. Now, fill that glass up again, Ethelbert, and don't ask any right. silly questions. Mine, too, Ethelbert. Right away, Miss Williams. Oh, now, Casey, don't you think it's about time you snapped out of your grouch? Well... It's pretty silly to get yourself all burned up just because you made a mistake. I didn't make a mistake, Annie. Fingers Fogarty took a wallet from that fat guy's pocket. What burns me up is I I didn't find out why the fat guy denied it. Well, how could you find out? Oh, I don't know. But I'm supposed to be a newspaper guy, Annie. Well, we may have missed a story with pictures. Here's your refreshment, folks. Oh, thanks, Ethelbert. Say, have you stopped into your office since you finished shopping? Hey, you... Uh... Huh? Bye, Tender. Who's the boss here? Well, uh, what do you want? You want to buy a nice Christmas tree? You got some nice ones? A wagon full of them, fresh from Nova Scotia. Hmm. Let's see one. Well, I'll be right back. Say, um, Casey, have you two stopped in at your office since you finished your shopping? Certainly not. This is our day off. Then you ain't heard the big news yet. What big news? One of your police reporters, Jake Birkin, was in a few minutes ago and tipped me off about it. Gee, he was all excited. What happened, Ethelbert? About half an hour ago, the cops arrested the kidnapper and murderer of Gregory Walters. They did? Where? Well, where'd they get him? Well, like you know, before the Walters family paid over that $50,000 ransom to the kidnapper, yeah, yeah. the FBI made a list of the serial numbers on the bills, yeah. which they circulated all over the of country. Of course, you know? we know all that, uh, Ethelbert. I... How's this tree, mister? Nice and bushy, huh? Hmm. Let's see one a little taller. A little taller, okay. Ethel Bird, will you tell us about that kidnapper? Well, I'm getting to it. Well, come on, come on. Well, a guy walks into a tavern over on 36th Street tonight, yeah. orders a drink, and hands a barkeep a 20-buck bill with one of them hot numbers on it. The barkeep checks the number, calls a cop, and when the cop searched the guy... He found about 500 bucks more of the ransom dough in his pocket. Well, Ethel, but who is the guy who had the ransom dough? The cops identified him yet? Well, they knew him as soon as they laid eyes on him. But, Ethel, but who is he? Please. Uh, uh, Hey, hey. Is this tray big enough, mister? Uh, let's see. Well, let's see one a little thicker around the bottom. Thicker around the bottom. Ethel, but will you please Casey and I know him. He's always been a small-time crook, and I was surprised to learn he was mixed up with anything so big as kidnapping and murder. Oh, say, will you tell us? I am telling you. It's that little runt, Fingers Fogarty. Fingers Fogarty? Yeah, the tip. He had Walter's ransom dough on him? About 500 bucks, just like I said. Naturally, Fingers denies having anything to do with the kidnapping. He said he lifted the dough out of the pocket of a guy who was Christmas shopping in S.J. Franken's department store. Franken's. Around 4 o'clock this afternoon. Casey Franken. And that fat guy denied he's been robbed. Do you think he was the oh, I can't see fingers as a kidnapper. 
He's always been just a slimy little sneak thief. Hey, what's this about a fat guy, Casey? Annie, Annie, come on. We're going to tell Logan what happened in Franklin's. Well, what did happen, Well, never Casey? mind. You'll hear it later, I... Ethelbert. So long. So long. Hey. Hey. Is this one big enough for you, mister? I tell them to a whole complete news story in two short words, then they run off and leave me out on a limb. What limb? Too big? Hmm? Oh, you. Uh, uh, oh, no. We've got to have a really big tree. Uh, you think Fingers Fogarty may be just the victim of circumstances, Casey. Circumstances peculiar to his profession. Miss Williams and I have told you what happened, Logan. You can add it up. Captain. Have you got anything on Fogarty outside of the $500 found in his pocket? And I did, Miss Williams. A joint he lives in is being searched, but we don't think he was chump enough to hide the rest of his ransom money there. Well, if he lifted the five C's in that fat guy, he has no rest of the dough to hide. Now, look, Casey. Fingers Fogarty knows you pretty well, doesn't he? Yeah, sure, he knows me, certainly. Now, hasn't it occurred to you that he may have put out an act for your benefit? Hmm? I don't get you. Uh, let's assume that Fingers is the real kidnapper. It's been over a year since the ransom money was paid. Fingers has been careful. He hasn't tried to pass any of the 50 grand because he knows it's red hot. But now he figures the heat has died down, so he sends up a trial balloon. How do you mean trial balloon? Well, he's got a record as a dip, Miss Williams. He figures if he gets caught passing that dough, we'll believe that he lifted the money from a guy's pocket. And to cinch it, he acts like he's lifting it from a guy's pocket while Casey is watching him. <laughs> he, he picked you for his star witness, pal. Logan, uh -huh. hasn't it occurred to you that the fat guy might have been sending up that trial balloon? Huh? What do you mean? Assume the fat guy is the real kidnapper. And he wants to know how safe it is to pass those ransom bills. He knows that Fingers is a pickpocket. Well, he goes to one of the little runt's hangouts and flashes a roll in front of him. And then he leaves the joint, saunters into a crowded store where it'll be easy for Fingers to work... And Fingers does exactly what's expected of him. Uh, That's a reasonable theory, Captain. Well, sure. If Fingers gets caught passing that dough, the kidnapper learns about it from the papers and continues to let the money cool off. Also, Fingers has a long record. You cops won't believe anything he tells you. You'll tag him as the Walters kidnapper, which will leave the real one sitting pretty. The only thing the real kidnapper didn't figure was that someone might see Fingers take his wallet... Well, maybe you've got something there, Casey. You and Miss Williams have never seen that fat guy before. Mm -hmm. No, no, but we'll know him if we see him again, though. Definitely. Uh, your description might fit a thousand guys in this town. I want you two to go up to the record room and, and look at some pictures we've got in the file. Uh, oh, great. That'll only take us about four or five hours, though. Oh, Casey. And this was to have been our night off. Perhaps you'll forgive this last-minute reminder, but there are now exactly four more shopping days until Christmas. That means a very real problem to those of us who like to put things off, as who doesn't? Is there anyone you've overlooked, anyone to whom you want to give something beautiful, practical, and inexpensive? Well, you'll find the answer in Fire King Oven Glass. Whether it's a single Fire King casserole or an entire set of Fire King Oven Glass, prices are unbelievably low. And it'll take a minimum of shopping time at your favorite chain, variety, hardware, or department store. So remember, with housekeeping a real problem in this post-war era, Fire King Oven Glass is a gift that makes it easier in so many ways. Because Fire King makes foods go farther and enables you to turn leftovers into delicious main courses. Fire King Oven Glass is a product of Anchor Hawking. A great name in black. Oh, I don't recognize any picture here, Logan. Oh, me either. Oh, golly. Captain, why don't you have some good-looking crooks in your files? I'm going to have nightmares looking at pictures of so many ugly men. You should see the women. <laughs> Logan, you know, there's one picture here that bothers me. It, it, it resembles the guy a lot, but, but well, look at the description that goes with it. 
Nick Penser, Woolstock Prison, discharge 1944, armed robbery. Age 30, height 5 feet. Well, you said your fat guy was a six-footer and at least 45 years old. Yeah. He weighed a good 250 plus, too. This Nick Pence's weight has given us only 135. Well, they can't be the same man, then. No, no, not a chance. It's funny, though, there is a resemblance. Well, uh, we need more than that. Uh, let's all go home and get some sleep. Me yeah. for that. Me, too. I'm so tired, I can't think. I'm falling over. I'll murder anybody who wakes me up before noon tomorrow. Hello. Morning, Annie. Who's this? Wake up, kid. It's Casey. Casey? Oh, oh, Casey. Yeah, Casey, yeah. You remember me, don't you? Yes, I do, and it's only 9 o'clock, and what is the big uh, idea? Annie, Annie, look. I think I know where to look for that fat guy. You do? I certainly do. The old beam wasn't working last night. But when I woke up a few minutes ago, I had it. The strong resemblance between that young half-pint crook, Nick Penser, and our big, fat, 45-year-old guy can't be just coincidental, Annie. They must be relatives, maybe brothers. Mm-hmm, go well, on. Well, I've looked in the phone book and found only one Penser list, a John Penser, contractor, who lives and does business out on Dudley Road. I thought you might like to drive out there with me and see what John Penser looks like. Uh, why don't you have the cops go out and look at him? Uh, Annie, you're not awake yet. Only you and I can identify that fat guy. Besides, if, if you and I find him, Annie, we get, we get an exclusive. The cops are in on it, every paper in town. Well, I'm awake now, all right. Where will I meet you? I'll be outside your door with a car in 15 minutes. Casey, I've got to dress. Uh, oh, we'll make it a half an hour, then. We'll make it a full hour, and no sooner. Well, what are you going to dress, yourself or a Christmas tree? Listen, Annie, I can bathe, shave, and get into my clothes in 10 minutes. I put on underwear. Goodbye. <laughs> Getting close to that address, Annie. Yeah. This isn't a very attractive neighborhood. No. John Penser Contractor can't be much of a concern. And John Penser Contractor may be no relation whatever to the Nick Penser in the police files. The name's very unusual, Ann. I have a hunch. Uh oh. There's the place. Yep. Yeah. I'll stop here so we can look the joint over. Well, there's a concrete garage attached to the house with a good sized truck inside and Room for another. Hmm. Concrete mixer in the workyard. Oh, Casey, established businessman. Don't go in for kidnapping. I think we're on a wild goose chase. Annie, that guy coming out of the garage. Hmm, what about him? He's just a skinny little... Annie, you need glasses and a more photographic memory. He's the man of that police picture. Of course, Nick Penser. Now I know my hunch was right. right. He's looking over here. Well, he's never seen us before, but I'll get rolling anyway. Now, how can we find out if he has a fat brother? Well... Drop into one of these neighborhood stores and make a few inquiries. Then what? Well, how can I tell until I find out what I hope to find out? Annie, you're the darndest girl for asking questions. You're mm. a dog. Now, let's stop there. Now, we'll stop here. We're going to this little drugstore right here. The druggist usually knows everybody in the neighborhood. Come on. Okay, but I think it would be simpler and more sensible to make inquiries at the precinct police station. I don't want the cops in on this until we know where we stand. Here. Let me do the talking. It's your party, wise guy. You handle everything. Uh, what can I do for you young people? Ah, hello, Pop. We're going to have, um... Well, what kind of ice cream soda do you want, Annie? If I must have an ice cream soda, chocolate. Chocolate. Same for me. Uh, two chocolate soda. That's right. Oh, huh? uh, by the way, uh, I'm looking for a party in this neighborhood by the name of Penser. I imagine you know the family well. Penser? Yeah. Never heard the name before. Uh, you never heard of it? Change my order to raspberry. Uh, yes, miss. One raspberry. <clears throat> I'm uh, just a stranger here. Come down from upstate to handle this place while my son's away hunting. Maybe my granddaughter can tell you what you want to know. Say, uh, Katie. Yes, Grandpa? Come here. Fellas looking for a party by the name of Penner. Penner? No, not uh, Penner. Penser. Oh, I know the Pensers. All of them. You do? That's swell. Eh? Mr. Pencil is down the street. Uh-huh. Over his office. He's a contractor. Uh, what's he look like? Is he, uh... uh is Mr. Pence is short and skinny, and his first name is Nick. Uh, well, Nick Pence is not the contractor. Yes, he is. Ever since he got out of prison a couple of years ago. You say somebody's gone to prison, Katie? No, Grandpa. They've come out. That serves him right, then. The man's reform 
in now. Oh, that's bad, very bad. Well, Grandpa's a little deaf. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, sister, I I understand that my friend, Nick, has a brother or a cousin. No. Uh, uh, maybe an uncle? No. Uh, here's the sodies. Uh, who gets your raspberry? He does. Uh, here you are, mister. Thanks. And, Mr. Casey, you have earned it. Sister, you mean Mr. Nick Pencer has no relatives at all? He's got a sister and a nephew. Oh, that's a great help. How old's the nephew? About ten? No, ma'am. It's the funniest thing. Mr. Gus Pencer's a lot older than his uncle. Huh? Mr. Gus is Mr. Nick's partner, I think. And he comes in here all the time. What does Mr. Gus Pencer look like? Well, he's tall and fat, and in the face he looks like Mr. Nick. And he give me that chocolate. You take the raspberry. Oh, Casey. He's our fat guy. Mr. Gus, these well. people were just asking about you. They're friends of Mr. Uh, Nick. Oh, that's bad. Is that so? He recognizes us, Casey. Yeah. Wasn't it lucky I dropped in here when I did to find friends of Nick's? Uh, Grandpa, go back to your back room and put me up uh, two bits worth of turpentine. Uh, two bits worth of turpentine? Uh, go along and help him, sissy. He can never find anything. I'll no, show him, Mr. Gus. Uh, you two were asking about me. You've been told that we were. I noticed a car outside with a press sign on it. Yours? Yeah. And you were looking for me because of what you happened to see in Franken's yesterday. If I said no, you wouldn't believe me. Right. This hand in my pocket has a gun in it, mister. So do exactly as I tell you. Okay. Remember, and don't pull anything. Here's a bottle of turps. Thanks, Grandpa. Here's your two bits. Uh, come on with me, folks. You said you wanted to pay Nick a visit. Oh, Casey. We got no choice, Annie. Right. Uh, so long, Grandpa. Hey, ain't you folks going to finish your sodas? No, we lost our appetites. You didn't take even a sip of your raspberry, mister. That's what you think, sister. Get into your car. Both in the front seat. You drive, fella. I'll sit in the back with this gat. Well, I drive, too. Just down the street to the next place. Mine. You and I are partners in everything. And he'll be tickled to see your old friend. Turn into the work yard and park in our garage. And next to the truck there. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Now what do we do? You and your boyfriend don't do anything, lady. And to make sure you don't... You hit Casey with your gun! And you get the shape! That'll keep the two of you quiet for a while. Nick! Nick! Yeah? What do you want, Gus? Come into the garage, quick. Okay. Whose car you got in there? You'll see. Come inside and help me close these doors. Okay. What's the idea? Take a look inside this car. Who's the guy and the dame? And the two I told you about last night. Saw that dip take the hot dough from my pocket. They got wise to the layout and located us. Hey, police? No. These two are newspaper mugs. I figured they were making this play on their own, so we got to take care of them. Uh, we can't bump them off here. We can. We do it nice, clean, and quiet. Get those big spools of adhesive tape from the house. What are you going to do? You'll see. Get that tape. <laughs> Got the guy all tied up, Gus. And help me with this guy. Yeah. Wrap some more tape around his ankles. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He's fixed now and solid. All right. I climb into that truck and start the motor, Nick. Oh, the carbon monoxide treatment, huh? Yeah. Nice, clean, and quiet. You just lock him in this closed garage to breathe the gas. Tonight, when it's dark, we get rid of their bodies and their car. Start the motor. Anne, I worked the tape off my mouth against that fender. Nod your head if you're okay, kid. Good. <coughs> I'm going to try to pull the adhesive tape off your wrists with my teeth. I'm getting lightheaded. Gas is beginning to work. Uh, uh, 
I've got the tape. Now pull and turn your wrists. Pull more, Andy. There, that did it. Your hands are free. Pull the tape off your mouth now. Okay. Is it again? Keep your head down low, kid. Try to hold on. I will, I will. Pull this tape off my hands. You, you, you better let me free my ankles first so I can get to that truck and shut off the motor. No, no, no. Free my hands. Those two guys may be just outside where they can hear. Yeah, but but, but if it keeps on running, we'll, we'll, we'll... If it doesn't keep on running, we'll have no second chance like this. Free my hands. All right, all right. I, I, I've got the end loose. I... Pull now. There, does it. Now, unwind your ankles while I get this stuff off of mine. What, what good will it do us? We, we, we can't get out of here. We'll uh, get out. Don't this, breathe, Judy. This, this get out. garage is solid concrete. And I heard the lock those heavy doors when they went out. So there, I got my ankles free. Now, hang on, kid. I'm picking you up. What are you going to do? I'm putting you in this truck. This truck? Why? It's taking us out of here. Now, keep your head down. Okay. I'm driving through those doors. Okay, you get through. Pure air. Wait a minute, look. Also, those two Panzer guys, they heard us. Yes, and they have guns, too. Step on my gas, Casey. Drive past them. Let's get away. I can't. You, you can't. Oh, What's the I matter? I the motor. Duck this. Oh, why are they running away? They're, they're getting into that car. They're going to try to get away. If I can only get this motor started again. I can't get it. Now, come on. Casey, don't drive toward their car. They'll stop driving into their car. <laughs> oh, this ten-ton truck does a nice job when it hits a tin can like that. Oh, it. Casey. My nerves will never be the same again. I'll never recognize mine either. Come on, let's call City Desk. <laughs> get the cops out here so we can get to the Blue Note. I need another pair of glasses. The kind you fill. Recently, in a big eastern city, a group of trained men and women called on thousands of housewives and asked this simple question. What kind of container do you prefer for the foods you buy? An overwhelming majority of housewives said they prefer to buy food packed in glass. Among them were a great many mothers of small children, and by a ratio of more than eight to one, these mothers said they insisted on prepared baby foods packed in glass. They gave many reasons, as you might expect, but here are the three reasons mentioned most frequently. First, glass lets you see what you buy before you buy it. Second, you can heat, serve, and store leftover portions of prepared baby food in the same glass container. And third, these young mothers agreed that sterilized glass containers are cleaner and more sanitary. You can buy an increasing number of the better brands of food packed in glass, and all of the better brands of prepared baby food come to you in anchor glass containers sealed with Tampa-proof anchor vacuum caps. Both products of Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. You didn't kill them two kidnappers when you threw that truck at them, Casey? No, Featherbird, no. The cops pulled them out of the wreckage in fairly good shape, considering. They'll be able to walk to the chair. How about the ransom money? Did the cops find it? Yeah, yeah. Gus, the fat guy, confessed the Walters kidnapping and told where he and Nick had hidden the dough. Gee, and all because you and Miss Williams did some Christmas shopping. <laughs> Say, what happened to the little dip, Fingers Fogarty? Well, in trying to clear himself of the kidnap and murder charge, Ethelbert, Fingers made so many admissions about his own specialty that the cops can keep him in jail until 1999. Gee, 1999, huh? Good heavens, Casey, what's that coming in the door? Hmm? What, what on earth? Hey, hey, what do you say, mister? That's the biggest tree I got on the wagon, okay? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, now that's what I call a real Christmas tree. Ethelbert, what are you going to do with such a big tree? 
Well, you couldn't get a little tree in that big room. Prime Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday at this time by the Anchor Hocking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass. Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures. All products of the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation. A great name in glass. is written by Alonzo Dean Cole and is based on the fictional character of Casey created by George Harmon Cox. The original music is by Archie Blyer and the program features Miss Leslie Woods as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. Herman Chittison is the Blue Note pianist. Thursday night on CBS is the biggest show in town, so stay tuned for exciting dramatizations on Reader's Digest Radio Edition, which follows immediately over most of these stations. Now for our sponsor, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, and all of us on the show, this is Tony Marvin wishing every one of you a joyful and happy holiday at this Christmas time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Trapped in the dark cellar of your home. Beside you is the murdered body of your wife. And above at the front door are your friends looking for you, tracking you down, cutting off your escape. Escape. Produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and carefully contrived to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to a university town in England and a household where hate holds sway as we listen to John Collier's famous story, Back for Christmas. Yes, my dear. What on earth are you doing down here in the cellar? Why, just a little digging. And why, may I ask, have you chosen this day of all days to dig up the cellar floor? Why, I thought as the weather has been so damp, this would be an excellent time to plant my devil's garden. Devil's garden? Whatever nonsense is that? Oh, uh, that's my little joke about it. You see, I've managed to secure some of the spores of several unclassified wild orchids. In their natural state, they bloom under damp masses of leaf mold. The Oracanian Indians call them devil flowers because they appear to bloom under the ground. Well, I'm sure the Oracanian Indians will be very interested if you succeed in growing these ridiculous flowers under the cellar floor. Whom else it'll interest, I can't imagine. What's that terrible smell? Why, that's the leaf mold, my dear. Chemically identical with the earth blanket they grow under in the wild state. I really should line the pit with concrete so as to prevent seepage from this foreign soil. But I don't suppose there'll be time for it now. There certainly will not be time for it. Do you realize that we're sailing for America a week from today and you've made no arrangements whatever? Unless you call digging a hole in the cellar making arrangements. I certainly don't. Devil's garden indeed. Sometimes I think you're going soft in the head, Herbert. Well, I suppose it's inconsiderate of me. But, you see, I've been wanting to try this experiment for a long time. But what with my lectures and seminars at the university, there never seemed to be time. Well, there certainly isn't any time for it now. I suppose you've forgotten I made an appointment for you at the barber's this afternoon. Oh, must I shave off my beard, Hermione? No, we've been all through that. Of course you must. They don't wear beards in America. 
Go and get your jacket on and do as I tell you. Yes, Hermione. And don't forget to take your umbrella. It looks like rain. Yes, Hermione. Oh, don't look so put upon, Herbert. Someone has to plan things in this house, or you'd never even get to the university in time for your lectures, much less make arrangements for a trip to America. I know, but what of my specimens? There'll be plenty of time to plant your precious devil's garden when you get home from America. We're not going to be gone forever, you know. We'll be back here for Christmas. Yes, of course. Back for Christmas. I'd forgotten. Well, try to remember it. And if you can't do that, just do as I tell you. I've been making the plans in this house for 20 years. And if there's any digging to be done, I'll manage that as well. You understand, Herbert? Yes, Hermione. Good. You have just 20 minutes to clean this mess up down here and keep your appointment at the barber's. And when you finish there, I want you to come straight home. Why, I... I wanted to stop at Miss Markham's and pick up some books I ordered. Well, all right. But don't loiter there the whole afternoon, browsing over those old books the way you usually do. Now hurry and clear up this rubbish. Get rid of that smelly stuff. And no more digging, mind you. Yes, Hermione. <laughs> Yes, Hermione. How many years have I been saying that? Ten years? Fifteen? Twenty? Clear up the rubbish. Yes, Hermione. Don't forget your umbrella. Yes, Hermione. Do this, do that. Yes, Hermione. Yes, yes, yes. How much longer can I stand this? Good evening, sir. Good evening, Miss Markham. Why, it's Professor Carpenter, isn't it? You didn't recognize me. Oh, you look ever so much younger without the beard. Twenty years at least. Twenty years. Oh, you'll be glad to know those books you ordered have finally arrived. Hmm? Books? Phytotomy of phalloid gametophytes and coniferous shrubs of North America. Those are the ones you ordered, aren't they? Oh, yes, yes. Thank you. You're very kind, Miss Markham. Why kind, Professor Carpenter? Well, not many young ladies in bookshops would go out of their way to look up rare books for an old professor of botany. Oh, why, you're not old, Professor Carpenter. Really, you look... Oh, and besides, I adore botany. It's my particular hobby. Oh, really? Well, you never told me that before, Miss Markham. Oh, I was afraid to. You were so... Oh, so imposing with a beard and all. Well, I... You might be interested in some specimens of alpine polyanthes that were sent to me by a friend in Switzerland. Switzerland? I used to go there for my holidays before the war. You like Switzerland? Oh, I love every part of it. The lakes, the mountains, the beautiful spring flowers. Oh, especially the flowers. Oh, yes. It seems we have quite a lot in common, Miss Markham. I'm, I'm sorry we haven't talked before. Oh, I am too. <laughs> it is all the fault of the beard, I suppose. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Markham, forgive me if this sounds foolish, but I feel that shaving off my beard is the most important thing I've done for 20 years. Oh, it is. I'm sure it is. I'm ashamed that I've been so distant with you all the time. Oh, there were times when I almost spoke up. Times when you came in here, tired after day with your students at the university. Oh, you seem so alone. The way I'm alone in the world. I'd like to have asked you to stay a while and talk with me. But some way or other, I, I wound up giving you your change and letting you go on your way. You... You say you're all alone in the world? Since my father died. Well, did you never think of marrying? Oh, my father was a very remarkable man. I never found anyone who, who seemed to measure up to what he led me to expect of men. And then the war came Miss and... Markham, oh, I... It, it's been so long since anyone called me by my first name. I'd like you to, if you don't mind. It's Marion. Marion. And yours? Uh, Herbert. How long had you been alone, Herbert? Uh, alone? Oh, I knew you were a widower, of course, the first time I saw you. A widower? Oh, I can always tell. There's a certain sadness in a man's eyes. A sweet sadness, I think. 
when he's been married and then... A widower. I never thought of it in quite that way. Oh, perhaps I shouldn't be talking like this. But I've often wondered what she must have been like. Your wife, I mean. Hermione? Hmm. Not an easy woman to forget. Very strong. Always managing things. The house, my wardrobe, my friends. When we dined at a restaurant, she even ordered my food. She was always managing things. You might say she managed herself to death. Oh, poor woman. She must have loved you very much. But she needn't have put herself out so. It's plain to see you don't need things managed for you. You need companionship, I think. Someone sympathetic with your work. <laughs> but the last thing on earth you need is a manager. How well you put it. The last thing on earth. <laughs> That's the first time I thought of it, of course. But suddenly a whole new world opened up before my eyes. Marion and America and no more of Hermione's planning my life for me. By the time I got home, my mind was working overtime. Well, at last, you certainly took long enough about it. What are you looking so pleased about? I don't really know. Getting rid of the beard, perhaps. I feel 20 years younger. You look even smaller. Your face looks triangular or something. I'd forgotten your chin was so weak. Oh, but never mind that. You can grow it back soon enough, after Christmas. Where are you going? Down to the cellar. I just bought this electric lantern, and I thought I'd put it away down there. Now, whatever possessed you to buy a thing like that? I don't know. I'd rather like this lantern. Might come in handy. Who knows? Now, Herbert, don't start digging down there again. I have a hundred things to do putting the house in order before we leave. I want you to carry these boxes upstairs for me. Yes, Hermione. And if you're going down to the cellar, take this along and stuff it into the furnace. But this is my old bathrobe. I may need it. Oh, nonsense. I bought you a new one. Get rid of it. And don't start puttering down there with that devil's garden or whatever you call it. I'm through digging, my dear. I think the pit is quite deep enough now uh, for my devil's garden. <laughs> It would all have to be carefully planned, of course. Just as carefully planned as Hermione was planning the trip to America. We both went about our respective engagements as the days passed. I spent all the time I could with Marion, and finally she consented. And then it was the last day, the big day. The day we were to sail for America. Operator! Operator, are you there? I'm still waiting on that call to Salisbury. Oh, well, put them on quickly. Hello? Is this Paul Holt and Sons? Mrs. Herbert Carpenter here. Did you receive my letter? Oh, good. Now, remember, we'll be back for Christmas, and I want the job done without fail. What's that? Oh, no, I'm sure he doesn't suspect anything. Send the bill to me in New York as I instructed you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, there you are, Herbert. Where have you been? Back still. I dismissed the servants. Dismissed the servants? But I've asked some friends in to a farewell tea. Go and tell them it's a mistake. I'm afraid it's too late now. They've packed and gone. Oh, you have messed up things properly. How many times have I told you to leave things to me? I make the plans around here. Yes, Hermione. You'll have to do better than this when I plan the trip home. Or we'll never in the world be back for Christmas. Back for Christmas, back for Christmas. Must you keep saying that? Well, why not? We are coming back for Christmas, aren't we? Supposing I were offered a professorship in one of those wealthy American universities. <laughs> Nonsense. Americans care nothing for botany. Luther Burbank was an American. Well, that's different. What have you ever done except muck around in the dirt with a lot of roots and tubers? They've asked me to lecture. That means something. Of course they asked you to lecture. Americans are paid to hear any foreigner deliver a lecture once. Now, there's no use getting yourself in a state about this, Herbert. No doubt this extra money will come in very handy when we arrive back, back for, for Christmas. Christmas. Precisely. And it's no good you're making a joke of it. Heaven knows where you'd be today if I hadn't got a sense of time. Yes, my dear Hermione. And since you've been so foolish as to dismiss the servants, you may empty the ashtrays and straighten up this room while we're waiting for the guests to arrive. I'm going upstairs to change. Call me when they get here. Yes, Hermione. 
Yes, Hermione, yes, Hermione. For 20 years, Hermione, always so light, thought of everything. Well, not quite everything. She's dressing now. Safe to call Marion. Oh, if Marion were to change her mind now, if she had any idea, I was not a widower. Hello. Hello, Marion. Herbert. No. No, my darling. Nothing's wrong. My plans are the same. Unless you've changed. Good. We'll meet in New York as we planned. Yes, yes, I do love you, my darling. Herbert! I'm sorry, I can't talk any longer. Yes, I, I'll i meet you in New York a week from tomorrow without fail. It, goodbye till then. Herbert, were you talking on the phone just now? Yes, Hermione. Whoever was it? Uh, Freddy. Freddy Sinclair, of course. Oh, didn't I hear you say something about meeting somebody in New York? Why, yes. Old Freddy said he might possibly get out to America before we leave, and I said, of course, we'd meet him there if he decides to go. That seems very peculiar. But then all of your friends are peculiar. Yes, Hermione. And just look at your jacket. Have you been digging in that cellar again? Yes, Hermione. Well, there's no need for it. You can't possibly get that devil's garden thing finished. Go and change your clothes before the guests arrive. Yes, Hermione. Oh, never mind. I see somebody coming up the walk now. Go and let them in. Yes, Hermione. Herbert. Hmm? Yes, my dear. Look out the window. There's Professor and Mrs. Hewitt. But who's that with them? Why, I... Why... Precisely. Freddie Sinclair. Peculiar. You should have been talking to him on the phone not three minutes ago. And now here he is. Yes. Yes, isn't it? Uh, but then, as you say, Hermione, all of my friends are peculiar. <laughs> not half so peculiar as you. Digging in the cellar an hour before we leave for America. Just look at yourself. And now that I think of it... Yes, Hermione? Oh, never mind. Go and let them in. You were going to ask me something, Hermione. But the hole I'm digging in the cellar. Oh, good heavens. Stop rolling your eyes about that way. One would think you were digging a grave down there instead of a storage bin. Yes, Hermione. What's that? I said yes, Hermione. Oh, bother. Open the door and stop saying yes, Hermione. I think, my dear, I've said it for the last time. Back for Christmas. Hermione was so positive we would be back for Christmas. That last afternoon, pouring tea for a few friends who had come in to say last-minute farewells, she kept reiterating... Oh, I promise you, Mrs. Hewitt. Remember, we absolutely must have you with us for Christmas. Oh, we'll be back. It's not absolutely certain, of course. Oh, but what do you mean, it's not certain? Of course it's certain. <laughs> After all, Herbert, old boy, you've contracted to lecture for only three months. Quite right, but then, of course, anything may happen. Oh. Herbert adores being unpredictable. Now, what other man would dig a great hole in the cellar on the very day he was leaving for America? A hole in the cellar? <laughs> yes. He's going to put some unclassified wild orchids down there. A devil's garden, if you please. <laughs> Sounds mysterious. That's Herbert. Though he's really quite simple once you find out what he's up to. Now, take that telephone call he put through to you a few moments before you arrived, Freddy. Uh, to, to me? Yes. Herbert wanted to surprise me about your plan to meet us in New York next month. <laughs> That's why he called, of course, to ask you not to mention it. But, my dear Hermione, Herbert couldn't possibly have telephoned me within the past hour. I've been walking in the park since three. He didn't telephone you? Well, how could he? And as for my going to America... Oh, no, that... Come, come, Freddy. You may as well own up. Hermione has found me out again. But Herbert, old chap, I, I really don't there, understand. There. You see what a poor liar Herbert makes. He's red as a beetroot. <laughs> Aren't you ashamed of yourself, Professor? Stringing poor Hermione along like that. And as for you, Freddy, I'm furious you said nothing to us about going to America. But look here, old girl. I've been trying to tell everyone that I have oh, no... Oh, stuff and nonsense. The game's gone on long enough. Perhaps Herbert's merely planning a surprise for me. Yes, let's leave it at that, my dear. Well, we must start getting ready. It was marvellous of you to come in to say goodbye. And don't worry about Herbert's little jokes. Oh, I will bring him back for Christmas. You may rely on it. They all believed her. For years, she'd been promising me for dinner parties, garden parties, committees. And the promises had always been kept. This time, they wouldn't be. I'd seen to that. The servants were gone for good. The farewells all said... I had time to the minute how long it would take to fill in the hole in the cellar, in my devil's garden. 
Upstairs in the bedroom, I undressed, folded my clothes over a chair, and put on my old bathrobe. Then I opened the door into Hermione's room. Are you ready, Herbert? Hmm. Hermione, have you a moment to spare? Of course, my dear. I've just finished. Then do come in here for a moment. Uh, there's something rather extraordinary here. Good heavens, Herbert. What are you lounging about in that filthy old bathrobe for? I told you to put it into the furnace. I shall do it today, yes. I really will. I, I promise. Well, high time. Now, what is it you want to show me? In the bathroom here. Just look. Who in the world do you suppose dropped a gold chain down the bathtub drain? Nobody has, of course. Nobody wears such a thing in this house. Then what's it doing there? I don't see anything. Well, here. I'll hold this flashlight for you. If you lean right over, you can see it shining deep down. Oh, such a lot of nonsense. Just with it. I don't see it, Herbert. Go on looking, Hermione. In just a moment. Herbert, I absolutely refuse <clears throat> to wait. Herbert, what are you doing? Take your hands off my neck. I will, Hermione, just as soon as I've finished the arrangements for my trip to America. What are you talking about? You thought you were the only one who could plan things, didn't you, Hermione? Well, I've been making some plans of my own this past week. In exactly two minutes, you'll be dead, Hermione. Oh. You see, two minutes. I've planned it very accurately. You'll never get away with it. Let me go. Well, I thought you'd say that, but I will get away with it. You won't mind the smell of the leaf mold down in the cellar when I take you there today. Yes. That's where you're going, Hermione. Into my devil's garden that annoyed you so much. Oh. The soil is full of clay. It won't settle too much. In a month or so, it won't even look as if it had been dug up. Uh, my friends, they all expect me back for Christmas. <laughs> they don't hear from me, they'll wonder. And if I don't come back, they'll start asking questions. Oh, no, they won't. Because you'll write them letters, Hermione. On the typewriter, as you always do. They'll be signed H in that neat, cryptic way you always sign your notes to your friends. Oh, no. It won't work, sir, but you never were any good at planning things. Oh, but I've changed, my dear. I've learned from watching you all these years. The, the lecture people in America, they'll expect you to be traveling with your wife. I will be traveling with my wife. But her name will not be Hermione. Oh. Fortunately, they've never met you. I'll write a few letters home for you. Then fewer and fewer. Write letters signed with my own name. Always expecting to get back, but never quite able to. I'll keep the house one year and then another and another. They'll get used to it. I might even come back alone in a year or two and clear it up properly. Say you died in America. <laughs> Nobody will ever suspect you're lying under the floor of the cellar in this very house. Oh, but it won't work, I tell you. That pit you dug in the cellar, I'm sorry. I can assure you, my dear Hermione, it'll serve its purpose well. <laughs> sorry, my dear. I've got to get this done on schedule. You have just five seconds to say your prayers. Oh, but you must... The cellar! Yeah. Don't do it, Herbert! Herbert! Yeah. Oh. <coughs> hey. The water cut off at the main as I knew she would order it. She was so thorough, but so was I. Strangulation. Nothing to wash up. The electric current shut off exactly at one o'clock, just as she ordered it. She thought of everything. So did I. My nice new electric lantern. Plenty of light to work by in the cellar. The old bathrobe she wanted me to throw away came in handy now if there should be any chance blood stain. Then into the fire with it afterwards. The last evidence of my devil's garden. It was going well. Still an hour till I had to leave for the boat. The hole was almost filled. No. Oh, no, not now. Go away, please, whoever you are, go away. Did I lock the front door? If it's the Wallingfords... Oh, no, no. Go away. Go away. I say, Herbert, old thing. Hello, Hermione. Just keep calm, quiet. They won't look down in the cellar. Keep calm. They'll go away. Where the dickens can they be? Oh, the car's there. Maybe they popped round to Liddell. Oh, we must. Oh, the shops, maybe. Something the last minute. Oh, I'm not her baronet. Uh, shall I shout? Oh, don't. Not hot me chest. No harm in a shout, my love. Uh, no, let's come in our way back. The baronet said they would leave those chests. Oh, all right. Only I want a last drink with old Herbert. He'd be hurt, you know. All right, let's hurry. We can be back by half past six. Half past six. <sighs> There's still time. <laughs> After that, it was easy. Put the finishing touches on the devil's garden, dress fast, get out of the house before 6.30, take the boat trade to Southampton and board the ship for America. All according to plan. 
Hermione's plan. Oh, uh, I say, Stuart. Uh, Mark, sir? Uh, my wife is indisposed. She'll be taking her meals in our stateroom. Oh, for, for, for the old voyage? Yes, for the whole voyage. Well, I trust your wife is feeling better this morning, Professor Carpenter. Uh, yes, a little. Not yet well enough to leave her cabin. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, by the way, uh, here's a copy of the radiogram you sent for your wife last evening. Oh? Oh, thank you. I'll just check it over. Hmm. I say, look here. What is it? Did the typist make a mistake? Uh, no. No, nothing important. She can correct it later. For a moment, I had the feeling that Hermione had been leaning over my shoulder again, correcting what I had written, as she always did. I had written a radiogram to Professor Hewitt and his wife. Haven't been out of my cabin the whole beastly trip. Herbert, well. We now doubt we will be back for Christmas. The copy read, We no doubt we'll be back for Christmas. Exactly what Hermione would have written. The rest of the voyage was uneventful. And Marion and I met in New York and were married just as we'd planned. Just as we'd planned. <laughs> Professor and Mrs. Carpenter, we, we have reservations, I believe. Oh, yes, we've been expecting you, sir. Boy, take Professor and Mrs. Carpenter's luggage up to their suite. You know, Mrs. Carpenter, you're quite a surprise. Your letter reserving the rooms was so uh, thorough. I was expecting an older, more forbidding sort of person, frankly, ma'am. Oh, no. As a matter of fact, we're just married. But my letter reserving the room. Uh, I wrote the letter, my dear, and signed it Mrs. Herbert Carpenter. Purely a joke. Oh, what a cunning old fox you are, Herbert. Now that I think of it, I am, rather. Oh, I almost forgot. Uh, there's a letter for you, Mrs. Carpenter. A letter for me? I wonder who knows. Well, we shall find out in good time. Come along, my dear. We're keeping the boy waiting. <laughs> Nothing like a cold, brisk shower to put a man to rights. Herbert, this letter. Uh, oh, yes, the letter. Uh, dry my hair, will you, dear? It seems to be a bill of some sort. From a building contract in Salisbury. Mm. <laughs> oh, bother. Dry your own hair. Oh, thank you, my sweet. Uh, let's see this bill or whatever it is. It's very puzzling. Herbert. Hmm? You were a widower, weren't you? I mean, Hermione isn't still alive. I can assure you she is not. Uh, let's have that letter. Hmm. Dear madam, this is to acknowledge your order together with the key... Together with the keys to your house in Launston Place. Our men had no difficulty in finding the place where your husband had begun the excavation in the cellar, but apparently changed his mind at the last moment and filled it in again. Oh, no. What is it, Herbert? Our men will begin digging tomorrow. And you may rest assured that it will be a professional job and will be completed in ample time for your surprise Christmas present to your husband. We are happy to be conspirators with you in this thoughtful gesture and hope that Professor Carpenter will be pleased at the results of our work on what he so quaintly calls his devil's garden. Very truly yours, Paul Holton's son's contractors. What does it mean, Herbert? It means that Hermione was right. I will be back for Christmas. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and tonight brought you Back for Christmas by John Collier. 
Adapted for radio by Robert Tallman, with Paul Fries as Herbert, Eleanor Audley as Hermione, and Marta Mitrovich as Marion. Music is conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhrer. Next week... You are lost in a London fog, exhausted and frantic, unsure if the figures looming around you are real or creatures of your fear, and behind you, pursuing you, intent on killing you, lurks a murderer from whom you must escape. Next week, we escape with Elgin and Blackwood's ghostly story, Confession. Good night, then, until this same time next week, when again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Here's your pass to the Globe Theater. Welcome to the Globe Theater, the radio theater playing exclusively to the men and women of the armed forces of the United Nations. Here for your entertainment are presented the finest plays selected from outstanding radio dramas. Now, to tell you about tonight's play, here is your host and master of ceremonies at the Globe Theater, Herbert Marshall. Hello, everybody. In looking around for an appropriate play for this evening, we remember that each year at Christmas time, Lionel Barrymore brings joy to millions with his memorable portrayal of Scrooge in Dickens' immortal A Christmas Carol. And so it's with the greatest of pleasure that we welcome Mr. Barrymore to our Globe Theatre stage for another performance of this traditional and beloved story, A Christmas Carol, with Lionel Barrymore. <laughs> Once upon a Christmas Eve, on a mean and shabby street in London, stood the warehouse of Scrooge and Marley. Of course, Marley was dead, but Scrooge never bothered to paint out his name over the door. It was a waste of time, paint, and money. Oh, he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, was Ebenezer Scrooge. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. You hear me? Stop that infernal chatter, Walden, or they stick to your backs. <laughs> Blast you little sweeps. A frosty rhyme was on Scrooge's head and on his eyebrows and on his wiry chin. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thought one degree at Christmas. A fact that could be attested by Bob Cratchit, his overworked and shivering clock. And, and what do you think you're about to do with that coal scuttle, Mr. Cratchit? I, well, you see, my stove's gone out, Mr. Scrooge. Uh, uh, tell me, Mr. Cratchit, you like working here? Like it? Oh, oh yes, sir. Now, nah, you have need of the 15 bob I pay every week. Need? Oh, yes, indeed, sir. <laughs> Uh-huh. You see, there's my wife and Tiny Tim and Belinda and uh, Martha. I, I see, I see. Then may I suggest that you forget about the fire and get back to your work? Uh, unless, of course, you prefer to keep Christmas by losing your situation. Oh, no, sir. I'll get on with copying those letters at once. Uh-huh. I'm very sorry, Mr. Scrooge. It won't happen again, I promise. Uh, pampering yourself at my expense. I won't have it, you understand? I won't have it. <laughs> Yes, and what did Scrooge think of Christmas? Well, on this particular Christmas Eve, his only nephew, Fred, stopped by the warehouse. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Uh, 
Humbug. Christmas, a humbug? Oh, come now, you don't mean that. I do. Merry Christmas. What right of you to be merry? You're poor enough. Very well, then. What right of you to be dismal? You're rich enough. No, humbug. Oh, don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. <laughs> Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a brown dozen a month presented dead against you. Uncle. Yeah, yeah. If I had my way, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake for holly through his heart. Uncle. Never you. You keep Christmas in your own way, let me keep it mine. But you don't keep it. Well, let me leave it alone, then. Much good may it do you. <laughs> Much good it ever has, don't you? I've always thought of Christmas time as, as the only time in the long calendar of the year when people open their shut-up hearts and think of their fellow men. Yeah, humbug. And therefore, although it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, hmm. I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. And I say God bless it. <laughs> You're a very powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. Come and dine with us tomorrow. Good afternoon, nephew. But why won't you? Good afternoon. Well, I'm sorry to find you so resolute. But a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon! No, Scrooge didn't believe for a moment that Christmas was a kind and charitable time. He proved it when two gentlemen stopped at his warehouse to collect his Christmas donation to the poor. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and the destitute. Uh, indeed. Tell me, are there no prisons? Oh, plenty of prisons. And the workhouses, are they still in operation? They are. Oh, very well. What do you want to meet? Well, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. No. Now, uh, what shall we put you down for? Nothing. Oh, uh, you wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone. Mr. Scrooge. I don't make myself merry at Christmas time. I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help support the prisons and the workhouses. <laughs> they cost enough, heaven knows. And those who are badly off can go there. But many can't go there. And many would rather die than huh? go there. They'd rather die than better go and do it. <laughs> Decrease the, per the surplus population. Besides, I find it quite enough for a man to mind his own business and not interfere with other people. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. It was much colder when Scrooge started for home. And the fog was so thick that he had some difficulty in locating the lowering pile of buildings where he had a gloomy suite of rooms. Nobody lived in it but Scrooge. He put his key in the lock of the ancient door, and then a strange thing happened. A door knocker. I could swear it was Marley's face. Ah, I'm bug. <laughs> ah. Scrooge entered, and then locked and double locked the door behind him. He wasn't a man to be frightened by a door knock. He lit his candle and started up the stairs, his footsteps echoing through the quiet house. Ebenezer Scrooge. What's that? Who's there? What was that noise deep down below in the cellar as if someone were dragging a heavy chain? Ebenezer. What's that? The sound grew louder on the cellar stairs rose higher in the empty halls below and then clanged and clattered on the stairs behind Scrooge as he fled. Uh, Scrooge closed the door of his room and locked it. Uh, Somebody still. I won't believe it. And then... As though a part of the fog outside, the ghost of Jacob Marley passed through the closed and locked door. 
take a body. Around his waist was the chain Scrooge had heard on the stairs. Cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses. But still Ebenezer Scrooge did not believe. No, no. What do you want? Much, oh much, Ebenezer. Who are you? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. <laughs> you don't believe in me. I do not. Why do you doubt your senses? Oh, because the little thing affects you. <laughs> a very slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. <laughs> uh, you may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, <laughs> a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> <laughs> There's more gravy than grave about you. Oh, please don't do that, I beg of you. Oh, man of worldly mind, do you believe or not? I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. It will make you any happier. But why do spirits walk the earth? And why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. Yeah. Why do you wear that chain? It is the one I forged in life. Mm. I made it link by link and yard by yard. The one you have made was full as heavy and as long as this, seven Christmas Eves ago, <laughs> yours is a ponderous chain, Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, don't say that, Jacob. Don't say that. You, you, you were always my friend. Speak comfort to me. I have none to give. But why should you be so accursed? You were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business. Mankind was my business. Huh? The common welfare was my business. Mm. Charity... Mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. Yes, but Jacob... Hear me, my time is nearly gone. I will, I will, I will, but don't be hard on me. And don't be flowery, Jacob, please. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. Well, you were always a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you will be haunted by three spirits. Three, Jacob? Expect the first tonight... When the bell tolls one. But, Jacob... Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. If it's all the same to you, Jacob... And the third will appear on the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Jacob... Look to see me no more, Ebenezer. Jacob, wait. No. For your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. Jacob, Jacob, wait now. Jacob! <laughs> Quarter past. Half past. A quarter to one. Yeah, the hour itself. Ebenezer Screw. <laughs> uh, who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Rise and walk with me. Oh, walk? In slippers? My dressing gown and my nightcap? <laughs> well, what a spectacle I'd make. However, if you'll give me time to dress... Come, there is no time to lose. Very well. But I warn you, I'll catch my death. Wait, not that way. We will leave by the window. The window? Are you mad? I'm a mortal and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand thus on your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Come, Ebenezer Scrooge, come. Look below us, Ebenezer Scrooge. Do you know this place? Know it? <laughs> Of course I know it. Why, I was a boy here. I could walk it blindfold. I know every gate and post and tree. 
There's my old school with the cupola and the bell hanging in it. An ugly, lifeless place. Yeah. Hey, it was Christmas Day. All the boys had gone home for the holiday. Oh? Who is that lonely child left behind and chided for his tears by the schoolmaster? <laughs> I was that child, Spirit. Now, Master Ebenezer, no tears, if you please. There is nothing more degrading than self-pity. Besides, Christmas isn't at all important. A very wise man, the schoolmaster. Do you agree with him, Ebenezer Scrooge? Agree with him? Of course not. Christmas is very important to a child of that age. To a child of any age. Poor boy. I wish... Oh, well, it's too late now. Yes, what is it? Nothing, nothing much. There were some boys singing Christmas carols outside my warehouse. Wish I'd given them something, that's all. I see. Well, let us see another Christmas. You know this warehouse, Ebenezer Scrooge? Know it? Uh, of course I know it. I was the princess here. Tell me, were you happy here? Oh, yes, yes. I was very happy, Spirit. My master was a kind man and... Oh, I bless his heart. There he is. It's old Fezziwig. Fezziwig, alive again. <laughs> Tonight, no more work. Christmas Eve day. Yeah, Christmas, Christmas Ebenezer. Eve. We're having a party tonight. A party, sir? Yeah. Who invited Mr. Fezziwig? The butcher, the baker, the milkman, and the cook. <laughs> yeah. Here now, here, here's the fiddler already. Yeah. Ho, ho, ho. Clear away, lads. Clear away. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Fezziwig. Come, come, Master Fiddler. Unlimber your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Give us something for dancing with plenty of life in it. Christmas Eve, you know. Christmas Eve. The best time of the year. God bless it. A very simple and sentimental man, old Fezziwig, with no head at all for business, Ebenezer Scrooge. Ah, uh, nonsense. Why, he was one of the greatest men alive. Yes, I, I wish... Yes? What is it you wish? Nothing. Uh, I was just thinking of my cloth. Bob Cratchit, that's all. Strange. But my time grows short. Now prepare yourself to meet the spirit of Christmas present. Ebenezer Scrooge, behold in me the ghost of Christmas present. We'll come. Where, where are we going? To Camden Town. Hold fast to my robe. My time is short, and we must travel swiftly. <laughs> Camden Town? Why, that's where my clerk, Bob Cratchit, lives. Yes, it is he we visit. See, there below is the street and house we seek. Not a pretty setting, is it? Well, no. No, no, it isn't exactly palatial, but it, it probably serves its purpose. After all, he's only a clerk, you know. Ah, yes. And with so many mouths to feed, it doubtless is the best he can afford. Huh? Come, we will go in. the gravy. Here, here, Belinda, you watch the applesauce. Yes, Mother. Martha, you got us a hot plate. And Joseph and Thomas can start setting the chairs at the table. Oh, yes, yes Mother. I do see what's keeping your father and tiny Tim. Well, perhaps the church service is extra long. Ten minutes more and the goose will fall apart and the pudding will be overdone. Oh, oh Mother, no. no. Oh, here they come now. Oh, they're oh, turning the corner. Tiny yes. Tim's riding on Father's shoulder. Thank heavens. Open the door for them, Belinda. Yes, oh, Mother. yes, 
Be careful. Be careful, oh, Bob. What's the slippery spot? Get up. Get up, Dobbin. There we are. Hold fast. Oh, this is a wild horse oh, with a black mane. He gallops and prances and runs like the wind. Hi, ho. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry, Merry Christmas, Father. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas everybody. Uh, uh, down you come. Oh, uh, Joseph, Thomas. Take them off to the wash house and get those hands clean for dinner. <laughs> Come on, Tiny Tim. Just wait till you see what's in the oven. There never was such a burn. Now, don't waste any time. Everything's ready. Well, how did he behave in church, Bob? Oh, as good as gold and better. Well, that's good. You know, somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. Yes, I know. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple. Oh. And it might be pleasant for them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Poor boy. Poor boy. Why are there tears in your eyes? Ebenezer Scrooge. Well, Cratchit never told me the boy was lame. He has worn that iron brace and carried that little crutch ever since he can remember. Quiet. They gather at the table. A toast. A toast to the founder of the feast. I give you Mr. Scrooge. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. My dear, Christmas Day. Well, I'll drink his health for your sake and the day. Not for him. And a Merry Christmas to us all, my dear. <laughs> God bless us. God, God bless us. And what do you say, Tiny Tim? God bless us, everyone. <laughs> Come, Ebenezer Scrooge. My time is up. You must go to meet the third and last spirit. Wait, 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 wait. Tell me this before you leave me. Yes? Tell me. Will Tiny Tim live? I see a vacant seat and a crutch without the owner. Ah, oh, no, 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 no. Don't say that. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child must die. Ah, oh, no, no. No. Will it not be better if he does? As you once said, it will decrease the surplus population. Ah, uh, spirit. Farewell, Ebenezer Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas yet to come awaits you. Where am I? What place is this? So dark and cold and thick with fog? <laughs> and who are you? Dark phantom with the hidden face. Ah, I fear you more than any of the others. Are you the ghost of Christmas yet to come? Oh, but, but this is a burial ground. Neglected and overgrown with grass and weeds. The resting place of those forgotten and unloved. Oh, why do you point to that stone? What name's written there that I must read? Well, the letters are too dim and the fog's too heavy. Tell me, spirit, who rests in this lonely, untended earth? You are that man, Ebenezer Scrooge. Ah, no, spirit. No, no, no. You are that man. Spirit, hear me. I'm not the man I was. I, I will not be the man I must have been but for this night. I'll honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. Hear me, spirit, and, and, and tell me I may sponge away the writing on that terrible stone. Spirit! Spirit! Do you hear me? Spirit! Well, well you're not a spirit at all. You're my own bedpost. This isn't a graveyard. It's my own room. Yes, sir. There's the door that old Jacob Marley entered. And there's the window where the first spit... Well, it's broad daylight. No fog or mist. Here's a beautiful, glorious day. 
And church bells must be Sunday. Hey, boy! Oh, boy, are you down there? Yes, sir. What's the day, my fine fellow? What day? Why, it's Christmas Day, of course. Christmas Day! Ha <laughs> ha! Then I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. Hello down there. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, do you know the poultry shop at the corner of my butt? I should hope so, sir. <laughs> An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Y- uh, tell me, do you know if they've sold the prize turkey? The little one? No, 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 no. Not the big prize turkey. It's hanging there now. Thank you. Go and tell him to bring it here. Yes, sir. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Yes, sir. Come back in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. Yes, sir. <laughs> Look at him go. <laughs> yeah, I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. He shan't know who sent it. Oh, what a joke that'll be. It is twice the size of Tiny Tim. Oh, uh, let's see. I better get dressed. I've got a lot to do. It's going to be a busy day. Yes, sir. A very busy day. <laughs> Yes, and it was a very busy day. Scrooge dressed himself all in his best, and when he got out on the streets, people were pouring out of the churches. He regarded them with such a delighted smile that some of them said, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <coughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. He patted children on the head. Hello, sir. Uh, Merry Christmas, my dear. He gave to beggars. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, God bless you, sir. And late in the afternoon, he went calling on his nephew. He had a wonderful time and a wonderful Christmas. The morning after Christmas, he was early at the office. Scrooge wanted to be there first. And he wanted to catch Bob Cratchit coming in late. Well, Mr. Cratchit, so you finally got here, did you? Look at that clock. What do you mean by coming here this time of day? I, I'm very sorry, Mr. Scrooge. It, it won't happen again. <laughs> Indeed it won't. Uh, step over here to my desk, if you please. It, it's only once a year, sir. <laughs> Poor sort of excuse, Mr. Cratchit. I'm not going to stand for this kind of thing any longer. And therefore, therefore, my friend, I'm about to raise your salary. What? What was that, sir? A Merry Christmas, Bob. <laughs> a Merry Christmas than I've given you for many a year. I raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family. Now make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. <laughs> Scrooge was even better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was his second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, as good a man as a good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Yes, and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Thanks to you, Lionel Barrymore, and to all the members of the cast for another splendid performance. Tonight's production of A Christmas Carol was selected from the radio series Mayor of the Town. The musical score was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. 
The Christmas carols were sung by the Paul Taylor Chorus, and the narration was by Frank Martin. Now, this is your host of the Globe, Herbert Marshall, wishing each and every one of you a very Merry Christmas. You have been attending the Globe Theater with Herbert Marshall as host and master of ceremonies. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring James Stewart, Donna Reed, and Victor Moore in It's a Wonderful Life. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we bring you one of the season's most inspiring hits, a Liberty Films production that's been nominated for the highest screen award. Yes, it's a wonderful life. And we present it now with its original fine stars, Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed. Jimmy in the role which won him a nomination for the best performance of the year. Also in our cast is starred that fine comedian, Victor Moore. It's a Wonderful Life is the drama of a typical American. Might be you, it might be me. He dreams of glory, he lives in hope, he loves and doubts, uh, and only Providence puts a final value on his service to humanity. Our story starts before the war, when life was normal. Shortages were generally unknown, and simple luxuries like Lux Soap were abundant. I won't say that's the only reason people said it's a wonderful life. But I do know from the thousands of letters in our files that most of them said it's a wonderful soap. And they keep right on saying it day after day. In fact, the popularity of Lux Soap is what makes it possible to present such entertainment as Frank Capra's great production, It's a Wonderful Life. Starring Jimmy Stewart as George, Donna Reed as Mary Hatch, and Victor Moore as Clarence. This is the story of George Bailey, citizen of Bedford Falls, New York. George Bailey, who more than anything under the sun, wanted to see the world. The wonderful, exciting world that lay somewhere beyond the limits of his hometown. Oddly enough, this story does not begin in Bedford Falls. In fact, it doesn't begin anywhere in the world. It begins in heaven where the superintendent of angels has just summoned an apprentice angel named Clarence. Oh, uh, I'm really going down to earth, sir? Oh, how splendid. Yes. There's a very discouraged man down there, Clarence. George Bailey. At exactly 10.45 p.m., earth time, he'll be thinking seriously of ending his life. Oh, dear, dear, his life. Now, I want you to stop him if you can. Now, sit down, sit down. I'll give you Bailey's case history. Uh, sir, if, uh, if I should accomplish my mission, may I perhaps get my wings? I've been waiting over 200 years now, and, well, people are beginning to talk. Clarence, what's that book? The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, sir. I was reading it when you sent for me. Oh, fine book, excellent. Well, you do a good job on George Bailey, and we'll see about your wing. Oh, thank you, sir. Now, listen. When George Bailey was a boy, two events occurred that you should keep in mind. One was when his young brother, Harry, fell through the ice and almost drowned. George saved him. Brother fell through the ice? 
George saved him. Ever since, George's had a bad ear. All that icy water, uh, you understand. Yeah, bad ear, yes, sir. The other event came a few months later. George used to work after school in Mr. Gower's drugstore. One day, Mr. Gower's only son died of influenza. It was a terrible blow, and poor Mr. Gower tried to lose his grief in whiskey. Where you been, George? Mrs. Blaine's called twice. What happened to her prescription? You lost it, didn't you? No, Mr. Gower. Here it is. Are you good for nothing? Don't you know that Blaine girl's very sick? Mr. Gower, my ear. You're hurting my sore I'll ear. Teach you to loaf, you lazy brat. Mr. Gower, you don't know what you're doing. You put something wrong in those gaps. Shut up. Oh, I know you feel bad, but look, Mr. Gower, look. This bottle, you use this bottle to make up the capsules. It's poison. Poison? Don't hurt my sore ear again, Mr. Poison. Gower. Oh, George. That's what you deliver, Mr. Gower. All I wanted was to make sure. George, George. Well, Clarence, that was George Bailey as a boy. When he grew up, he wanted to go to college, but there just wasn't the money. So he worked four years in the Building and Loan Association. Building and Loan Association? Oh, I forgot to tell you. George's father was in the building and loan business. He and George's uncle, Billy. High ideals and low bank account. Anyway, George worked for his father and saved enough to see him through the university. That summer, though, he was going to Europe. Got a job on a cattle boat. Do a little traveling before cut. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, it's hard to realize that my last night in the Bailey boarding house. We're sure going to miss you, George. Oh, I'm going to miss you, too, Pop. Hey, what's the matter? You look tired. Oh, I had another tussle with old Henry Potter today. Well, I thought when you put him on the board of directors, he'd ease up. Oh, so did I. I just can't understand a man like Mr. Potter. He can't begin to spend all the money I he has. I guess Potter owns about everything he wants in Bedford Falls except our building and loan. That's why he hates us. Hey, George, can I borrow your tuxedo studs? Yeah, help yourself, Harry. Well, where are they? In your suitcase? No, I'm not taking a tuxedo on a cattle boat, you know. Say, where'd you get that suitcase anyway? Oh, Mr. Gower, going away present. And one of these days, you're going to see that bag all covered with travel labels. Italy, Baghdad, Samarkand. Going to have a pretty full summer, eh? I'm going to have a pretty full life. Hey, why don't you come to the dance tonight? Why, I'd be bored to death. Well, you couldn't want a better death. Lots of pretty girls. Hey, I got to hurry. I wish we could send Harry to college with you, George. Oh, we've got that all figured out now, Pop. He'll take over my job at the building and loan and work four years like I did, and then he'll go. Well, he's pretty young for that job. Well, no younger than I was. <laughs> Maybe you were born older, George. Huh? George, when you get out of college, I don't suppose you'd come back to the building and loan. Oh, oh now, Pop, I, 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 I just couldn't. I, I couldn't face being cooped up the rest of my life in a shabby little office. I, I, oh, I I'm sorry, Pop. Now, I... I didn't mean that, but it's just this business of nickels and dimes. I'd go crazy. I, I want to do something big, something important. Well, in a small way, we are doing something important, George. In that shabby little office, we help people figure out how they can own their own homes. I know, I know, Pop. I, I just wish I felt that I... I but I, I just feel like if I didn't get away, I'd bust. I... <laughs> You're right, boy. You get yourself an education, then get out of here. Oh, Pop, you... Pop, you want a shock? I think you're a pretty great guy. Well, thanks, George. I'm glad to hear it. Look, um, why don't you go on over to Harry's dance? You'd have a good time. Well, I don't know. Maybe it will drop in. Yeah, maybe it will at that. So, George Bailey went to a dance. Is that important, Joseph? Why, it was at the dance he met Mary Hatch. Oh. And three hours later, he was walking her home. George and Mary were feeling pretty good, Clarence. As a matter of fact, wonderful. Buffalo girls, can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Buffalo girls, can't you come out tonight? And dance by the light of the moon. Oh, a hot dog, oh boy, just like an organ. <laughs> At Gee, least. <laughs> hey, you know, you know something? If it wasn't me talking, I'd say you were the prettiest girl in town. Well, why don't you say it? I don't know. Maybe I will. Hey, how old are you anyway? Eighteen. Eighteen? Too young or too old? No, no, no. It's just right. It sort of fits you. Hey, hey, look where we are. Hmm? Oh, the old Granville house. Yeah, I've got to throw a rock. Oh, no, don't. I, I love that old house. Well, no, don't you know about deserted houses? You, you make a wish and then throw a rock. George, but it, it was such a lovely old place. 
I wish I lived there. In there? I wouldn't live in it as a ghost. Now, watch. Watch this. Here we go. How about it, huh? Pretty good shot, huh? Broke a window, huh? <laughs> What'd you wish, George? Oh, I don't know. Not just one wish, a whole hat full. Mary, I'm shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet, and I'm going to see the world. Italy, Greece, the Parthenon, the Colosseum. And then I'm coming back here and go to college and see what they know. And then I'm going to build things. I'm going to build airfields and skyscrapers a hundred stories high and bridges a mile long. And then I'm going to... Hey. Hey, Mary. What is it you want? What do you want, huh? You want the moon? All you got to do is just say the word now. Okay. The moon, I'll take it. Then what? Then what? Well, well, then you could swallow it. And... And it'd dissolve like an aspirin, you know. And the moonbeams would shoot out of your fingers and the ends of your hair. And the, the, uh... You, you think I'm talking too much? Yes, why don't you kiss her instead of talking her to death? How's that? Uh, youth is wasted on the wrong people. Why? Hey, just a minute, mister. Hey, you come back here. I'll show you some kissing George, if you want to. George! Hey, Uncle Billy, look here. I'm going to kiss Mary. Watch. George, get in the car quick. Your father's had a stroke. What? What? George, had... get in. Hurry. <laughs> Well, George's father died that night, Clarence. So, of course, George couldn't go to Europe. But that fall, just as he was ready to leave for college, the directors of the building loan had a meeting. They were going to appoint a successor to Mr. Bailey. What was that you said, Mr. Potter? I said as long as Peter Bailey's dead, let's dissolve the building and loan. We don't need it. Now, wait a minute. Oh, you wait a minute. Peter Bailey was not a businessman. Ideals without common sense can ruin a town. What do we get? A discontented, lazy rabble instead of a thrifty working class. Oh, hold on, Mr. Potter. Oh, hold on. I meant no disrespect, George, but... Oh, wait a minute, Mayor. Why my father ever started this cheap penny ante building alone, I'll never know. But just remember this, Mr. Potter. This rabble you're talking about, they do most of the working and the paying and living and dying in this community. Well, is it too much to have them work and pay and live and die in a couple of decent rooms and a bath? Anyway, my father didn't think so. People were human beings to him. But to you, a warped, frustrated old man, they're cattle. Well, in my book, Mr. Potter, he died a much richer man than you'll ever be. I'm not interested in your book, George. I'm talking about the building and loan. You're talking about something you can't get your fingers on that's galling. That's what you're talking about. Well, this town needs this measly one-horse institution, if only to have some place where people can borrow a few dollars without crawling to you. Now, come on, Uncle Billy. What happened, George? Yeah, all we heard was a lot of yelling. Boy, oh, boy, you should have heard, George. Yeah, they're in there voting us out of business. Oh, who cares? I can get another job. I'm only 41. 45. Well, you get out of here, George. You missed your boat trip. Do you want to miss college, too? George, we've just voted Potter down. We're still in business. Whoopee! We're still in business! We're still in business! But there's one condition, George. They've appointed you to take your father's place. Appoint me? But I'm going to college. Look, this is my last chance. Uncle Billy's your man. Uh, George, you've got to take it. They'll vote with Potter otherwise. They said so. They even... I know George Bailey didn't go to college. That's right, Terrence. He gave his, his college money to Harry. Harry went instead. But what happened to that good-looking girl, you know, Mary? Oh, George saw her now and then. Not very often, though, because Mary went away to school, too. Anyway, George waited four years more for Harry to come back and take over the building and loan. He could still see the world. He planned to work in the oil fields, Venezuela. Except when Harry came home, he wasn't alone. There was a girl with him, his wife. George? Yeah, I'm out here on the porch, Mother. I just thought I'd get some air. Well, how... How do you like your new sister-in-law? Oh, she's swell. Looks like she can keep Harry on his toes. Yeah, yeah, I keep him out of Bedford Falls anyway. What do you mean? Well, Ruth's father, she's... He's got a wonderful job for Harry up in Buffalo. Buffalo? Well, that means you... Yeah. You can't... Yeah. George, uh, did you know Mary Hatch is back from school? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Nice girl, Mary. Mm-hmm. Oh, stop grunting. Mm-hmm. Give me one good reason why you shouldn't call on Mary. Well, Sam Wainwright. Sam's crazy about Mary. Well, she's not crazy about him. Well, now, how do you know that? Did she discuss it with you? How did... Besides, Sam's away in New York. Oh, and all's fair in love and war. Uh-huh, I see. Okay, Mother, I think I'll go out and find that girl and do a little passionate necking. Oh, George. <laughs> Goodbye, Miss Bailey. 
By the way, do you want any books at the library? Library? George! George, you go and see Mary. Do you hear? George, is that you out there? Oh, oh, hello, Mary. Well, are you coming in? I just happened to be passing by here. Oh, I thought you were picketing. Have you made up your mind? How's that? Have you made up your mind? About what? About coming in. Your mother just phoned. She said you were coming over. My mother just phoned. What does she mean, Carla? I I just happened to be passing by, that's all. I didn't... Well... Well, all right, I'll come in for a minute, but I, I didn't tell anybody I was coming here. You, you feel I can't go out for a walk nowadays without you. When did you, when, you get back? Tuesday. Mm. When did you get that dress? Do you like it? It's all right. <laughs> well, no point standing here on the porch. Come on in. I, I still can't understand it. I didn't tell anybody I was coming here, you know. Would you rather leave? Well, no, I don't want to be rude. <laughs> Sit down for a while. It's nice about your brother and Ruth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. Don't you like her? Well, of course I like her. She's a peach. Oh, just marriage in general you're not enthusiastic about, hmm? No, no. Marriage is all right for a lot of people. It's all right for Harry and Sam Wainwright and you. For Sam? Mary? It's George Bailey, Mother. What's he want? I don't know. What do you want? Me? I, not a thing. Not a thing. And I, I just came in to get warm. He's making violent love to me, Mother. You just tell him to go right back home. Sam said he'd call you tonight from New York, didn't he? I guess so. How about some music? Uh, you know, your mother needs... You know, I didn't come here to... What did you come here for, then? Uh, I don't know. You're supposed to be the one with all the answers. You tell me. Oh, why don't you go home? I don't know why I came here in the first place. Good night. Good night. Okay, the way you're shouting, you'd think that... You'd think what? All right, I'll get it. George, on your way out, would you mind turning off the phonograph? I'd be very happy to. I've gone crazy, song. Hello? Sam? Mary! Gee, it's good to hear your voice. How are you, Sam? I forgot my hat. Hee-haw. What? Oh, I, I was just talking to an old friend of yours, George Bailey. Oh, Mossback George? Oh, Mossback George. Well, put him on. I'll talk to him, too. Oh, wait a second. George! He doesn't want to... George. He does so. He asked for him. Why'd you call me? Because if you are, I, I'm in a hurry. I got... Sam wants to talk to you. Oh. Oh. Hiya, Sam. Hey, fine pal you are, trying to steal my girl. Oh, what do you mean? Nobody's trying to steal anybody's girl. Here, Mary, take the... No, no, no. Wait, wait, George. I want to speak to you both. Tell Mary to get in the extension upstairs. He says for you to get on the extension upstairs. I can't. Mother's on the extension. I <laughs> we, we can both hear George just... Put your head a little closer. What? Yeah, what? That's, that's better. Uh, we're, we're listening, Sam. Well, I have a big deal coming up that's going to make us all rich. George, you remember that time you told me about making plastics out of soybeans? Soybeans? Yeah. Yeah. Soybeans. Yeah. Well, yeah, my yeah. father's checked into it, George. See? And now he's going to put up a factory. How do you like that? A factory, huh? And yeah. here's the point, George. I may have a job for you unless you're still married to that broken down building and loan. Oh, Mary? Uh, I'm here. You tell that guy I'm giving him a chance of a lifetime. Do you hear? He says it's the chance of a lifetime. And give me that phone. Here's George again, Sam. George! Now, you listen to me, Mary. I don't want any plastics, and I don't want any job, and I don't want to get married ever to anyone. Do you understand that? I want to do what I want to do, and and you're not going to trick me. And you're... Mary? George. Mary? Oh, Mary, darling, I, I love you, Mary. So George Bailey and Mary Hatch were... Yes, George and Mary were married. Mm. And they started off on their honeymoon in Ernie Bishop's taxi cab. Hey, where are you two going on this here now, honeymoon? We're going to shoot the works, Ernie. A whole week in New York, a whole week in Bermuda, the highest hotel, the oldest champagne, the hottest music, and the prettiest wife. <laughs> so you're finally getting out of Bedford Falls, huh? Then what? Then what, honey? After that, who cares? That does it. Hey, you know, Mrs. Bailey, I haven't kissed you. Hey, George, that. there's something funny going on over there. Look, look over there at the bank. It looks huh? like a run. All right. Pull over a minute, will you, Ernie? George, let's not stop. Please, let's go straight to the no, station. No, wait a minute. Well, uh, I'd better see what it is. I'll be right back. George, please. George! In 
a few moments, we'll return with the second act of It's a Wonderful Life, starring James Stewart, Donna Reed, and Victor Moore. Meanwhile, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, looking very smart, too, may I say. Well, thank you, Mr. Keeley. You know, after seeing Paulette Goddard's wardrobe for Paramount's new comedy, Suddenly It's Spring, I just had to rush out and buy something new. Looking at all those lovely clothes was just too much for my self-control. Well, you look stunning, Libby. Oh, thank you again, Mr. Keeley. And tell me about the picture. I understand that Paulette's portrayal of the next whack is truly delightful. Oh, yes, it is. And Fred McMurray gives a perfect characterization of her wayward husband. Between the two of them, suddenly it's spring is a high-spirited comedy with emphasis on the romantic side. Well, naturally. <laughs> but really, Mr. Keeley, that wardrobe of Miss Goddard certainly will make clothes-conscious girls sit up and take notice. I'll bet you think so, too, Mr. Kennedy. Well, Libby, men seldom know much about styles. Well, what I notice about a dress is the general effect when a woman wears it. Some girls always seem to have that right-on-the-beam look. You know what I mean. <laughs> well, I think what you have in mind, Mr. Kennedy, is good grooming. Screen stars certainly put great emphasis on it. A perfect hairdo, fresh, beautifully cared for skin. Those are essentials. That must be the reason Lux Toilet Soap continues to be a studio standby, no matter how often other styles change. Well, that's what Miss Goddard told me. She says her beauty facials are so quick and easy and work so well. She's never without a supply of Lux Toilet Soap. I can depend on it for daily complexion care, she said. I wish you'd tell the ladies in our audience how easy these Lux Soap facials are, Libby. Well, here's what Paulette Goddard does. She says, I cover my face with a fragrant Lux Soap lather and work it well in. I rinse with warm water, then cold, and use a soft towel to pat my skin dry. Gives skin quick new beauty, she says. Daily Lux Soap facials do make skin lovelier. Recent tests by skin specialists proved it. In, in three out of four cases, complexions became softer and smoother in, in just a short time. A lovely Lux complexion makes a woman so attractive. I wish every girl who hasn't tried Lux toilet soap would begin using it tomorrow. That's sound advice, Libby. When nine out of ten screen stars recommend a beauty soap, you know it has to be good. So why not try Lux toilet soap, Hollywood's own complexion soap? We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act Two of It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart as George... Donna Reed as Mary, and Victor Moore as Clarence. Well, we're back in heaven again, where the superintendent of angels is reviewing the case history of a mortal named George Bailey. Clarence, the apprentice angel, is very eager to depart on his mission to the earth. Poor George Bailey... Oh, he's certainly in desperate trouble, Joseph. I'll go to him at once. Now, you sit down, Clarence. Sit down. We're nowhere near the point where George Bailey's thinking of taking his life. We're not? Now, uh, where were we? Uh, oh, yes, yes. George and Mary had just started out on their honeymoon when they ran smack into the financial panic of 1932. In the waiting room of the building and loan, a hundred frantic people were clamoring for their safety. Hey, what's going on, Uncle Billy? What's happened? All those people out there. This is a pickle, George. All I know is the bank called our loan an hour ago. I had to hand over all our cash. Holy mackerel. Whole town's gone crazy. Bank's in the same spot we are. Our charter. Too. What about our charter? Our charter says we have to stay open until 6 p.m. The state can take away our license if we don't. How can we stay open until 6 without any money? George, where are you going? Out to talk to those people. Come on. Now, please, folks, now, just a minute. Just a minute, now, please. How about our money, George? Where's our money? Now, come on, now, please. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, listen to me. Now, you're thinking of this place all wrong. Your money's not here. Now, wait a minute. Now, let me tell you. Let me tell you, your money's in people's houses, in the Kennedy house, in the McLaren house, and in your house, and a hundred others. Now, what are you going to do, foreclose on them? I got $240 in shares. Now, let me have it. All right. All right, Charlie. Now... You'll get your money in 60 days. 60 days? Oh, well, now, look, that's what, you, that's what you agreed on when you bought your shares. I got my money! Well, that, 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 that old man Potter's taking 
taken over the bank. He'll pay you 50 cents on every dollar. Then let's take our shares to Potter. Half is better than nothing. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Please, folks. I beg of you not to do this. If Potter gets hold of your shares, he'll be owning this building and loan. And he's got the bank. He's got the bus line. He's got the department stores. And now he's after us because he wants to keep you living in his shacks and paying the kind of rent he decides to charge. Now, we can get through this thing, all right, but we've got to stick together. We've got to have faith in each other. My husband's out of work. We need money. I've got doctor bills to pay. I can't feed my kids on faith. How much do you need? We've still got some money. Hey, Mary. Here it is, George. You told me to hold on to it. Would have made a nice honeymoon. Bought furniture, too. Hey, now, wait a minute, folks. Listen. I've got $2,000. All right, Charlie. How much do you need? $240. No, Charlie, now listen. Just enough to tide you over. I said $240. $240. Okay, okay. Uncle Billy, give Charlie $240. All right, Ed. Now, how much just to get by on? Well, $20, I suppose. Now oh, you're talking. Now, you're Mrs. Thompson, how about well, $20 you? $20 will do me. Good, good. $20. Uncle Billy, pay it back when you can now. Pay it back when you can. All right, all right. Who's next? Look at the clock. Look. Five seconds. Four seconds, three, two, one. Six o'clock, we made it. Lock that door, Eustace, quick. Boy, we're still in business, Uncle Billy. We've even got two bucks left. Hmm? George, there's a call for you. Okay, and then call my wife, will you? She's probably over at Mother's. Mrs. Bailey's on the line. No, I don't want Miss Bailey. I want my wife, Mrs. Bailey. Miss Bailey, that, that's my wife. <laughs> that's my, uh, give me the phone, will you? Hey, Mary, ma- listen, Mary, I'm sorry. I, I, hmm? Come home. Well, what home? Well, 323 Sycamore. Well, whose home is that? What? Well, Mary, how can I... Well, sure, all right, sure, I'll, I'll be there. Clarence, guess what 323 Sycamore was? His mother-in-law's house, huh? Oh, no. Number 323 Sycamore was the old Granville house, the one George threw rocks at and made wishes. Yes, sir, that's where they spent their honeymoon. That's where they started housekeeping. They were still living there two years later when old man Potter asked George to stop over at his office. Sit down, George. Sit down, do. Uh, have a cigar? Well, thank you, sir. Uh, George, you're a young man, married, making, say, $40 a week at the building and lawn. Forty-five. Forty-five. Now, if you were some ordinary yokel, I'd say you were doing fine. But George Bailey is intelligent, ambitious. He hates the building and loan almost as much as I do. He's been dying to get out of town ever since he was born, but he's trapped. Trapped into frittering his life away, playing nursemaid to a lot of garlic eaters. Do I paint a correct picture, George, or do I exaggerate? Well, what's your point, Mr. Potter? My point is that you're the only man in town who has licked me. George, I want to hire you. Manage my affairs. I'll start you off at $20,000 a year. $20,000 a year? Are you sure you're talking to me? I'm George Bailey. Don't you remember me? The building and loan, remember? Yes, George Bailey, whose ship has just come in, providing he has sense enough to climb aboard. Well, but but what about the building and loan? Confound it, man. I'm offering you a three-year contract of $20,000 a year. Is it a deal or isn't it? No, no. The answer's no doggone it. If you offered me a million dollars to stay around this town and play stooge to you, the answer'd still be no. Now, let me alone. Don't bother <laughs> George, what did Mr. Potter want? Oh, uh, nothing. He just talked, talked. Uh, nothing. Oh, gee. Mary Hatch. Mary, why in the world did you ever marry a guy like me, anyway? <laughs> to keep from being an old maid. I was going to see the world. I was going to build things. I was going to give you the moon. What have I given you? What have I given you? Not even a new dress, not for months. I... Gee whiz, I feel awful. So do I. Mornings especially. I could have married Sam Wainwright, anybody else in town. I didn't want to marry anybody else. I want my baby to look like you. No, you didn't even have a honeymoon. And I promised you that you, 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 you what? My baby. You're, you be, hey, Mary... Mary, you mean you're on the nest? Well, Mary had her baby, Clarence, a boy. You don't say. Then she had another one, a girl. Well, what do you know? Night after night, George had come home late from the office. Things weren't good with the building and loan. Potter was really bearing down on him. 
Then came the war. Mary had another baby by then. Oh. But she still had time to help out in USO. Uncle Billy sold war bonds. And George's brother Harry became a real hero. Shot down 15 planes. But George, what about George? Well, George was 4F, his bad ear. He was an air raid warden. On VE day, he wept and prayed. On VJ day, he wept and prayed again. We're, uh, we're getting pretty close to today, aren't we, sir? Yes, Clarence. You now know almost everything you have to know about George Bailey, except what happened that finds him down there at this moment, wanting to die. Well... Sir, well? Well, today's the day before Christmas. Uh, Earth time. George is pretty excited. Hey, Kelly! Useless! Hey, look at the newspaper. Commander Harry Bailey, decorated by the president. That's my kid brother. The Congressional Medal of Honor. Gosh, George, gosh. What do you think about the 15 Jap planes? And the last one he got was just about to dive into a transport loaded with soldiers. You know what that means? He saved lives, hundreds of lives. Hey, Gee, where's, where's Uncle Billy? Huh? Well, going to the bank, George. He's oh. depositing that $8,000. Good, good, good. Go. Who's that in his office there? It's that man again, the bank examiner. Uh-oh, oh, yeah. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Carter. Hey, uh, Telly, get the books from Mr. Carter. Well, you know, that's my brother's picture there, Mr. Carter. He shot down 15 planes, and one of them was just about... Well, well, Mr. Henry, your father come to the bank to deposit some more loot, eh? Sure, you old fool. How do you like the news in the paper, Mr. Potter? Just can't keep those Bailey boys down now, can you? Oh, uh, let me see that newspaper. Here, sorry I can't chat, you old thief. Gotta make a deposit. Uh, here you are, Horace. Deposit slip, bank book, and a very Merry Christmas to you. You too, Mr. Bailey. Say, you've forgotten something, haven't you? Horace, I've forgotten things all my life. Get a wiggle on, boy. But, Mr. Bailey, where's the money? Uh, what, what's that? You want to make a deposit? What well, certainly I want. Well, it's customary to bring the money with you. It's gone. Where'd I put it? Where'd I put that money? A terrible thing, Clarence. Terrible. Uncle Billy couldn't find the money because the envelope with the $8,000 was folded up in that newspaper he gave to old man Pop. I just don't know what happened to it, George. I just don't know. $8,000. Uncle Billy, the bank examiner's here, and it's not our money. It belongs to the depositor. George, what, what are we going to do? We've traced every step I took. We can't stand here in the street. Are you sure you didn't put that envelope in your coat pocket? I, I, I think so. Maybe, maybe. Oh, I'm no good to you, George. I'm no good. Now listen to me. Now listen to me. Think. Think, will you? Now try and think. I can't think anymore. I, I can't. Now where's that money, you silly old fool? You know what this means? It means bankruptcy and scandal and prison. One of us is going to jail. Well, it's not going to be me. Now get out of my way. I'm going home. George, dear, what's wrong? You haven't said a word since you came home. Oh, well, that banging on that piano, does she have to just keep playing that same piece over and over and over and over again? I have to practice for the Christmas party, Daddy. What is it, dear? Another hectic day. Yeah. Yeah, another red-letter day for the baby. Dad, babies. Murphy's got a brand-new car. You should see it. What's the matter with our car? Isn't it good enough for you? I'm sorry, Dad. I only... Run upstairs, Petey. See if Zeus is all right. Hey, now, what do you mean? What to see if Zuzu's all right? What do you mean? Oh, she caught a little cold coming home from school. She didn't button up her coat. Well, what is it? What is? It? What do you mean, just a cold? Oh, George, the doctor said it was nothing serious. The doctor? Was the doctor here? Well, I thought he'd better look at her. This is old drafty house. It's no wonder we don't all have pneumonia. We might as well be living in a refrigerator. Why did we have to live here in the first place and stay around this measly, crummy old town? George, what's happened? Everything's happened. You call this a happy family? Why do we have to have all these kids? Daddy, how do you spell Frankenstein? I don't know how you spell. You ask your mother. Where are you going? Upstairs to see Zuzu. Hello? Oh, thank you, Mrs. Welch. I'm sure she'll be all right. Who's that? Zuzu's school teacher. What? Oh, yes, the doctor says she'll be fine tomorrow. Here, give me that phone. George, please. Mrs. Welch? Well, this is Mr. Bailey. Say, what kind of a teacher are you, anyway? What do you mean, sending Zuzu home like that half-naked? Do you realize you'll probably end up with pneumonia just because of your stupidity? You know, maybe my kids aren't the best-dressed kids in town, but at least... Hello? Hello? Janie, will you stop playing that lousy piano? Cut it out! Stop it! George, for heaven's sake, what's wrong with you? I'm sorry. I'm... Janie, I'm sorry, Mary... I, I, I just got to get out of here. So, there.
That's it, George. You're short $8,000 in your accounts, eh? Oh, please, Mr. Potter, I'll, I'll pay any sort of a bonus. If you still want the building and loan, I... You say it I'll was let... lost. Have you notified the police? No, sir, I haven't done that yet. Harry's home... Oh, I come to me. What about your good friend Sam Wainwright? I can't get a hold of him. He's in Europe. What kind of security would I have, George? What collateral? Yes, sir, I have some life insurance here. $15,000 policy. Mm-hmm. What's your equity in it? $500. And you want 8000 You once called me a warped, frustrated old man. Well, what are you but a warped, frustrated young man crawling on your hands and knees for help? Why don't you go to the riffraff you love so well? Ask them for help. I'll do anything, Mr. Potter, please. Please help me, Miss. My wife and kids... I'm calling the district it. attorney. $500. You know something, George? You're worth more dead than you are alive. Now get out of here. Get out! <laughs> All the time, Potter had the $8,000 in his desk drawer. It's still there, Terrence. But where is George, sir? Where? Well, he went over to Martini's Cafe. He's had a couple of drinks, Clarence. He's just standing there, sort of in a day. Oh, God. Oh, God, dear Father in heaven, I... I'm, I'm not a praying man, but if... If you're up there... And, and you can hear me. Please show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope. I... Show me the way, God. Mr. Bailey, you all right? Don't drink any more, Mr. Bailey. Please, you don't feel good. Bailey? Did you say Bailey? Which Bailey? This gentleman is Mr. Bailey. George Bailey. George Bailey, huh? And the next time you talk to my wife like that, she'll get worse. It isn't enough. She slaves teaching your stupid kids how to read and write. You've got to ball You get out of here, Mr. Welch. You hit my best friend. Get out. All right, I'm... Um, oh. Mr. Bailey, you, you okay? Who's that? Mr. Welch, but don't worry. He don't come in this place no more. I'll get something for your face. It's bleeding. I'm all right. But please, don't go away, Let Mr. Mr. Bailey. Please, don't Let go away. Well, George left Martini's Cafe five minutes ago, Clarence. He's at the river now, on the bridge, looking at the water. Are you ready, Clarence? All ready, sir. Very well. Save George Bailey's life, and you'll get your wings. My wings. Oh, thank you, Joseph. George! George Bailey! Get away from that bridge! You hear me? George! George! In just a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and Victor Moore. The popular theory about beautiful blondes is that they are content to be merely decorative. Our lovely guest tonight, Miss Susan Blanchard, completely disproves that idea. Besides being a hard-working fox starlet, Susan, I understand you're a wonderful cook. I really love housekeeping, Mr. Keeley. But most of all, I enjoy the training I get at the studio. It's work, but it's fun, too. You're an Easterner, aren't you, Susan? Yes, a native New Yorker. Mm, I thought so. It was the Broadway theater that inspired me to think of show business as a career. Well, that's interesting. I used to save my allowance and go to every play I could. One of my favorite actresses was Jane Wyatt. Uh Uh-huh. Imagine, Mr. Keeley, what a thrill it was for me to meet her right here in Hollywood. Jane Wyatt's latest picture, Boomerang, was made in the East, I understand. Mm Mm-hmm, yes. But she and Dana Andrews, who stars in Boomerang with her, were in Hollywood to see a studio showing of the picture. Oh, I see. Jane Wyatt is my ideal of a stage and screen star. So talented and so lovely to look at. Just as lovely in real life, too. She is indeed. It wasn't long before I discovered that she's as keen about Lux toilet soap... For beauty care as I am. You know, I'm a Lux girl, too. We're glad to hear you say that, Miss Blanchard, because that's a very beautiful Lux complexion I see before me. Just right for blue eyes and ash blonde hair. (laughs) Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Any girl in pictures is delighted to find out about Lux toilet soap as a beauty care. Active lather facials are so quick and easy, and they really make a difference in your skin. Thousands of busy, attractive women have discovered that, Miss Blanchard. Daily Lux Soap Complexion Care does make skin lovelier. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the choice of nine out of ten screen stars. Lux Toilet Soap is all around beauty care for me. I use it as a bath soap, too. It has such delightful perfume, leaves a lovely fragrance on the skin. Thank you, Miss Susan Blanchard. 
I hope our audience will be seeing that lovely luxe complexion of yours in a screen close-up one of these days. Now, back to our producer, William Keeley. Act three of It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and Victor Moore. <laughs> Numb with despair, convinced, as Mr. Potter said, that he's worth more dead than alive, George Bailey stands on a bridge, staring at the dark and frigid waters below. Suddenly, there's a splash. Help! Help! I'm Help! Help! No, that's not George. It's Clarence, the apprentice angel. And there goes George in after him. Hmm. It's a few minutes later now, and in the bridge keeper's shack, George and Clarence are drying off. You both sure you're all right? You, you want a doctor? No, I'm all right. I'm all right. Oh, I'm fine. This underwear, I didn't have time to get anything more stylish. My wife gave me this on my last birthday. I passed away in it. You... You what, mister? Hmm... I see Tom Sawyer is drying out, too. Who? My book. I left in such a hurry, I brought Tom Sawyer with me. Hey, how'd you happen to fall in? Oh, I jumped in. I jumped in to save you. Jumped in to save me? Well, I... I did, didn't I? You didn't go through with it, did you? Go through with what? Suicide. Hey, it's against the law to commit suicide around here. Yeah, it's against the law where I come from, too. <laughs> where do you come from? Heaven. Oh, that's very fine. Very your fine. your lips bleeding. Yeah, yeah, I got a bust in the jaw in answer to a prayer. <laughs> oh, no, George, I'm the answer to your prayer. Hey, how, how'd you know my name? Oh, I know all about you. Well, who are you supposed to be, anyway? Clarence Oddbody, A.S. 2. Clarence Oddbody. What's the, what's the AS2 for? Angel, second class. Hey, I'm getting out of here. You may not need a doctor, but I do. Here you are, my good man. Hey, look here. Why do you want to save me? Because I'm your guardian angel, George. Oh, I see. Uh-huh. Well, you look like about the kind of an angel I'd get. What, <laughs> what, uh, what happened to your wings? Well, I haven't won my wings yet. That's why I'm an angel, second class. Oh, I see. But you can help me earn them, George, by letting me help you. Oh, uh uh-huh. Don't happen to have 8,000 bucks on you, do you? Oh, no, no. We we don't use money in heaven. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I keep forgetting. I see. Comes in pretty handy down here, bub. (laughs) Oh, tut, tut, tut. As I found it out a little late. You know, I'm worth more dead than alive. You mustn't talk like that. Joseph will never give me my wings if you keep feeling that way. You just don't realize what you've done for your folks. Why, if it hadn't been for you... Yes, if it hadn't been for me, everybody would be better off. My wife and my kids and my friends. Oh, this is not going to be easy. I'd all be better off if I hadn't been born. What did you say? I said I wish I'd never been born. George, that's wonderful. It's wonderful? What? The idea you just gave me. Well, you've got your wish. You've never been born. I've never been born? Exactly. No worries, no $8,000 to get, nothing. You simply don't exist. All right, all right, okay, all right. George, I can do things, strange things. I can show you the world, George, the way it would be if you hadn't been born. Hey, wait, hey, wait a minute, this ear of mine. Hey, say something else in that bad ear. You don't have a bad ear anymore. Oh, I don't think you're concentrating. Don't you see? You're not the George Bailey you think you are. You're, well, uh, you're nobody. That's the doggonest thing I ever saw, that that ear. Your lips stop bleeding, too. Yeah. Yeah, hey, hey, what's what's happening around here? What is this, anyway? I need a drink, that's what I need. What, What about you, Angel? You want a drink? Well, I I don't quite know. Come on, come on. We'll go as soon as our clothes are dry. Clothes are dry, George. Hey, so they are. That's funny. Well, look, let's get dressed and we'll stroll over to Martini's and then... uh, Oh, excuse me. I mean, I'll stroll. You fly. (laughs) Oh, no, I don't have my wings. You don't have your wings yet. That's right. I forgot that I can. A couple of drinks and we'll both fly, huh? (laughs) 
what'll you have, fellas? Hey, where's the boss? Where's Martini? Look, wise guy, I'm the boss, see? Okay, well, double scotch, quick, will you? What's yours? You know what? I just love some mulled wine. Huh? Heavy on the cinnamon and light on the cloves. Off with you, my lad, and lively now. Now, cut it out. Oh, come on here. Just give him the same as I ordered. He's okay. Uh, Two double scotch. What about this place? It's all changed. All of Bedford Falls has changed. You're having your wish, George. You've never been born. Oh, there'll be lots of things you've never seen before. (laughs) Oh, good. Somebody just made it. Made what? Every time a bell rings, it means some angel's got his wings. What'd you say? Uh, look, uh, Clarence, I don't think you better talk about angels around here. You know, don't they believe in angels? Oh, yeah, they believe in them, but you know, it's just a little well, then thing. Then why you... should people be surprised when they see one? Uh, don't mind him, bartender. He's just a little fella. He just never grew up. And how old are you anyway, Clarence? Well, next May, I'll be 293. That does it. A couple of pixies, huh? Go on, get your hemi cat. Hey, where's Martini? Will you stop tell asking me? about Martini? He ain't here and he. Hey, yo. Rami, didn't I tell you never to come panhandling around here? George, look. Hey, it's Mr. Gower. Mr. Gower. Listen, Mr. Gower, don't you know me? This is George Bailey. You. You buy me a drink, mister? Just one drink, will you, mister? Pinky! Yeah, Nick. Throw the rummy out. Oh, no, no, please. Hey, bartender, that's that's Mr. Gower, the druggist. That rum head spent 20 years in jail for poisoning some kid. If you knew him, you must be a jailbird yourself. Pinky, here's two more. Get him out of here. Get up, George. Good thing he threw us in a snowbank, huh? Where's, where's Mr. Gower? Mr. Gower doesn't know you, George. You see, you weren't there to stop him from putting poison into that prescription. What do you mean I wasn't there? Look, look, tell me, what are you? Are you a hypnotist? George. Look, why am I seeing all these strange things here? Don't you understand it's because you were not born? Well, if I wasn't born, then who am I? Nobody. You have no identity. What do you mean I have no identity? No papers, no driver's license, no 4F card, no insurance policy. Zuzu's bell. What? Zuzu's bell. I bought my little girl a bell to hang on the Christmas tree, and I forgot to give it to her. I've got it in my... I... It's gone. It's gone, too. Everything's gone. But you've been given a great gift, George. A chance to see what the world would be like if you'd never been born. You're crazy. You're crazy as a bedbug, and you're driving me crazy, too. Now, look, I'm going home to my wife and family. Do you understand that? And I'm going home alone. Following him. Joseph, oh, I'll stay near him, sir. Poor George. He's seeing Main Street now the way it would be if he hadn't lived. The thing that's really shocked him, sir, is the building and loan office. Know what's there now? Pawn shop. What's he doing? Can you see? He's talking to Ernie Bishop, the taxi driver. He wants to go home. You better tag along, Clarence. Oh, I will, sir. I will. Come on, step on it, will you, Ernie? Get me home. I'm off my nut. Where do you live, buddy? Oh, now, doggone it, Ernie. Don't you start pulling that stuff on me. 323 Sycamore. 323 Sycamore. Yeah, hurry. I'll put a Zuzu sick. Okay, buddy. Hey, look, Ernie. I, I don't know what's happening. I'm going crazy or something. I've got some bad liquor. I... Now, look. Uh, tell me this now. You're Ernie Bishop, right? And you live with your wife and kid, Donald. You've seen my wife? What do you mean? I've seen your wife. I've been in your house a hundred times. What do you, we, we built it for you, didn't we? Bud, my wife took the kid and ran away five years ago, and I ain't never seen you before in my life, see? Okay, Ernie, okay, okay. Just step on it. Get me home. Mary! Mary, where are you? Janie, Petey, Zuzu. Zuzu, where are you? This is just an old abandoned house, George. You have no wife, no children. Where are they? What have you done with them? Hey, I'll break that tin I told you. All right, up with your hands. Oh, Bert, Bert the cop. Thank heaven you're here. Now, look, why don't you be a good fella and I'll take you to a doctor. Bert, now, Bert, listen to me. What's the matter with you guys? Now, listen, it's that fellow there. He says he's an angel. He tried to hypnotize me. I hate to use my nightstick, but I guess I... Ow! Uh, run, George, run. He can hit you while I'm Ow! biting him. George, run. My teeth aren't what they used to be. Joseph, help! Joseph! Joseph! Where'd they go, Ernie? Where'd they go? I, I, I don't know. They just disappeared. Parents! Oh, 
Joseph, I hope you don't mind my calling on you like I did. It was very irregular, Clarence. You're by yourself again. Where's George? He's at his mother's house, sir. Well, if George hasn't been born, he has no mother. Oh, he's being very stubborn, sir. He'll just have to find these things out for himself. But his mother, that's a terribly bitter blow to a man, his old mother not knowing him. You mean I shouldn't have let him... I mean you better find him right away. Oh, and stop fighting policemen, Clarence. I'm here again, George. My mother, my own mother didn't know me. If only Harry were here. My brother were only back from Washington. Your brother fell through the ice and was drowned at the age of nine. Well, that's a lie. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He saved the lives of every man on that transport. Every man on that transport died. Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. Don't you see, George, you really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? Clarence? Yes? Where's Mary? Please, where's my wife? I, uh, I'm not supposed to tell. Tell me where she is. You're not going to like it, George. Where is she? I'll choke it out of you if I have to. Where's my wife? The library. She works there. She's just about to lock up for the night. So I, uh... George! George! Come back! Oh, there must be some easier way for me to get my wings. Mary. Mary. I'm sorry. The library's closed. Mary, it's George. Don't you know me? No, I don't know you. Let me go. Mary, please don't do this to me, Mary. Please help me. Help me. Where, where are our kids, Mary? I need you, Mary. Oh, get please. away from me. Help! Help! Help me. help me, Mary. I'm George. Mary! <laughs> Clarence. Oh, where is he, Joseph? Where's George? I'm afraid I've lost him, sir. You knew you shouldn't have let him try to see Mary. Now they're after him. A mob. They think he was trying to hurt her. Joseph, I won't even get one wing, will I? You have one more chance, Clarence. Get over to the bridge by the river. I think George has seen just about enough. But, uh, but the mob... Now don't worry. They've lost him, too. Now hurry up. Oh, thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Clarence. Clarence! Clarence, where are you? I'm here, George. Help me, Clarence. Get me back. I don't care what happens to me. Only get me back to my wife and kids, please. I want to live again. Oh, thank you, George. Thank you, boy. I want to live again, please. Oh, God, please let me live again. George? Is that you down there, George? Now, get out of here, Bert. Get out here. You come in any closer, I'll, what the I'll let you have it. What the hell are you yelling for, George? Come on. George. George, Bert. Bert, do you know me? No, yeah. I've been looking all over town for you. Where you been? Hey, Bert. Bert. I'm alive again, Bert. You sure you're all right? Hey, your mouth's bleeding. It is. Hey, my mouth's bleeding. Bert, look, look at the blood come out of there, would you? Uh, and where's Zuzu's Christmas bell, Bert? I had it right in my pocket. Here it is! Hey, it's in my pocket! What do you know about it? Hey, Merry Christmas, Bert! Well, Merry Christmas. Get in the car. I'll drive you home. You will, Bert? We'll do that. I turn the siren wide open, huh? Merry Christmas, Bedford Falls! Hey, Merry Christmas, old building alone! Merry Christmas, Mr. Potter! Yippee! Come on. Hey, Bert, come on, come on in with me, huh? What, what are these people, these reporters? Hey, oh, oh, Merry Christmas, reporters. Hey, Mr. Bank Examiner, Merry Mr. Christmas. Mr. Bailey, there's a deficit. I know, $8,000, I'll bet, huh? George, I've, I've got a little paper here. I'm oh, sorry. I, but... I bet it's a warrant for my arrest. Isn't that wonderful? Merry Christmas. Hey, where's Mary, you know? Uh, look at this wonderful old drafty house. Shouldn't it wonderful? Have you seen my wife? Where's Mary? Daddy, Mary! Daddy, 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 Daddy,
Where have you been? Oh, Mary, George, oh, Mary, George, look, George. Let, just let me touch you. Oh, you're real, Mary. Oh, you've no idea what happened oh, to me. You've no idea what's happened either. They're on their way here. Who? Who's on their way? Oh, the police department? I don't. The FBI? The National Guard? I'm alive again, Mary. Oh, listen, Mary, I'm alive again. Oh yes, darling, yes. Now, now, close your eyes and, and come on downstairs. Wait, wait. What is it? Can't open my eyes yet, Mary? What's going on here? Now, now keep your eyes closed. Now, I'll just walk you over here by the Christmas tree and... Well, the people I hear, but lots of people. What, what is it? Lots of people. Just one minute now. We're all ready, Uncle Billy. Come in, everybody. John, look. Just look. Uncle Billy. Money, George. A laundry basket filled with money. Money for you. Mary did it, George. Mary. I don't, I don't understand. What money? What... People heard you in trouble, darling. These people, your friends, they've collected this money for you. The $8,000. Charlie. Hey, there's Mar- there's Martini. Uh, Mr. Gower. Hey, how are you, Mr. Gower? Mrs. Thompson, Ed, Tom, everybody. Huh? None of us would have a roof over our heads if it wasn't for you, George. Oh, gosh, this is wonderful. Hey, Mary, look. Look who's coming in. Mother. Hi, Mother. Hey, and Harry. Got Mary's telegram, George. I flew in as fast as I could. Hey, everybody, a toast. How about a toast? Oh, good idea, Ernie. A toast to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. Daddy, that's it, You didn't forget. Here, honey. Here's your bell. Daddy. Charlie, what's this on the table here? What's this for? The, the Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Lord, there's something written in it. Dear George, remember no man is a failure who has friends. Thanks for the wings, love, Clarence. Clarence? Yeah, he's a very dear friend of mine. Daddy, this is well sick. Every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right, Zuzu. That's right. That's right. At a boy, Clarence. At a boy, Clarence. Happy landing. It's a wonderful life so long as we can have such fine performances as we enjoyed tonight. From Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and Victor Moore. Jimmy, I'd like to thank whatever guardian angel whisked you back from Texas for our show this evening. Well, that guardian angel was an airline's wing, uh, Bill. (laughs) You were in Texas for the premiere of this picture, weren't you, Jimmy? Yeah, Frank Capra and I went down for five openings as many nights. Pretty good All down there in Texas, Texas yeah. Jimmy. Yeah, every one of them. There are five premieres over Texas. You know, it's a pretty big state. Takes that many. To <laughs> do it. Jimmy, I'm sure your fans were proud to read that you received an honorary degree from Princeton just the other week. Yes, how about that, Jimmy? Do we call you Professor now? No, 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 no. It's just an M.A. Oh, Master of Arts? Well, I don't, it might have been. I don't know. It might be for murdering architecture. That's what I studied. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Donna has an honorary degree to her credit, too. L.L.C. What's that, Bill? L.L.C.? Well, you can see for yourself. A lovely Lux complexion. Well, thank you, Bill. Or rather, thank Lux Toilet Soap. It's a wonderful complexion care. I use it faithfully. With wonderful results, I see. Uh, what's happening next Monday night on Lux, Bill? Next week, we have another of the season's most successful films. It's 20th Century Fox's thrilling screen hit, Leave Her to Heaven, with lovely Jean Tierney, and a star who appears in answer to literally hundreds of requests, Cornell Wilde. Best, based on the best-selling novel of the same name... Leave her to heaven is the strange, dramatic story of a woman whose twisted mind and fiendish jealousy drive her to any lengths to hold the man she loves. Now that ought to make great listening, Bill. I wouldn't miss it for anything. Good night. night. Good, Good night, night, and thanks a million. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Gene Tierney 
and Cornell Wilde in Leave Her to Heaven. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Here's a sure way to save on your meat and grocery bills. Turn in used patch, kitchen fats to your butcher and receive a generous price for every pound. The worldwide supply of fats is still desperately short, and every drop you save helps in the making of soap, refrigerators, and other needed items. So save and turn in your used kitchen fats. Donna Reed appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The Beginning or the End, starring Brian Donlevy and Robert Walker. James Stewart will soon be seen in the Robert Riskin production for RKO, Magic Town. Victor Moore will soon be seen in Roy Del Ruth's production, It Happened on Fifth Avenue. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Lever to Heaven with Gene Tierney and Cornell Wilde. Fry. When you bake and fry, fry. for your cake and pie, fry. it's your shortening by Reliance Fry. Want fried foods crisp, golden, better tasting? Try Spry, the pure vegetable shortening that gives you delicious, better tasting fried foods. So digestible, too, the Spry way. Reliance Spry. S-P-R-Y. Reliance Spry. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in again next Monday night to hear the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Lieber to Heaven. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Here's a last-minute Christmas shopping suggestion. Jingle bells, jingle bells, bells of NBC. Oh, what joy to cook and bake while listening merrily. Pots and pans, sink and stove, work goes easily. Kitchens ring with happy chimes when tuned to NBC. What will you hear in your kitchen after Christmas? Bacon sizzling, coffee perking, dishes clinking, and, if you're lucky, a new sound. NBC Radio listening on that new set. The perfect gift to lighten mother's long hours in the kitchen. Kitchens ring with happy chimes when tuned to NBC. James Stewart as the Six Shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl, its handle unmarked. People call them both the six shooter. The NBC radio network presents James Stewart as the six shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still remembered legends. There was a nip in the air, not a freezing, biting, angry nip, but a sort of tingle that made the morning stars shimmer and swung them out of their orbits a little closer to the earth. Oh, it was a winter nip, all right, but not a hard winter. Not a winter when the cattle would come down from the high places, poking their noses into the ice-encrusted ground. It was a mild winter nip. Mild enough so that the breath of the boy on the pinto turned only a faint gray as he rode toward the campfire where the man was sitting. Howdy. Hello, mister. I see your fire. I, I thought maybe you wouldn't mind if I gave my pony a chance to warm up. Sure, sure. Make yourself home. You heading for Thompson's Corners, mister? That's right. I just came from there. Oh, well, you must have been riding all night. Oh, just about. You see, uh, I'm running away from home. Oh, that's so. Ah. It seems kind of a funny thing you'd pick this time of year to run away. Uh, so close to Christmas, I mean. I hate Christmas. Oh? It, it's just for kids, anyhow. Well... I, I really don't really say so. Christmas is for children. That's what she said. Johnny's old enough to do with all, all that fuss and nonsense. 
I want to show Mr. Frankel now. Oh, you don't live with your folks, huh, Johnny? No, sir. He, he died about eight months ago. Oh, I see. Christmas was all right when they... When I was with them. Of course, I was a lot younger then. Oh, yes, yes. yes it yes. just beats me the way folks take Christmas so serious. Well, I don't know. Is it getting presents made any difference? As if I really cared about that knife. Why, is that what you wanted, a, a pocket knife? I don't want a knife. I don't want anything. I just wish there wasn't any Christmas, that's all. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I guess you aren't the first person to feel that way. You know, it seems to me... seems to me I remember reading a story once about a fellow felt the same way about Christmas you do. Just didn't have any use for it. What happened to you? Well, I, I doubt if I can call it to mind after all this time, but as I recollect... Now, now mind you, this may not be word for word, uh, but as I recollect, the man that it was about, the one that hated Christmas, that is, well, he he was a real skin plant, he was. He, just as stingy as they come. Uh, his name was, uh, let me see, uh, Eben, something like that. Eben? Eben, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure that was it. Well... Being so tight-fisted, this fellow Eben, he he got to be the richest man in the whole territory. He owned a ranch? Oh, sure, sure. Had, had four of them. Four ranches and store buildings and farms and maybe a bank or two. He was rich. I bet he had a mighty fine ranch house. No. No, no, he didn't have a ranch house. He, Eben wasn't the sort to spend money on a ranch house unless there was profit in it. See, he just lived alone in town, had himself a steady room at the hotel. Well, anyway, one night while Evan was sitting in his room having supper, Christmas Eve it was, well, on this particular Christmas Eve, his only kin, a nephew, lived in the same town. He, he stopped by the hotel. To wish you a Merry Christmas, Uncle, and invite you to our place for dinner tomorrow. Christmas, fiddlesticks, powder out. I suppose you'd be closing up your livery stable for the occasion. Why, sure, Uncle Eb. And just how are the horses know it's Christmas? Answer me that. <laughs> well, if they don't know it, we will. Can I tell Sally to expect you at three? You can expect me all you like, but I ain't coming. Not at three or any other time. Oh, if you're making so much money, you can afford to be giving parties. Maybe I ought to think about raising the rents on the livery stable. Well, now, Uncle Oh, go on, get out of here before I lose my temper. All this nonsense about Christmas... Fiddlesticks. Oh, well, after that, Johnny, the nephew didn't stick around there. He got out of Evan's hotel room in a regular gallop. It wasn't very long before Evan had another visitor. He was a young fellow, tall, lanky, not very good at speaking. He just plain ordinary cowpoke. He was the foreman of the S&M ranch. Oh, well, it took you long enough to get here. Where have you been? Selling off some of my herd without telling me about it? No, sir. That day you rode by, I was out in the range hunting stray. And a good thing I decided to check up on you, too. What's that cabin doing over by Holly Creek? And who are those people staying here? They're my family. I, I built the shack for them myself. I'm not going to have a bunch of nesters in my property. Tear it down. But well, one of my boys has been sick. I, I can't afford That's to rent it. That's my concern. It's up to you to keep your family and what you earn. So see that you get rid of that shack tomorrow. But tomorrow's Christmas. Oh, oh, well. Then you'll have plenty of free time to tear it down. I'll be out the day after to make sure you've done it. Good night. Well, wasn't much use in argument. Quorum knew that. So he put on his hat and shuffled out. Now Evan was alone again. At least he thought he was alone. The clock on the mantel started striking eight, and then it's time for him to turn in. So he put on his flannel nightshirt and reached for the kerosene lamp to set it on the stool beside the bed. And and right about then, the strangest thing happened. It went... What in tarnation? Johnny, old Eben saw a man's face looking right at him from inside that lamp. Eyes and hair and nose and mouth, whiskers, all, all just as plain as day. Jake... It was old Jake, Evan's partner. There wasn't any mistake about it at all. It was Jake right to a T. Well, Evan sure didn't like the idea of having Jake right in the same room with him. You see, Jake had been dead for over seven years. 
Not that Evan really believed in ghosts or haunts or anything like that. He told himself he was just imagining all this. Yeah, I, 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 I got to get a hold of myself. He, he put out his hand to turn down the wick, but all of a sudden his fingers started trembling. There was Jake again, across the room this time, standing right by the bureau. No! And when the lamp slipped out of Evan's hand, the, the room didn't get dark at all. Jake seemed to be surrounded by a splotch of bright yellow light, and he was wearing the same boots and breeches and leather jacket that he'd had on seven years ago the, the day he died. But as Jake came closer, Evan could see that he was wearing something else. A small leather saddle strapped across his back, and hanging down from it were two saddlebags stuffed so full of gold nuggets and mortgage papers and land grants that Jake could hardly drag him across the floor. You recognize me, Evan? Oh, sure, Jake. Why, sure, I'd never forget you, but... Well, what are you doing here? <laughs> and why are you wearing that get-up? Always thinking about land and money. Always scheming and conniving. That's why I wear it. And that's why I've come to warn you, Evan. The saddle you're fixing up for yourself is even heavier than mine. But I don't know what you mean, Jake. I ain't done no wrong. I ain't never done folks no wrong. Have you ever done them any good? Any good at all? Oh, why, sure. I've worked hard. I've saved my money. I ain't been a burden on anybody. Why, well, you should see our ranches, Jake. Oh, the way I've built them up. I have seen them many times. And I've seen a lot more than that, too. That's my punishment. To spend eternity traveling around, seeing mankind with its trials and tribulations, with its joys and hopes. Is that so terrible? Oh, Evan, to watch him and not be able to help him. You'll find out how terrible it is. You'll find out. Well, there must be some way of avoiding this. Uh, you always were, my friend. Hey, Jake, tell me what to do. Evan, you've got to find out for yourself. But how? Tonight... At one o'clock, you'll be haunted by a ghost. Another ghost? Pay him heed, Evan. Pay him some heed. Hey, hey, wait, Jake. Don't leave me without it. Uh, 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 Jake. The yellow light sort of faded away and the ghost was gone. It was just like he hadn't even been there. And then... And then something caught the corner of Evan's eye. A little glimmer on the floor... And he bent over to pick it up. A gold nugget. Oh, now where on earth did he... Oh. And then he remembered. Those saddlebags of Jake's, they'd been filled clear to the brim with gold nuggets. We're interrupting our story for only a moment. And only to tell you, our unseen audience, that you have helped more than you may realize to make this a very Merry Christmas for all of us on this program. Your being with us each week, your many kind letters, have told us that all the work that goes into bringing you the six-shooter has not been in vain. And we're grateful. So, friends, from all of us, Jimmy Stewart and the cast, our writer, our director, engineers, and sound technicians, our best wishes for a happy holiday season. Oh, yes, and before I forget it, beginning December 31st, the six-shooter will be on the air on Thursdays instead of Sundays. That's beginning Thursday the 31st. The time of broadcast will be listed in your local newspaper. Thank you. Now, Act Two of The Six-Shooter, starring James Stewart as Britt Ponson. Ghost really had been there, mister? Yeah, there just wasn't any doubt about it, Johnny. Well, what happened then? Did the other spook turn up? The one Jake said was coming to see Evan? Oh, sure, Johnny, sure, yeah. And he was right on time, too. Evan was lying in bed, wide awake, of course. He hadn't been able to do much sleep, and he's too scared. You know? it, it was kind of peculiar. Evan was half scared the ghost would come and half scared he wouldn't, you see. But before the sound of the clock had died away, there he was. He's sitting in Evan's rocking chair like he'd been there all night long. 
And and this ghost was a was a young fellow, oh maybe eighteen, nineteen, all dooted up the way young bucks like to dress, you know, fancy shaps and checkered shirt and a red bandana tied around his neck. Howdy, Eben. Reckon you've been expecting me. Yeah, well, I I I guess so. You ready to take a little trip? With you. Back. Way back through the years. Oh, but how can I go with you? It's real easy. You see, I'm the ghost of Christmas past. Your past, Evan. Let's shove on. Well, the next thing Evan knew, he and that ghost were standing out on a snow-covered prairie. There was a circle of covered wagons in front of them, and the people from the wagons were gathered together and listening to a tall, Get white-bearded man. Bring you good he was reading the Bible. Great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto and you. you shall find the baby. The ghost turned and water. pointed to a boy sitting away from the others on the tailboard of one of the wagons. Small boy, oh, about ten years old with hollow cheeks and his eyes all red from crying. Oh, oh no. It was, it was Evan himself on a Christmas day a long, long time ago. Not a very happy Christmas either. It was only a week since the oxen had stampeded and his ma had been killed when she, she fell from the wagon. His pa had died with an Apache arrow in his chest. No, I, I don't want to look at him anymore, can't you... Show me another Christmas. Well, it was no sooner said than done. Now, Evan and the ghost were in a bunkhouse. And Evan saw himself again. Oh, he's ten years older than the boy on the prairie, but he was lying on a blanket staring up at the ceiling. And then his pal, Jay, came running in, all out of breath. Come on, Ed. Get a clean shirt on. We got us an invite to a party. Huh? Yeah, the boss is throwing a big shindig. He says he'll fire us if we don't show up. <laughs> Evan couldn't help remembering that party. Oh, the roast beef and the baked ham and square dancing and the pretty girls in their calico. He couldn't help saying out loud to the ghost. Oh, dear. How I wish I... What was that, Evan? Nothing, Mr. Spirit. Nothing. I, I was just remembering how I treated my foreman today. That's all. After that, the ghost took Evan to three or four more of his old Christmases. And none of them were very happy. Especially that Christmas when the young school mom, sitting on the horsehair sofa, had unwrapped the tiny box Evan gave her and then handed it back to him. It's a lovely ring, Evan. But I can't wear it. Well, you're, you're not caught in somebody else. No, Evan. But you are. You're courting something else. Bill. Land and money, cattle, profits. They mean more to you than I ever would. I'm sorry. Mr. Ghost, no more of the past. Please, I've seen enough. A man wants to forget. Sure, Evan, whatever you say. And before Evan could blink his eyes, he was right back in the hotel room. But once he got there, he he blinked real hard because all of a sudden the ghost was becoming a different person. He was getting fatter, and his stomach popped out two or three inches, and a few wrinkles creased his cheeks, and finally his shaps turned into a shiny blue serge suit with a heavy gold chain dangling across the vest. Hey, well, what's happened to you? Why are you so different now? You seem to be getting tired of the past, so I thought we might take a gander at the present. If you've got no objections. Well, the hotel room just melted away, and Evan was looking at that cabin his foreman had built on Holly Creek. <laughs> well, that cabin sure was crowded. Oh, there must have been five or six children, all helping their mother get the Christmas dinner, all laughing and talking, as busy as summer coats. But when their father came in, he had a long face and a tired mouth, and... His wife looked up and wanted to know what was troubling him. Oh, I was just thinking about old Evan. <laughs> That's not a very pleasant thought for Christmas, Bob. Uh, by the way, what did he want with you yesterday? Was it about this cabin? Hmm? Yeah. Oh, no, no, of course not. 
Well, let's get on with dinner. Sit down, everybody. Now, where's I my Tim, huh? Well, I guess we're just going to have to eat And supper. Bob looked all around the room. He, he was pre- pretending he didn't see the little fellow in the corner. The boy with an iron brace on his leg and a wooden crutch propped up against the wall. But little Tim, he wasn't going to be ignored. Here I am! So, Bob picked him up and carried him over to the table. God bless this food, this house, and us and our friends. Even old Evan. Amen. <laughs> the, uh, the family found that part about Evan a little hard to swallow, but they finally managed, and Tim was the last one to chime in. God bless us, everyone. <laughs> Evan didn't want to watch what was going on in that cabin any longer, but... The next place the ghost showed him wasn't much easier on him. There was a big party going on at his nephew's house back in the livery stable. And one of the ladies was blindfolded, you see, and, and she was trying to pin the tail onto a donkey. But, but there was something peculiar about this donkey, about the way it, about the way it was drawn. It, it, it looked more like a person than an animal. Well, Eben recognized who it was supposed to be right off. <laughs> you see, folks, I invited Uncle Eben to be with us, but he turned me down flat. So I figured we'd have him here in spirit, if not in the flesh. <laughs> right back in the hotel room again. That's where Eben found himself. Spirit. Spirit, you showed me the past and the present. What's left to see the future, Eben. The future. And that's how Eben came to see a Christmas of the future. A cold, brittle Christmas. And the, there are two men standing on a street corner and the coat collars turned up so to keep out the snow. Oh, he's dead all right. This is a doornail. Sure is a Christmas present I never expected. At least whoever handles his property won't be as hard to deal with as he was. Wonder if they'll bother giving him a funeral. And in a frame house over on the side street in the edge of town, a woman was speaking to her husband. Funny. To me, he's been dead for years. Well, I haven't even thought of him since I don't know when. And yet, you know, once, well, once I was real fond of him. Funny, isn't it? Ghost! Who are they talking about? Those men on the street. That woman I used to know. Who is it that's dead? Tell me. And the ghost slowly turned and stretched out a long, thin, bony finger. And there, right at the end of that finger, was a tombstone, all covered with weeds. Eben could barely make out the name that was carved on it. Ebenezer Scrooge. No. No, no! Uh, uh, what's this? Uh, where am I? Where and you know I? what? He was right in his own bed, in his own nightshirt, and the sun was streaming through the frosted windows. But Evan didn't stay there very long, not for very long. He got into his boots and trousers as fast as he could, and he dashed down the stairs, out into the street. Well, you see, the stores being closed gave Evan quite a problem. Well, he he just have to make Fuzzy Wagner open the butcher shop up, that's all. Of course, Fuzzy didn't have much choice, seeing as how the shop was located in one of Evan's buildings. And when Evan told him what he wanted, a turkey and a ham, well... No, 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 no. I'd better make it two hams and send them out to the cabin on the S&M ranch. (laughs) And they're not to know that I ordered them. You understand, Fuzzy? Here's the money and a little extra for your trouble. Well, before Fuzzy could get his jaw shut up again, Evan was on his way, and he headed right straight out to his nephew's house. And Evan was the life of the party, too. Well, the way he carried on, he's laughing and making jokes and telling stories on himself, and he insisted that they use that donkey with his face on oh, when yes, they play sir. games, you know. Yes, sir. because that's what I've been all these years, a real four-footed, long-eared donkey. <laughs> and the next morning, though, that's... That's what Eben enjoyed the most. He was up bright and early and hitched the team to the buckboard and drove out to the S&M, hurrying the horses all the way. Come on, Bess! Come on, Martha! (laughs) Step a little lively. 
if he could just get out there before his foreman starts tearing down that cabin. Whoa! Whoa, my head. Whoa! Whoa! Yeah. Mm. Well, Robert? Yes, sir? I see you ain't carried out my orders. Well, it was Christmas. I, I just couldn't tell him. I'll do it today. Oh! This is the last straw. I'm not putting up with your shenanigans any longer, young fellow. Oh, but please, that don't cabin's it. coming down and no buts about it. And then, uh, and then we're building a new ranch house in its place. Big enough for you and your whole family. What? Oh, yes. I'm also doubling your wages as of last week. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Bob. Even if I am a day late. No, not a day. More like half a lifetime. But Merry Christmas anyway, and... And as your son says, God bless us, everyone. Well, that's the way things worked out, Johnny, more or less. Well, that's a fine story, Mr. Real fine. I reckon I know why you told it to me. How's that? So as I understand about Christmas and how important it is to do for other people... Instead of just thinking about yourself. Well, no, no, I, I didn't have that in mind especially. I, the story just happened to come into my head. That's all. I just... well, maybe if I used to give Aunt Millie something, a present, maybe. Oh, shucks! What could I give her? I don't have no money. Well, of course there are lots of things that don't cost a penny, not a single red cent, you know. Hmm? Well, now you, let's see, take that little spruce over there. I'd be real easy to cut that down with a little fixer and maybe a few doodads from around the house. I, well, I'll bet you can make a Jim Dandy Christmas tree out of that. I suppose so, but what good's a tree without something to put under it? Oh, yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, Johnny, uh, you don't happen to know Jim Bender, do you? In Thompson's Corner and his three daughters? He's only got two, Mr. Sarah and Emily. Oh, that's all. That's all. I, I was spending Christmas with them. I, hmm. Uh, it looks like I'm carrying an extra present. It's a real pretty little red bonnet with feathers on it. I couldn't take it, Mister. Oh no, no, I, I wasn't thinking of giving it to you, Johnny. I, but I was sort of hoping that you'd show me the trail from here on in. Of course, it would mean you're turning around, going back home. But if I was to cause you changing your plans, I'd feel obligated to pay you back some way, you know. Well. It would be only fair. Trouble is, I haven't got much money, so if you wouldn't mind accepting the bonnet instead, you'd be doing me a real favor, Johnny. I... There's Aunt Millie out the yard. Oh, she, she looks mad in a wet hand. Well, there is a resemblance. I'll have to admit that. Where in tarnation have you been, John Carville? I've been looking high and low for you since dawn. Well, I, I just went for a little ride, Aunt Millie, to get us a Christmas tree, see? Christmas tree? Fiddlesticks. <laughs> this gentleman won't cut it down. I'll just take it inside. Be right back, mister. <laughs> if we had any use for a Christmas tree. I suppose he's figuring there'll be a whole lot of presents under it. No, no, I don't think so. But uh, just between you and me, I I got a hunch there'll be at least one person waiting for somebody. What are you talking about? Oh, no, no, it wouldn't be fair for me to speak out before Christmas. You know that. You you don't mean he's got something for me. No, 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 you must get too curious so early. But, but I thought he didn't like me. I thought he just hated having to live here with, with an old maid. Oh, I guess I just don't know nothing about kids. Nothing at all. I, I don't deserve to get... Oh. Well, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I think I'd better get moving along. I, say goodbye to Johnny for me, will you? And uh, I wonder if you'd uh, give this to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they tell them the little blade on it's kind of dull, but... A pocket knife? Yeah. Now, how did you know? Hold on, man. Oh, God bless you, mister. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Please 
remember now, beginning December 31st, the Six Shooter will be on Thursdays instead of Sundays. We hope you'll join us in our new time. The Six Shooter is an NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. The transcribed story was written by Frank Burt in collaboration with Charles Dickens. Mr. Stewart may soon be seen in the Universal International picture, The Glenn Miller Story. Howard McNear played Scrooge, and special music was by Basil Adlam. The entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until Thursday the 31st, this is Hal Gibney speaking. Merry Christmas. Tonight, hear Rex Harrison and Anna Lee in the NBC Star Playhouse on the NBC Radio Network. dealers present Mr. Eddie Cantor in Double Entry, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. <laughs> well, a weeping reindeer. What's wrong? I just lost my job. Oh, that's terrible and so near Christmas. By the way, what's your name? Donna. Well, tell me, Donner, how do Blitz and Dancer and Prancer feel about this? Oh, just awful. They've been fired, too. You see, when Santa Claus, he is, or rather was our boss, first heard about your Autolite staple batteries, he decided to give up the sleigh and make his deliveries by car. Oh, Santa fell in love with those stay full features, eh? I guess so, but I don't know why. Oh, that's easy. You see, his Autolite stay full battery needs water only three times a year in normal sleigh uh, car use. And then, too, it gives him, pardon the expression, reindeer fast starts, even in the North Pole. And what's more, with those fiberglass retaining mats protecting every positive plate, Autolite Stay-Full batteries deliver 70% longer average life than batteries without Stay-Full features. That's shown by recent tests based on SAE life cycle standards. Well, that doesn't make me any happier. Oh, come on, dear. Cheer up. Tis the season to be jolly. Remember, you're always bright with Autolite. Mr. Cantor appears as Eddie, with Sidney Miller as Sam, his bosom friend, in Double Entry, an unusual story of clerical crime at Christmas time. Altogether, a most remarkable tale of suspense. It always balances in the double entry system. If it don't, you hang around until it does. Yeah, even Christmas week. That's what I've been doing all my life, keeping books. It's fascinating, positively fascinating. Look at them figures. Beautiful, ain't they? Calligraphy, they call it. That's Greek for beautiful handwriting, you know. I bet in my day I've written billions of figures. Oh, hundreds of billions. And cash? Say, I've handled so much cash, my fingers are calloused. Why, once I even got water on the thumb from licking it to count money. <laughs> but so what? What's cash? You go along every day counting it, piling it up, never thinking who owns it, never even think about what it will buy. Handling cash is just the same as adding figures. A job. And then, one day something happens that makes you look on things different. There's no excitement in an office, no danger, no heroism, no adventure. Not much chance to risk anything to do something for a pal. So if a guy gets a chance to do a favor, to help out a pal who's in a jam, well, maybe you look on cash a little different. All of a sudden, cash is more than pieces of metal and bits of green paper. And if it's Christmas week, if it's Christmas Eve, and your pal is true blue, it's even more important. Eddie. Eddie, hand me that Dixie cup, will you? Your ulcer's bothering you again, Sam? Yeah. Yeah, bad. 
These ledgers are driving me nuts. You got the wrong temperament for an accountant, Sam. You shouldn't let it get you down. Things can't go on like this, Eddie. What's the matter, Alice? Don't Alice understand you? No, no, no. That's not what I mean, Eddie. What do you mean, Sam? You, you wouldn't understand it. Oh, you always say that, Sam. I'm an understanding guy. That's what Mabel says. Mabel says. You understand Mabel. Does she understand you? Certainly, perfectly. A man's wife has to understand him. If she don't, what good is she? Well, that's a nice way to look at it. If your wife understands you. Don't Alice understand you? you no, know Alice don't understand me. That's because you don't understand her. Will you shut up? Sometimes you... You're so smug. Oh, lay off, Sam. You can't go on like this. Like what? Grouchy all the time. Uh, you got something on your mind that Alice don't understand? Try me out. I won't throw no dishes at you. I, I can't tell you, Ed. It wouldn't matter anyway. You can't do nothing. Well, just telling your troubles helps sometimes. Talk, Sam. Uh-uh, no. Talk, Sam. This is Eddie, your friend. Okay. Okay. It's the auditor's. Oh, them guys? Yeah. Don't let them worry you. You're head bookkeeper here, ain't you? You tell them. Don't let them tell you. I'm telling you, Eddie. They're getting awful close. What are you talking about? They're driving me nuts. Why, Sam? Eddie, I'm light. You mean... The books. They're light. They're short. You mean that... I'm a crook, Eddie. Yeah, an embezzler. And they're going to get me. Those auditors, they're on to me. I know they are. I can feel them getting closer and closer... Now, after nine years, they're on the trail, Ed. You a crook, Sam. I don't believe it. Oh, I wish I were dreaming. Why, Sam, you're the fair-haired boy around here. All you had to do was ask. Ask who? Bartholomew, that tight-fisted... It's stubborn... Alice. She's to blame, I know. She wasn't satisfied with your salary. She wanted ermine, capes, diamonds, a box at the opera. I know she drove you to it, Sam. Don't blame her, Eddie. This one we can't blame on Alice. She doesn't even know anything about this caper. Well, if she didn't drive you to it, why'd you do it? All those kids on the block. They wanted to go to camp. Yeah, that's how it started, Eddie. With unknown benefactory. With... What, uh, you don't make sense, Sam. What do you... What it do was you... just a hundred bucks or so at first. I figured to put it right back. Then the papers come out with... Unknown benefactor sends 20 kids to summer camp. Oh, that got me. That unknown benefactor... So that was you, huh? Yeah, yeah. And pretty soon I was... I was taking out a hundred bucks here, a hundred bucks there, sending it off to all sorts of people and outfits. I sent dough to help the Institute for Aged Cats. Oh. Yeah, then, then I was an unknown contributor to Help Save Vaudeville Movement. And kids. I was always helping kids. A, a regular Scrooge. No, 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 no. S Santa Claus, Sam. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, it made me feel great. Of course, I'd, I'd cover up on the books here with a fake entry, hoping I'd hit on the market and be able to put it all back, you know. Yeah, but you were always unable to make a recoup. Kept getting in deeper. Sam Crockett, an embezzler, and for nine years... Don't say it, Eddie. Nine years? How much did you take in all that time? A hundred thousand dollars and eleven cents. Where am I going to get that kind of money? I could dig up the eleven cents. Oh, but... wisecracks. That's all you're good for. Jail staring me in the face. What do you want me to say? What do you, you generally say? What do you generally say to your friend when he tells you he's a crook? I told you because... Well, because it feels good to get it off my chest. Nine years of hell. That's why you've been so nervous. That's where my ulcers come from. Every night, working late, covering up and sweating, worrying. Thinking of the ultimate end. The wall's closing in on me, Eddie. And now... Oh, oh, oh. Hello? Hello, Yes? Yes, Mr. Bartholomew. Send Crockett in? Okay. My master's voice. Bartholomew wants to see you. Wag your tail, Fido. Wag it? I can't even drag it. Say, Eddie, didn't I see the auditors go in there a minute ago? Yeah. Yeah, come to think they did, Sam. This is it, kid. Merry Christmas. Maybe it's not, Sam. Uh, I got a feeling. I, I'm not scared, Eddie. No, no, it's It's a relief. Now I'll sleep nights. Maybe my ulcer will clear up. Oh, but those kids. Those kids are going to take it hard when they read about their unknown benefactor doing time. A hundred grand. Oh, wonder what he did with the 11 cents. Sales tax, I suppose. What a chump. Your name, Eddie? Yeah, what about it? What about it? 
I'm Fink Freeze. Mr. Flint said to drop in and see if you want to place a bet today. Flint who? What do you mean, Flint who? Mike Flint. Ain't your name Eddie? Sure, but I never heard of Mike Flint. You got the wrong Eddie. My name's Sullivan. Oh, he didn't tell me no last name. Oh, um, I don't know. He says look up Eddie in 411 Perry Trust Building. This is 511. Oh, oh for Pete's sake. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute. Huh? Wait. You say you take bets on horses? I'll take a bet on a camel if he's running a tropical park. Are you a bookie? Well, I ain't no taxidermist, pal. Say, I may be the right Eddie after all. Got any odds? Well, if, uh, if you're on the level, Eddie... You're in the business. Do I look like a stool pigeon? Okay, Eddie. Ah, I guess you're okay. Odds, huh? You want odds? Well, let's see. A tropical park? I can give you ten to one in the first race. Aleppo. Finished last in a field of nine. His only other start. Let's see the form. You see, odds is okay if you don't bet too heavy. Play odds like a side bet, Eddie. The thing to play is the jockey, not the horse. Now, you take Sylvester. Won three yesterday, two on Monday, one on Sunday. Oh, he's hot, very hot. He can ride any dog into the money. Uh, does he ride a long shot today? No, he's got two favorites and four short odds nags. He'll win, say, two races today, maybe three, one for Santa Claus. Say, here's a 50 to one shot. Altruism. Altruism? I never heard of him. I got a hunch. Well, play it, play it. Always play hunches. Let's see who this altruism is. Uh-huh. Never raced before. Then how do you know he's no good? Well, I don't, but look who he's running against. War alarm, unbeaten in three starts. Test tube, last year's gold cup runner-up. And file clerk. Oh, say, there's a hunch for you, Eddie. I ain't no file clerk, and I'm playing altruism if you don't mind. Okay, Eddie, okay. Just give me your two bucks. Is that all I can bet? Well, no, Eddie, but, gee, I don't want to play you for a sucker. How about two grand? Oh, why don't you tie that bull to a fence? Will you take two grand on altruism? On the level, Eddie? Sure as tonight's Christmas Eve. Where would you get that kind of dough? Borrow it from the boss? Well, I'll have to get Flint's okay. Let me use your phone, huh? Go ahead. Two grand. Oh, well, that's not stage money, Eddie. Neither is a hundred grand. Could you pay off? Well, sure. Flint will cover any bet I make. Hello, uh, give me Flint. See, this Flint is a very smart cookie. Maybe he don't want it. Oh, hello, Mike. Uh, this is Fink. Look, there's a man's got 2,000 bucks he wants to put on an ad called Altruism in the third of Tropical. The odds are 50 to 1. How about it? Uh-huh. Yeah, but if he wins, Mike. Uh, well, sure, I'm a gambler, but 50 to... Hey! <laughs> guy hung up. Funny guy, this Flint. Am I a gambler, he says. Well, okay, Eddie. We'll play two grand on altruism's nose for you, okay? Well, all right, but it's a lot of dough to hand over to someone I never saw before. Well, I never saw you before either, mister. Yeah, but what chance are you taking? Look, quit stalling, Eddie. Are you betting or not? Okay. Where do I get the money? Here it is. A thousand... Eleven hundred, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Makes two thousand dollars. Thanks, Eddie. <laughs> what you shaking for? Is this your life savings or something? No, no, no. This, there's lots more where this came from. Oh, of course, of course. You're independently wealthy. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's it, Fink. Gee, you're, you're, I'm into, you're a card. Oh, card. Oh, <laughs> gee, I almost forgot. Here's my card, and here's your ticket. Now, hang on to it. Might be worth a hundred grand. <laughs> uh, okay, Fink, I, uh, uh... Hey, you all right? You look kind of green. You've just been looking at too much dough, Fink. Well, uh, maybe. Now, uh, you drop around this afternoon about three. The address is on the card. Your dog is running in. Goodbye, altruism. So long, Fink. So long, Eddie. Hello? Sullivan, this is Mr. Bartholomew. Yes, sir. Speak up. Yes, sir. That's better, Sullivan. Sullivan, I want you to send a nice new hundred-dollar bill to the Second Street Mission. Put it in a plain envelope and don't write anything with it. Oh, uh, wrap it in a piece of paper so no one will know what it is at the, the post office. I want to send a nice little anonymous gift as a surprise. A nice, crisp hundred-dollar bill. Yes, sir, Mr. Bartholomew. Second Street Mission. I may send them a little something myself later. Yeah. Eddie... Eddie, it's okay. I got by. What? I'm clear. That auditor missed it. 
What's the matter? Aren't you glad? You mean you ain't going to jail? Oh, well, not this year. Are you sure, Sam? Positive, Eddie. The auditors are through. Not a chance of getting caught. Not a chance, Sam? Not a chance, Eddie. There could be a slip-up. No, 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 there couldn't. But what's the matter with you? Aren't you glad for me? Sure. Look, already I'm doing handsprings. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Of course, it, it doesn't solve things completely. You said it. I'm still short, but that's okay. Oh, sure. I'll think of something. I got a whole year. No more unknown benefactors, though. I'm very glad. Eddie, I, I don't quite get it, though. Bartholomew buttering me up. He says, we know everything is in good shape, Sam. No use putting these auditors to any more trouble. Just have them check the cash on hand, and that'll wind it up. The cash? Yeah. Sam, hand me that Dixie cup by the typewriter. Hey, sure, you, you dry? Very. How are you going to get the hundred grand back in the books? Oh, I don't know. Why? Maybe I can raise some dough. Uh, you couldn't raise a Venetian blind. Well, what are you worrying for? I'm out of a jam. And I'm in. What, what are you... What's, what's on your mind? Just two or three years, that's all. And well, now I suppose you're going to tell me you've been swiping postage stamps. Oh, no, no, no. Nothing as bad as that. Look, I'm your pal, Sam. Well, sure. I'd do anything for you. Then talk sense. Oh, I hated to think of you in Sing Sing for six months, Sam, so... I'm going there myself for a few years. What do you say? I took 2,000 bucks embedded on a 50-to-1 shot at Tropical Park, Sam. No. Yes. No. Yes, I did it. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, yes. No, tell me you're kidding me, Eddie. I did it for you, Sam, for Christmas. What? A guy don't get a chance to prove his friendship very often. Friendship? You talk of friendship at a time like this? We're both as good as in Sing Sing right now. And me the longest. I hope so. Of all the dumb tricks. And you didn't make any entries, huh? No, no. Just took it. Just... Eddie. Eddie, how'd you come to bet on a horse? You never made a bet. What bookies do you know? Here. Here's his car. He just happened in by accident. A truck should just happen by accident to run over you. Maybe he'd give it back, Sam. Oh, sure. Sure. Bookies are that way. Philanthropists. All of them. Besides, there's probably no such address as this. Oh, don't be hard on me, Sam. After all, I risked my own neck to save yours. No greater love. And maybe this horse will win. A 50 to 1? Well? Let, let me see that card. Let... Well, all we can do is try and get the dough back. He was awful nice, Sam. Oh, shut up. Nice. Look, fake an entry in the books. Then we'll pay Mr. Fink Freeze a call. Friendship. Yeah, friendship. We're in this together, pal. <laughs> Bringing you Mr. Eddie Cantor in double entry. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Happy days are here again. Jingle bells, jingle hey, bells. Hey, Donner, why the sudden switch? You were sadder than a bride's first batch of biscuits a few minutes ago. Oh, Santa changed his mind. He's sticking to tradition, and I'm going back to work. Well, good for you. It's even better for you. Santa thinks your Autolite staple batteries are so good, he's decided to bring one to every car owner. Gosh, what a wonderful way to be greeted Christmas morning. Imagine finding one of these brawny bundles of endless energy, the Autolite stay full battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use, all wrapped up in red ribbon under your tree. But speaking of Christmas greetings, friends, I have a card here, and it's addressed to you. It says, may your holiday this year be the cheeriest ever, and it's signed, the Autolite folks. To that, let me add Merry Christmas wishes from all of us on Suspense. Happy holiday to you all. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Eddie Cantor, with Sidney Miller in Double Entry, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. On the subway up to the bookie's place, I didn't say a word. I just stared at the ads and kept thinking of how I'd mess things up and wondering what Sam was thinking. The window we sat near had bars on it, and I felt I was already in jail. Well, we got to the bookies. It was a great big large the track room. is now fast at Tropical Park. Ah, well, well, if it ain't the millionaire bookkeeper. Hi, Eddie. Oh, hello, hello there, Fink. Welcome to our humble joint. 
Of course, it ain't like Hialeah. Oh, no, but it's but... as close to it as we can get in New York, I know. <laughs> this is Sam Crockett, Fink, my friend. Oh, glad to meet you, Mr. Crockett. Smart man you got working with you. Yeah. He's going to make himself a pile of dough this afternoon, aren't you, Eddie? <laughs> look, look, fella, th this is all a mistake. Huh? Eddie had no business betting $2,000 on a horse. The fact is, it wasn't his money. Well, I am surprised. You see, he was trying to help someone. So he, he helped himself to 2000 bucks, huh? Think, think, give us a break and return the money. We'll, we'll both go to jail if we don't put it back. Scratch, look, oh, boy, number six. I'm very sorry, number fellas, two. but I can't do nothing. I've turned in the dough. I just work here. I can't get that back. Oh, you've got to help us, think. Look, I'd like to, Crockett, but how can I? This is a business. Now, supposing I ask the boss... He says it's a contract. He can't back up, neither can you. Where would we be if we asked you to take your money back? Yeah, but don't you see we'll go to Sing Sing Two Fink. Two minutes to post time for the third at Tropical Place, your bets now, man. Yeah, maybe those bills were counterfeit. You could tell the cashier the dough's no good, huh? Now, how can I, Eddie? He can spot a phony from 50 yards. Look, Fink, huh? the auditors are checking our books now. All I can say is I'm very sorry, and I hope this nag wins uh, for you. But I can't do a thing about in it. The oh, we're sunk, Eddie. I'm really sorry, boys. I should have known better than to take your dough. He sounded like he meant it, Sam. Uh, so what? Come on, let's go. Ain't you interested in hearing the race over the loudspeaker? No. Well, I am. It's me who started this. I'm going to get my money's worth. Uh, tropical in the third, a correction. Sylvester is riding altruism. Did you hear that, Sam? You mean we get a jockey? Now, don't be funny. This guy, Sylvester, is hot. He's winning and two or three races a day. The third. They're away at 317. They're off, Sam. I got ears. Oh, gosh. At the quarter, it's War Alarm, Dive Bomber, Calumet Powell, Dun In, Westwood O, File Clerk, Valiant Ned. Mashy, Niblick, Timid Soul, Golden West, Test 2, Box, and Block, Early Riser, and, uh... Altruism. <laughs> no wonder you got 50 to 1. There's 50 horses. That's not a race. It's a caravan. Last place. Now, are you satisfied? Okay, Sam, let's go. Seabiscuit couldn't win in a crowd like that unless he cut across the infield. Oh, you sure pick him. Come on. What are you waiting for? I'm not waiting. Quit pushing me. Am I pushing After you? Half. Shh, shh, listen, listen. Valiant net by a length. War alarm a second. Test tube is third. Dive bomber fourth, done in, Calumet Powell, Westwood Ho, file clerk, timid soul, Golden West, early riser, mashy nipply, altruism, and uh, auction block has dropped out. That nag is taking the pause that refreshes. Well, he's come up. If enough drop out, he can win. Yeah, the race would have to last two days, huh? Why didn't they run it in heats? Well, might as well hang around till the end, huh, Sam? Well, I, in I the guess stretch. so. stretch, valiant net is still leading by a length. Test tube is second. War alarm is third. And coming up is altruism. Did he say altruism? He, he, he said it. Get the results. Hey, Porky, how about the finish? I'm going to wire it out, Frank. Sylvester! Sylvester, ride, boy, ride, uh, ride. No, don't wring your hands. It's too late to pray. The race is over. Who's the winner? Who's the winner? Oh, I know. The wire is always a minute behind. But Eddie, we've got a chance. Christmas comes but once a year. That's too close for comfort. Oh, why did Flint let me take that bet? The winner of the third of tropical is altruism. No, no, my horse. No. Yours, mine. He won. He won. Oh. Sam, he won. No, he won. Oh, like that. He won, Eddie. Well, am I a chump now? You're a champ, Eddie, a champ. Oh, it was nothing, Sam. Only a sap could do it. Thanks, Sam. Holy smoke, this does it. Yeah, think I almost forgot. You got to fork over the money. Yeah, that just about busts this joint. Look, how about calling it off? Calling the... Remember what you said about contracts? Well, yeah, if I'd have known they were switching Sylvester on that door. Come on, when do we get paid off? Well, right now, Crockett. Come on over to the cashier. Cash? Do we have to take cash? Oh, absolutely. Here, give me your ticket. Here. Now, here's the cashier at this window. 100 grand, Speed. Look, the cashier don't bat an eye. I'm going to take them up. The cops! Yep. It's a race! What am I do? the cashier! He's going out the back door! Well, the cops jugged everyone in the place. Fink and the other gamblers got away with the hundred grand, and we had to wait until Christmas morning for a hearing, but every silver lining has a rip in it. Oh, I don't see how they got away. Oh, am I sore. We sit here in the can, and they're off with all that dough. 
We were framed, Sam. The whole thing was planned. Oh, you're crazy. How think no altruism would win? You can't turn on a police raid like a, like a shower bath. Well, how are we ever going to find those guys? We won't. And if we do, it won't do us any good. Because you haven't got the ticket anymore. And even if you had, you couldn't force them to pay because bookmaking isn't legal. It's gambling. Keep on. I love to hear your ultra talk. Oh. And it fits so nicely with these surroundings. Well, you might as well get used to it. We'll be living in quarters like this for some time. Quiet, Sam. Here comes the keeper. Hmm? And he's got Fink with him. Good. He deserves to be in jail, the dirty... Hello, oh, Eddie. I got something for you. I'm sorry. I'm just not interested in tips at all. Oh, no, Eddie. You don't understand. I just come to say Merry Christmas. And this... This is for you, Eddie. For me? Oh, what is that? Open it, Eddie. Oh, yeah. Look, Sam, 2,000 bucks. 2,000 bucks? That's right. That's all I got. It's my own dough. Mike Flint blew town, so this is the best I can do, Eddie. Oh, gee. Gee, thanks, Fink. Thanks. You're a prince. Just call him Santa Claus. So there I was, back where I started, at scratch. All I had to do was to put the dough back in the cash drawer. They made us pay a $10 fine, and we got home in time for Christmas dinner. The next morning, we took the subway downtown. Sam read the paper, and I just stared at the ads as usual. Eddie, quite a story about altruism. Picture of Sylvester. Just a kid, 19. Weighs 105. Look at that ad. It says to spell it backwards. If they want you to read it that way, why didn't they turn it around? Yeah. Eddie, look. I don't know why they... Uh, what is it? Who? What is it, Sam? Look, this picture. It's Bartholomew. Where? They've arrested him. What for? Embezzlement, Eddie. But that's you, Sam. Listen to this. Bartholomew confessed to having embezzled company funds to the tune of a quarter of a million dollars when auditors discovered a shortage in cash of two thousand dollars. So that's why he was hurrying those guys around. Let me look, see. Look. What a business. Everyone in it is a crook. Hey, Sam. Sam, where are you going? Back to the police station. I'm giving myself up. Giving yourself up? But, Sam... No, Betty. I'd never sleep again if I escape scot-free. Besides, I'd like to get away from Alice for six months. But, Sam... When nobody was looking, I slipped the 2,000 bucks back into the cash drawer. And Sam, well, Sam went to the police and gave himself up. But guess what? They didn't want him. They already had their man. Sam wrote out a confession, offered to show them the books, but they just laughed at him. Called him a publicity seeker. He pleaded with them, but it was no use. Even Bartholomew called him a fool. Imagine Sam fought for the right to go to prison, and they laughed at him. Then he went to the newspapers, even to the district attorney, explaining what he'd done with the money. But they wouldn't believe him either. That's the thing that finally broke Sam's heart. No one would believe that he was the famous unknown benefactor. They told him, go on, Santa Claus. Go back to your reindeer. Sam, Sam would have preferred a few quiet months in Sing Sing breaking rocks. He could have got rid of his ulcers. He would have got away from Alice. But no. Hey, Eddie. Hand me that Dixie cup, will you? Your ulcer's bothering you again, Sam? Yeah. Yeah, something awful. Keeping Ledger straight is driving me nuts. Oh, Sam. Suspense presented by Autolite. 
tonight's star, Eddie Cantor, with Sidney Miller. Well, Eddie, suspense is a far cry from your Sunday night take-it-or-leave-it show. Oh, not so far. There's a lot of suspense when we get to the $64 question. Well, to make you feel at home here, Eddie, I've prepared a question for you to ask me. I'll bet I know the category, batteries. What else? All right. Where's the question? Right here on this slip of paper. Let's see. It reads, is there anything that uses less water than an Autolite staple battery? Now, isn't that a silly question to ask you, Harlow? Yes, it is, Eddie. The answer is so obvious. Why, Autolite stay full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. Any more questions? No, Eddie, and thank you. Friends, Autolite stay full batteries are made by Autolite, who make more than 400 other products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, and bullseye seal beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And friends, once again, Merry Christmas to all, and to all, good night. Next Thursday for Suspense, Ida Lupino will be our star. The play is called The Bullet, and it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Double Entry is an original radio play by Robert Minton. You can buy Autolite Stayful batteries, Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense debuted back in the 1940s as an audition presentation of CBS's Forecast under the direction of the legendary Alfred Hitchcock. Herbert Marshall starred in that audition broadcast and later returned to the Suspense microphones for this very special Christmas presentation. Let's listen now as Herbert Marshall stars in Back for Christmas as originally broadcast December 23rd, 1956. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, William N. Robeson. We pause now in this gayest of all seasons for a little murder. We interrupt the pleasing flow of heartwarming greetings and ageless hymns and carols for a slight case of exoricide. We turn our attention from tinsel and gay ornaments and strings of colored lights to blood as Herbert Marshall stars in Back for Christmas, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Happy, Mrs. Carpenter? Deliriously, Professor Carpenter. Well, then how about another glass of champagne? Nothing goes better with a happy bride than a glass of bubbly. Nothing? How about a happy husband? That you have. To us. To us. Forever. Darling. Oh, Herbert. I'm afraid it's all a dream, and I wake up any minute and find myself back in that drab little bookshop in Leicester Street, searching for obscure volumes for absent-minded professors. Oh, so that's what you thought of me. Oh, not you, Herbert. You were different. I felt it the first time you came into the place. Premonition, second sight. You knew at that minute, I suppose, that I would whisk you off to America and make you my wife. <laughs> well, not exactly, but I'm awfully glad you did. Do you think you like America? I love it. I thought perhaps after this lecture tour is over, I might try to find a connection at some college or other and just stay on. What would you say to that? I say, wherever you are is where I want to be. Uh -huh. Now, who in the world... 
Who is it? Bellboy, sir. Just a minute. Yes, what is it? A letter, sir, for Mrs. Carter. For oh, Mrs.? Here, let me have it. Here. Thank you, sir. A letter for Mrs. Carpenter? Herbert, you were a widower, weren't you? I mean, Hermione isn't still alive. Well, good heavens, no. But that letter. No one back in England knows that I'm married. Uh, let's forget it, shall we? And have another glass of wine. I've often wondered what she was like. Who? Hermione. You never told me anything about her. I'd just as soon forget her, but... She's not an easy woman to forget. Dominating. Always managing things, the house, my wardrobe, my friends. You might say she managed herself to death. Yes, Hermione. What on earth are you doing down here in the cellar? Putting the finishing touches on this wine bin. Have you taken leave of your senses? Yes, I dare say you have. Look at you, the epitome of the absent-minded professor. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Well, I would. Whatever would become of you if I weren't here to look after you? I wonder. And well, you might. Have you any idea what today is? Why, Tuesday, I believe. Indeed. And what is going to happen today? Well, according to your plans, we are flying to America on the nine o'clock plane. Precisely. And the good knows are coming in for tea in half an hour. And here you are digging a hole in the cellar. It is not a hole. It's a wine bin. Well, it looks more like a grave to me. Yes, Hermione. Now, upstairs with you now and get into some clean things. Yes, Hermione. I've already dismissed the cook. You'll have to get the tea things ready while I'm taking my bath. Yes, Hermione. Oh, dear, such a bother to go to. Closing up the house and all, and then, then having to open it again when we get back for Christmas. Back for Christmas, back for Christmas. Must you keep saying that? Well, why not? We are coming back for Christmas, aren't we? Well, supposing I were offered a position in an American university. Oh, nonsense. Well, they did ask me to come to lecture. That means something. Well, not very much. Americans will pay to hear any foreigner deliver a lecture once. But there's no use building dream castles, Herbert. Nobody's going to offer you a fortune in America. Of course, the extra money you will get will be very handy when we arrive back for Back Christmas. for Christmas, yes. Precisely. And it's no good you're making a joke of it. Oh, but heaven knows where you'd be today if I hadn't got a sense of time. Yes, her man. Now get a move on. And be sure to straighten up the sitting room and get the tea things out. The second best. The good nose will understand. Yes, Hermione. I'm going up to have my bath now. Call me when they arrive. Yes, Hermione. Yes, Hermione. Yes, Hermione. Twenty years of it. Twenty years of Hermione being right. Twenty years of personal management. Down to the smallest detail of which necktie to wear and how many minutes one's eggs should be cooked. Twenty years of slow strangulation, which would only have ended in dull death if it had not been for Marion. At least Marion was one detail that Hermione could not manage, could not even imagine. The mousy proprietor of a bookstore, proper, ever so intellectual with her heavy horn-rimmed spectacles, and the absent-minded professor. But such things do happen sometimes, as they did that afternoon last summer. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Isn't Miss Markham about? <laughs> right, I... Oh, ble bless me. Is it you, Miss Markham? Yes, Professor Carpenter. Oh, what did I say? I didn't recognize you without your glasses. Why, I thought you couldn't see a thing without them. I can't. But you're not wearing them. Oh, yes, I am. Contact lenses. Well, I must say. Must say what, Professor? Oh, I, I never realized what, what lovely eyes you have. Thank you, Professor. And that frock, it is so becoming. Well, once I decided to get rid of the horn rim glasses, it wasn't too difficult to get out of tweeds. It's a delightful transformation. 
from cocoon to butterfly. Yes. Butterflies are not nearly as lonely as cocoons. You're lonely? I'm completely alone since my father died. Did you never think of marrying? My father was a very remarkable man. I never found anyone who could measure up to him, so... Uh, what a pity. How long have you been alone, Professor? Alone? Well, I knew you were a widower, of course, the first time I saw you. A widower? Oh, I can always tell. It was the same with my father. There's a certain sadness in a man's eyes. A sweet sadness, I think, when he's been married and then... A widower? I never thought of it quite that way. Oh, I have your books. B books? Well, yes, the ones you ordered last week. That's what you came by for, wasn't it? Yes, I suppose it is. I'd quite forgotten. The Phototomy of Phalloid Gamma Phytites and Coniferous Shrubs of North America. Uh, those are the ones you ordered, aren't they? Yeah, yes, thank you. You're, you're very kind, Miss Markham. Why kind, Professor Carpenter? Well, not many young ladies in bookshops who go out of their way to look up rare books for an old professor of botany. <laughs> Why, you're not old, Professor Carpenter. Really, you look... <sighs> Besides, I adore botany. It's my particular hobby. Oh, really? You never told me that before, Miss Markham. <laughs> I was afraid to. You always intimidated me. You seemed so preoccupied. Yes, I suppose I did. Well, you might be interested in some specimens of alpine polyanthes that were just sent to me by a friend in Switzerland. Switzerland? Well, I used to go there always for my holidays before the war. You like Switzerland? Oh, every part of it. The lakes, the mountains, the beautiful spring flowers, especially the flowers. It seems that we have quite a lot in common, Miss Markham. I'm sorry we haven't talked before. I am too. But perhaps we can make up for it in the future. Indeed, we shall. So had it begun, and one thing led to another, as they will with two lonely people. The invitation to lecture in America made a happy ending possible. While Hermione proceeded with her plans for the trip, I made my own plans, quite different plans. Now they were all but complete. Everything was proceeding according to schedule, my schedule. Even Hermione, drawing her bath upstairs, gave me the opportunity to phone Marion. Hello? Hello, dear. Darling. Are you all packed? Almost. Not much time left. I know. Excited? Breathless. Keith Rowe, Aerodrome, half past eight. I'll be there. I love you, Marion. And I, you, Herbert. Herbert! I'm sorry, I've got to ring off now, darling. I'll see you at the aerodrome. Tonight and forever, darling. Goodbye for a little. Goodbye. Father! Were you talking on the phone just now? Yes, Hermione. Well, whoever was it? Hmm? Freddie. Freddie Sinclair. Did I hear you say something about seeing somebody at the aerodrome? Uh, why, uh, yes. I, I, old uh, Freddie said he might possibly get out to see us off tonight. Well, that seems very peculiar. Then all of your friends are peculiar. Yes, Hermione. I thought I told you to change your clothes before the guests arrive. Yes, Hermione. Never mind, never mind. Somebody just drove up. Don't let them in. Yes, Hermione. Herbert. Yes, Hermione. Look out the window. There's Professor and Mrs. Goodno. But who's that with them? <laughs> Why, it's... Uh... Precisely. Ready, Sinclair. Peculiar you should have been talking to him on the phone just now, when here he is coming up the walk. Yes, isn't it? But then, as you say, Hermione, all of my friends are peculiar. Not half so peculiar as you. Digging in the cellar an hour before we leave for America. Just look at yourself. Yes, Hermione. But go and let them in. Yes, Hermione. Open the door and stop saying yes, Hermione. I think, my dear, I've said it for the last time. Let's pause for just a moment. Herbert Marshall will return in this chilling tale of suspense right after these messages. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Gangbusters. The Adventures of the Saints. 
The preceding memories are brought to you by Radio Spirits, the leading supplier of classic radio programs and nostalgia merchandise. Hi, this is Fred Foley. For a free catalog listing thousands of classic radio programs available on cassettes and CDs, call toll-free 1-800-RADIO-48. That's 1-800-723-4648. To find out more about old-time radio, old-time video, and the pleasures of listening to audiobooks, visit the Audiobook Club website, www.audiobookclub.com, where you can get four audiobooks for just one penny. And now, let's return to Herbert Marshall, starring in Back for Christmas, a tale of suspense. Back for Christmas. Hermione was so positive we would be back for Christmas. That afternoon, pouring tea for a few friends who were coming to say last minute farewells, she kept reiterating it. Now, mind you, Hermione, don't let those Americans lure your husband with one of their fat university jobs. We absolutely must have you with us for Christmas. Oh, uh, we will be back, I promise you. Oh, it's not absolutely certain, of course. Herbert, what do you mean it's not certain? Of course it's certain. After all, Herbert Elroy, you've contracted to lecture for only two months. Quite right, Freddie, but then, of course, anything may happen. <laughs> well, Herbert adores being unpredictable. Now, what other man would decide today, the very day, mind you, before leaving for America, to dig a great hole in the floor in the cellar? In the cellar? <laughs> for a wine bin. He's been talking about putting a wine bin in the cellar for the last two months, but he never got around to working on it until the last few days. A wine bin? Whatever for? It's the only way to store wines, you know, in the cellar. Even temperature, all that sort of thing. Indeed. In that damp, they'll all turn. A proper wine bin should be made of concrete. Mine will serve its purpose, I believe. Oh, there you are, my dear. Men. They're impractical little boys at heart, all of them. Oh, I don't know, Hermione. <laughs> Indeed they are. But not all of them are fortunate enough to have as practical a wife as you, Hermione. Oh, not really. Oh, yes, my dear. I know I could never have done what you've done. I'd just go to pieces. Imagine, Freddy, all the things one has to do before such a journey, and Hermione's done them all, all by herself. Oh, yes, Hermione is quite remarkable. Someone had to do them, and Herbert's no help. He's a lucky man to have you, my dear. You realize that, don't you, Herbert? Oh, indeed I do. You have no idea how well I realize it. <laughs> uh, well, we really must be going. So soon. Oh, yes. I'm sure even you have at least a few last-minute things you must attend to. But don't forget, you'll be back for Christmas, if you may count on it. <laughs> bon voyage, then, my dear Hermione. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye, Hermione. Oh, not yet, Freddy. We'll make our farewells at the aerodrome. At the aerodrome? Why, yes. Herbert said you phoned to say you'd see us off at Heathrow. I phoned? Yes. Just a few minutes before you arrived. But I couldn't have. I, I've been out for a drive all the afternoon. Oh, come, come, Freddy. You'll be as well ill up. <laughs> I'll say, look here, old chap. I don't know what you're trying to... You see? You see? Herbert can't even lie well. He's red as a beetroot. <laughs> Aren't you ashamed of yourself, Herbert, stringing poor Hermione along like that? Well, I suppose the game is up. I, it, um, it wasn't Freddy I was talking to, Hermione. Well, I don't see how it could have been. No, I was, uh, well, 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 it was about a little surprise I was planning for you. How sweet. And I have a surprise for you, too, Herbert, when I bring you back for Christmas. <laughs> Merciful heavens, I thought they'd never leave. Oh, we still have plenty of time. Well, not if we're to leave the house in proper condition for our return. Now, Herbert, after you get that dust cloth over the dam port, you can help me with the tea things in the scullery. No. Oh, no, no, not that way. Herbert, you're leaving wrinkles. Well, who's to see it, my dear? Well, I can see it, and I don't like it that way. Yes, sir. Very well. How's this? Well, a little better. Now, now, let's get at the tea things. There's a dear. Oh, Herbert. Yes? 
was all this nonsense about a surprise for me? Oh, well, if I told you, then it wouldn't be a surprise, would it? Oh, come now, Herbert. We are too old to play children's games. What is it? Well, if you'll come down to the cellar, I'll give it to you. In the cellar? Why in the cellar? Because that's where it is. Oh, really, Herbert, you don't make any sense. Now, help me with the tea things. But you will come down to the cellar. Well, later, Herbert, if this time. Time. There had to be time. But Hermione was meticulous. And each cup to be washed and dried just so, and put away in the cupboard in its accustomed place just so. And the silver had to be carefully wiped and put away in its plush lined box just so. And then, once more, all the dust covers had to be straightened and the windows checked to be sure they were locked. And the time was running short. <sighs> no, I think that's everything. Everything but your surprise. Will you come down to the cellar now? Well, can't you bring it up here? Oh, no, no, that would be quite impossible. Oh, it's so dusty down there, and I... Well, I'm all dressed for the trip. I know, but it'll only take a minute, and you'll find it quite worthwhile, I'm sure. Oh, very well. She went ahead down the cellar stairs. As we reached the bottom, I silently lifted a small crowbar from a nail in the wall. She stood in the middle of the cellar, peering around in the ill-lit gloom. But I don't see anything but that silly hole you've dug. That's it. It's in there. Where? Look closer. Step closer to it. Right to the edge. Really, Herbert. <laughs> now do you see it? A little large for a wine bin. But just right for a grave. <laughs> Back for Christmas? No, Hermione. No, Hermione. I'll never be back. You've planned it so well, Hermione. You're so predictable, so practical. Even to typing your letters and signing them with a neat cryptic H that I have learned to copy. I'll be your amanuensis. I'll write your friends for you, Hermione. Through me, you will tell them we won't be back for Christmas. And then you will tell them how much you like America and that you persuaded me to accept a teaching position. You will tell them that you may decide to settle there permanently. And then the letters will come less and less frequently until at last they will hear from me. And I will break the news to them that you have died in America. Then I will have my solicitors put this empty house with its sad associations up for sale. And that will be the end of the matter, Hermione. Back for Christmas? No, Hermione. No, no, no. No. No, no. Not now. Go away, whoever you are, go away. Did I leave the front door unlocked? No, no. I see Herbert. Where is Hermione? Just keep calm, keep quiet. They won't look down here in the cellar. Keep calm, they'll go away. Where can they be? Well, perhaps they popped around with Adele. We must see them. Janet's coming on our way back. We can be back by half past six. Half past six. There's still time. After that, it was easy. Put the finishing touches to the wine bin. Dress fast. Get out of the house before 6.30. Take the tube to Waterloo Air Terminal and the airline's bus to Heathrow, all according to plan, Hermione's plan. But from here on, my plan. Announcing the arrival of BOAC Flight 14 from Rome, Calcutta, and Melbourne. Passengers will please report to customs. Darling. At the end oh, of the Herbert. Right on time, my dear. Shall we check in? Whatever you say. Uh, scared? I never felt forth. safer in my life. Ever been on a plane before? No, you? My first time, too. Oh, how nice. To enjoy your first experience together. I was worried. About what? Well, you having been married once, 
Nothing would be new to you. It will be new. All of it. Is everything all right? Uh, yes, thank you. Would you care for a pillow, Mrs. Carpenter? Well, uh, were you speaking to me? Yes, Mrs. Carpenter. Would you care for a pillow? Uh, no, no thanks. I don't believe so. Well, if you want anything, just ring the bell over your seat. Thank you. Herbert? Yes, dear? She called me Mrs. Carpenter. That's right. But I'm not yet. Well, you will be tomorrow, this time. But how does she know? Well, that's the way our tickets read, Mr. and Mrs. Carpenter. Why? I wanted you to get used to being Mrs. Carpenter straight off. Oh, Herbert, you're a dear. You think of everything. <laughs> Can I help you, sir? Oh, yes, please. Professor and Mrs. Carpenter, we have reservations, I believe. Oh, yes. We've been expecting you, sir. Now, uh, boy, uh, take Professor and Mrs. Carpenter's luggage up to this suite. You know, uh, frankly, Mrs. Carpenter, you're quite a surprise. Your uh, letter reserving the rooms was so thorough, I was expecting an older, more forbidding sort of person. My letter reserving the rooms? Oh, I... I wrote the letter, my dear, and I... I signed it, Mrs. Herbert Carpenter, just as a joke. Oh, what a cunning old fox you are, Herbert. <laughs> now that I think of it, I am, Robin. Well, Mrs. Carpenter, we might as well kill the bottle, as they say here in America. Darling, you'll make me tipsy. That's what a bride should be, just a little tipsy. <laughs> Herbert, this letter the bellboy just brought seems to be a bill of some sort from mm -hmm. a building contractor in Kensington. Well, oh, some mistake, no doubt. And addressed to me? Well, give it here and we'll get to the bottom of the matter. Hmm. Madam, this is to acknowledge your order together with the keys to your house in Ronston Place. Our men had no difficulty in finding the place where your husband had begun the excavation in the cellar. But apparently he changed his mind at the last moment and filled it in again. What is it, Herbert? Our men will begin digging tomorrow, and you may rest assured that it'll be a professional concrete line job and will be completed in ample time for your surprise Christmas present to your husband. We are happy to be conspirators with you in this thoughtful gesture and hope that Professor Carpenter will be pleased with our construction of his wine bin. Very truly yours, Paul Holt and Sons Contractors. What does it mean, Herbert? It means that Hermione was right. I will be back for Christmas. Suspense. In which Herbert Marshall starred in John Collier's story, Back for Christmas. Suspense is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Heard in tonight's cast were Irene Tedrow, Ellen Morgan, Paula Winslow, Ben Wright, and Jack Moyles. The musical score was composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. And that was Back for Christmas, a tale of suspense starring Herbert Marshall from December 23rd, 1956. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. We who are in the business of keeping you in suspense find ourselves in a quandary at this time of the year. The elements of suspense, murder, mayhem, and macabre mischief are awkwardly out of place at this festival of peace and love. Yet that first Christmas was full of suspense. 
There was the problem of lodgings for the delicate mother that chill evening when there was no room at the inn. And there was great mystery when suddenly the star appeared in the east. Finally, there was the magnificent climax and happy ending when the three kings of the Orient arrived at last bearing gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. We feel that we cannot improve upon this tale, so we will bring you another, along with our best wishes for a most merry Christmas. Listen, listen then, as Mr. Raymond Burr stars in Out for Christmas, which begins in just a moment. Here's actress Joan Bennett. It's terrible to try to act with a dreadful cold. To feel better quickly, I take four-way cold tablets, the fast way to relieve nasty cold distress. Yes, tests of four leading cold tablets proved four-way fastest acting of all. Amazing four-way starts in minutes to relieve aches, pains, headache, reduce fever, calm upset stomach, also overcomes irregularity. When you catch cold, try my way. Take four-way cold tablets, the fast way to relieve cold distress. Four-way, 29 and 59 cents. Here's a word about another fine product of Grove Laboratories. Had dandruff for years? Now get rid of it in three minutes with Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Three minutes with Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep unsightly dandruff away forever. Apply Fitch before wetting hair. Rub in one minute. Add water. Lather one minute. Then rinse one minute. Every trace of dandruff goes down the drain. Three minutes with Fitch. Embarrassing dandruff's gone. Fitch can also leave hair up to 35% brighter. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today. And now, Out for Christmas, starring Mr. Raymond Burr, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I hadn't figured on being out for Christmas, but my prison record paid off. Takes a lot of good behavior to knock time off and a Armed robbery and assault rap, but I was a good boy, model prisoner. Took everything they threw at me with a... Well, not exactly with a smile. I don't smile much. But I took it without griping. So I'm out for Christmas. And Christmas is as good a time as any for what I gotta do. The town looked cruddy. Got phony tin Christmas trees and the lampposts along the main drag and colored lights all over the joint and Christmas carols screeching at you from loudspeakers everywhere. Even the saloons got red and green streamers all over the place and the bar mirrors all frosted black snow. The big bowl of slop called Tom and Jerry they're pushing. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, uh, what'll it be? A little Christmas cheer? A uh, hot Tom and Jerry, maybe? Ain't you got any whiskey? Oh, sure. We got whiskey. Give me a straight shot. Okay. Can't you get anything on that jute box but them Christmas carols? What's the matter? Don't you like carols? Oh, they stink. <laughs> you won't think so after you get a couple of belts under your belt. Do you think so? Sure, it's Christmas, man. Yeah, so I heard. <laughs> oh, that tastes good. Real good. Say, you look sort of familiar. Uh, don't I know you from someplace? I was wondering how long it'd take. Yeah, the voice is familiar. Your eyes sort of... Joe, Joe what? Joe, I heard you was going to get out soon. Charlie Jones told me. But I didn't know you'd be out for Christmas. Yeah, they got big-hearted. Say, you put on a little weight. Yeah, that's why I didn't recognize you. 30 pounds, prison child. But you look real good, Joe. Real good. Yeah. Hey, where is Charlie? He been in tonight? Mm, not yet, but he'll be around probably. Gotta see him. You know where he's living at? Yeah, he's got a room over on 4th Street. Room? I figured he'd be living in a flop house. Oh, not Charlie. He's doing okay since he got out. Got a steady job. How about you, Joe? You got a job lined up? Yeah, I got a job lined up. A uh, good job? It'll be good. As good as I can make it. minute shopping really got you down? Are you dashing and prancing all over the town? You bought a lot of presents and you still have lots to go? Well, go, 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 get a Scripto. You don't have to know a size. You don't worry about the fit. A new Scripto pen or pencil always makes a hit for mom or dad or sister, Aunt Jane or Uncle Joe. Go, 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 get a Scripto. Go, 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 get a Scripto. Get a Scripto. 
Here's the easy, convenient way to finish all your Christmas shopping in a matter of minutes with Scripto pens and pencils available at stores everywhere. All Scriptos costing a dollar or more are handsomely gift boxed. See the famous Scripto satellite. The satellite outwrites any other pen you've ever used. Costs only one ninety-five. Enjoy one-stop gift shopping. Go go go! Get a Scripto. Give a Scripto. Scripto. And now, starring Mr. Raymond Burr, Act Two of Out for Christmas. This room and house where Charlie was staying loused up for Christmas. There was a moth-eaten poinsettia wreath in the door and red and green lights in the landlady's window. Charlie's room was on the fourth floor at the back. Joe! Yeah. Oh, so they let you out for Christmas. Yeah. Well, come on in. <laughs> Gee, it's good to see you, Joe. <laughs> good to see you, Charlie. Say, what the... What you got there? Oh, that's an electric train. Just a minute, I'll turn it off. Electric train? What for? Oh, my sister's kid. That's all he talks about for Christmas. An electric train. <laughs> so I got him one at a discount at the place where I work, but I wanted to see if it works okay. You know how it is. Yeah. So what's the idea of the Christmas tree? Well, uh, living by myself and all, I thought I'd have my, my own tree. <laughs> it's just a little one. You lost your marbles? Oh, it's Christmas, Joe. <laughs> the guys in cell block four ought to see you now playing with electric trains into your own Christmas tree. Well, I bet they'd like to be doing the same thing. Not me. Did you check up on Malloy like I asked you to? Yeah. Yes, he's still on the police force. Good. You got a gun? No, no. I, I don't have no use for guns anymore. Know where I can get one? Well, sure. I guess I could locate one. Well, I told you to. In my last letter, I told you. Get a gun for me, I said. I know, Joe, but... Look, pal, I thought that... Well, I hope maybe you'd change your mind. Charlie, from the day he testified against me, I swore I'd get him. His testimony did it, you know. That's what convicted me. He sent me up. He had to testify the way he did. He didn't have to be so convincing. But, Joe, what good will it do? You'll only get the chair. Uh, I'm not afraid of the chair. I've seen enough of life. It stinks. I ain't in love with it. I'd just as soon leave it so long as I take that rat with me. But it ain't only him, Joe. What do you mean? He's married now. Are you kidding? What kind of a dizzy broad would want him? You ain't gonna like this, Joe. Ain't gonna like what? The dizzy broad that married him is Lucille. Lucille. My Lucille. That's right. I'm sorry, Joe. Yeah. Funny. Yeah, it's real funny. She wrote me. She she couldn't wait for me no longer. You remember when I got the letter. I remember. But she didn't say who it was. She never answered my letters after that. Oh, that lousy double cross. Well, you went up for 10 to 20, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, I guess she never... Counted on me making it an eight and time off for good behavior. But eight years is a long time for a young girl to wait, Joe. Mike Malloy's a fine guy to throw me over for. Well, well, makes it dandy. Double dandy. It'll be a pleasure to kill them both. Oh, how can you talk that way, Joe? It's Christmas. Christmas is for people who don't know no better. Kids and idiots. Oh, Joe, listen to me now. Forget all about Malloy and Lucille. You got a chance to make a new life for yourself. Like I'm doing. I can get you a job where I'm working. I'm sure I can. What are you doing? I'm Santa Claus in the toy department at Brighton's department store. There ain't no future in that. You're going to be out of work day after tomorrow. No, I'm not. They promised to keep me on. Doing what? Minding the reindeer? Well, Mr. Brighton believes in giving guys like us a chance. Now, that's why I'm sure that you can get a job there. You come down tomorrow and talk to him. I'll talk to him after Christmas. Hey, good. Oh, say, how about coming over to my sister's house for Christmas dinner day after tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah, I might even do that. Good. You see, Joe, there ain't no sense in carrying around hatred in your heart, especially at Christmas time. So let Malloy and Lucille have their Christmas in peace. Oh, they'll have their Christmas all right. Their last Christmas. 
But then it'll be your last one, too. Uh-huh. I just got to figure different. Never mind the gun. I'll get my own gun tomorrow. But there is one thing I want from you. What's that, Joe? Tomorrow night, I want to borrow your Santa Claus suit. Holiday hustle make you queasy, stomach nervous and uneasy, then... Doodle, you know about the little white tablet in the little green pocket row. Just a waiting for the moment when you need them to bring your acid indigestion under control. Tums are the little white tablets in the little green pocket row. Tums for the tummy. T-U-M-S. Bring relief quicker than you'd ever guess. Best for any kind of acid distress. Keep them handy in the pocket row. Keep your tummy under Tums control. Yes, during the busy, bustling season, get quick relief from annoying acid indigestion. Always carry Tums, ten cents, three-roll pack, a quarter. Or get the new six-roll pack with free metal carrier, 49 cents. And now, starring Mr. Raymond Burr, Act Three of Out for Christmas. day, I did my Christmas shopping for a gun. That night, I wrapped Charlie's Santa Claus suit into a bundle, took a bus out to the subdivision where Malloy and Lucille had a house. I ducked into an alley behind the supermarket and pulled on the red suit, whiskers and all. It was going to be so easy, I had to laugh. You couldn't want a better disguise on Christmas Eve for murder. I didn't have any trouble finding the house, a little box of a house like all the others in the street and decorated with colored lights like all the others. Nobody saw me, even if they had. Who has a better right than Santa Claus to be on the streets Christmas Eve? The gun felt cold in my pocket as I closed my fist around it and pushed the bell. Even it was wired for Christmas. Yes? Merry Christmas. Why, it's Santa Claus. Aren't you going to ask me in? Well, my husband isn't home yet. That's all right. I'll come in and wait for him. I don't understand. If you don't believe in Santa Claus anymore, Lucille, you ought to... Who are you? Don't you recognize my voice? You... You sound like... Joe. Oh, no. Good old Joe. He was going to wait for me. No matter how long it took. Joe, I thought you were... In the cooler for keeps, uh uh-uh. I told you I'd come back for you. Here I am. Well, you're too late, Joe. Yeah, so I hear. How come you didn't wait, Lucille? I... I fell in love. With the guy who sent me to prison... Well, no good cop. He didn't send you to prison, Joe. You were guilty. I'd have beat the rap if he hadn't testified the way he, he did. He had to testify that way. He was only telling the truth. Yeah, so he could get me out of the way and steal my girl. Joe, you've got things all twisted. It all happened afterwards. I only met him at your trial. We fell in love afterwards. When I couldn't protect myself. Oh, Joe, I- I'm sorry. It just happened. You're telling me. Where is the fuzz? Who? The copper, your old man. He's still on duty. Working overtime to put the arm on some stiff on Christmas Eve? When will he be home? I I expect him any time now. Good. I'm going to be glad to see him. Why, when you hate him so? You see, I... I promised him something. Didn't he ever tell you? No. I promised to kill him when I got out. Joe. Tonight's the night, see? What do you mean? You've got a gun. Sure, I got a gun. And I'm going to use it. I'm both of you. Both of us? You both double-crossed me. I could kill you first, but... I think I'll wait till your old man comes home. 
Ought to be interesting to see how he acts. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if he tried to make a deal with me. A deal? Yeah, like shoot my wife but let me go free. Oh, what a terrible thing to say. You'll see what kind of a creep you married. Joe, do it then. But do it because I ask you. Kill me and let him go. Ah, I come to get you both. And I'm going to get you both. Together. Um, how about some music while we're waiting? Turn on the radio. I... Go on, turn it on. He... He made you happy, Lucy? Yeah, Joe. Very. You made him happy? I hope so. That's nice. Because tonight you're both going to make me happy. By becoming very dead. It's too loud. What's that? Oh, little Lucy, the radio woke her. You got kids? Yeah. Where are you going? I had to look in on her and quiet Don't try nothing funny. I'll be right behind you. Oh, there now, honey. There, there. It's all right. Mommy just turned the radio on too loud. I'm scared, Mommy. Uh, Mommy! Look behind you. It's Santa Claus. Yes, dear, Santa Claus. Oh, Mikey! Mikey, wake up! Mikey, look, it's Santa Claus! Santa Claus? Santa Claus? I want to see Santa Claus! jam the gun back into my pocket before those two kids were wide awake and all over me, grabbing at my red suit, pulling at my phony whiskers, pushing me into a chair. Did you bring me a present, Santa Claus, did you? Oh, you ain't your Santa. Sit down, Mikey. You don't want to sit on his lap. Oh, see, oh, get rid of these kids. Oh, I can't. Where's my present, Santa? Well, I... Well, what did I... you do with the reindeers? What did you do with the reindeers? Well, they're, they're parked outside, Mikey, uh, uh, on the roof. Did you huh? come down the chimney? Oh, yeah, sure. Why aren't you closer? Didn't the fire burn you? Well, no, you... See, it, it, it's an asbestos suit. Now, really? oh, listen, you you kids ought to go back to bed. Oh, no, Santa, please. We want our presents. I want to see the reindeer. Well, see, you've got to get them off me. Oh, I'm so excited, Joe. They've never entertained Santa Claus before. Oh, I ain't no Santa Claus. To them you are. Yeah. Santa Claus? Well, what, what? I want to kiss you. Me too, me too. Don, uh, uh, all right, you kids. Now, 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 listen to me. Yes, Santa Claus, I'm listening. Me too. Well, you gotta go back to bed now. Well, I want my present. Me too. You, you'll get your presents in the morning when you wake up. There, they'll be under the tree. You promise? I promise. Now, now you run off to bed. Now, I can't. I, I gotta get going. Oh, you, you wouldn't want the other boys and girls to miss their presents because I've been goofing off with you, would you? Oh, no, that wouldn't be fair. Uh, all right, then. Off to bed you go. All right. Come on, Mikey. Merry Christmas, Santa Claus. Me, too. Yeah. Merry Christmas, kids. And, uh, good night. Good night. 
Come on, Mikey. Oh, Joe. Don't let her forget that. Yeah. Neither will I. Merry Christmas, honey. I'm sorry I'm late. Hey, what's this? It's Joe Watson, Mike. Joe Watson? What the devil are you doing here? He came to kill us. What? Take it easy, Mike. Here's my gun. You... You changed your mind? Uh, Your kids changed my mind. They thought he was really Santa Claus, darling. They they were so excited. Well, Mike, you, you can send me up again. Better to go back for a parole violation, I guess, than for murder. Well, uh, wait a minute. Uh, we got to have a complaining witness. You want to make a complaint, Lucille? No, Mike. I want to thank Joe for giving the kids the best Christmas of their lives. Well, I haven't any complaint then. Merry Christmas, Joe. I still say Christmas is for people who don't know no better. Like kids and idiots. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Suspense. In which Raymond Burr starred in Out for Christmas. Written, produced, and directed by William N. Robeson. In just a moment, the names of the supporting players and a word about next week's story of suspense. Christmas Eve on CBS Radio, Bing Crosby invites you to celebrate Christmas with the world on our fourth annual Christmas Sing with Bing. With Bing as your guide and CBS Radio as your magic carpet, you'll visit Rome to hear the Vatican Choir. There, too, you'll hear the sound of the bells of St. Peter's as they ring for the holiday mass. On our Christmas Sing with Bing, you'll visit New York and Salt Lake City, Canada, Australia, Holland, France, even places like Hawaii, Alaska, and the Fiji Islands, where carolers and choirs will be waiting to sing the traditional Christmas songs with you. To add to the excitement this year, Mrs. Bing Crosby, Catherine Grant, will be at her husband's side. Whether you spend Christmas Eve at home or out on the highway heading for a holiday destination, join us right here on CBS Radio as most of these same stations present our fourth annual Christmas Sing with Bing. Supporting Raymond Burr and Out for Christmas were Joan Banks, Lillian Bayef, Charles Seal, Carl Swenson, Howard McNear, and Dick Beals. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with Mr. Frank Lovejoy, starring in the 32nd of December. Another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. This is the CBS Radio Network. to keep you in suspense. The time, Christmas 1958. The place, Korea. The story, a Korean Christmas carol written for suspense by George Bamber. Sounds good, doesn't it? They hear kids singing, I mean. I can't understand the language, but I know what they mean. 
He sounds so fresh and full of promise. Almost as if they knew. But uh, then I'm getting ahead of myself. The name's Connolly, PFC Larry Connolly. I'm a soldier in Korea. I was sent here just about a year ago, this time. And that's where this strange story begins. Christmas, 1958. Christmas was, for me, that year miserable. I'd been stuck on guard the night before, and so I planned to stay in bed the next day and forget about Christmas. I hadn't counted on my first sergeant. Since I was the first man he came to in the barracks, it's only logical that I should be the man he picks to drive a truck all the way to Seoul and back. It was night by the time I got on the road headed back from Seoul. It started to snow. Big flakes coming down soft at first, then so thick and fast I could hardly see. I was just over that first range of mountains. I was starting on the twisting, slippery way down when I saw him. The sight of him scared me wide awake. He was standing bareheaded, the wind whipping the snow in his hair around his face. When he raised his thumb, I had the strangest feeling... He'd been expecting me, almost as if it were unnecessary, as if he knew I'd stop. You want a lift? I'm going as far as Camp Santa Barbara. Well, where's that? Do you mean, where's that? Everybody knows where Camp Santa Barbara is. Don't stand there with the door open. Hop in. All right. Yeah. Well, you picked a lousy place to hitchhike. Just didn't stop. Oh, thanks. What happened to your gloves? Your hands look half frozen. Gloves? Well, I, uh, must have lost them. Must have, don't you know? <laughs> uh, oh, yes. Uh, yeah, sure, I must have left them laying on the counter of the PX back there. With your hat back there, too? No, no, I lost my hat in the dark. I fell. I suppose that's why your uniform's muddy and your jacket's torn. Oh, yes, yes, that's right, of course. I, uh, was walking along the edge of the road and I slipped in the dark... And I slid halfway down the embankment before I could stop. I see you managed to hang on to your bag. Oh, yeah, I can't afford to lose that. It's important. I'm late as it is. What outfit you from? Third Recon, 7th Division Infantry. Infantry? Throw artillery up this way. The infantry stationed about seven miles back. You're heading in the wrong direction. Yeah, well, Third Recon is a special detachment. We're off in the hills, all by ourselves. It's just off this road. I've heard of it before. My name's Connolly. Larry Connolly. What's yours? Oh, thanks. Mine's Richard Dombrowski. Good to know you, Dombrowski. Uh -huh. Say, look, if you can let go of that bag long enough, I'll let you wear my gloves till your hands warm up. Oh, no. Thanks. That's all right. I'll put them in my pockets. Say, is it okay if I set my bag on the floor? Oh, sure. No sweat. Mm -hmm. Say, you don't have a cigarette, do you? I'm fresh out. Well, I don't know. I... Wait a minute. Yeah, here's some. Uh, let me light it for you, though. You watch the road. I saw a whole truckload of troops disappear over that curve up ahead. Killed all but two. Yeah? When uh, that happened? 1951. 1951? Yep. You were here when the war was on. I guess you could say that. Tell me, Dombrowski, what were you doing Christmas Day? That they didn't send you all the way to Seoul with an empty truck on a wild goose chase. <laughs> That's what I did today. What did you do seven years ago? Well, you see those lights up ahead? That's the village of Chungju ri We marched through there the day before Christmas. Were you scared? Oh, I think everybody's scared. Hey, hey, look out. You'll burn yourself. What's the matter? A cigarette burned all the way down to your fingers. Oh. Isn't it burning you? Well, that? No, no. I, I guess it burned itself out before it got to my skin. Anyway, you see that hill over there? Well, Christmas Day, 1951, my platoon was all dug in around that hill. No kidding. Mm-hmm. We went out on a patrol from that hill. And that was one time I was plenty scared. As a matter of fact, it happened just seven years ago tonight. It hadn't snowed that day, but there was snow on the ground. I can remember because the guys were joking that at least we had a white Christmas. And what a Christmas it was. As I 
said. It was quiet Christmas Day, 1951. We were sitting around in our halls waiting for the fun which we knew would begin the next day. They'd managed to get hot turkey up to us, so we were relatively comfortable and happy until Brownie, our squad leader, came back from a talk with the old man. All right, I'll take the first five. The old man wants us to go out and have a look around. Come on, come on, come on knock it off. Get rid of your dog tags and canteens. Anything that might rattle or make a noise. We won't be gone long, but we're moving light. Hey, Whitey, might as well leave your helmet here. We want to move quiet. But, Sarge, it's too cold to go out without a hat. Ah, uh, cut the comedy, Walker. We moved out on schedule just as night was falling. And with the night came the cold. We moved rapidly along the valley for about an hour or so when Brownie stopped and raised his hand. All right, you men, hold it up. Once we get on the other side of that ridge up ahead, we'll observe maximum security. No talking, no lights. Keep down and watch where you put your big clumsy feet. Yeah. These people just love trip wires with flares attached. Walker, you still got the walkie-talkie? If I didn't, I wouldn't be here to tell you about it. Uh -huh. Still working? It's warm, if that's what you mean. That's more than I can say for myself. All right, keep it that way. We may need it if we run into trouble. Hey, while we're here, let's take one last check on your gear. Make sure your rifle bolts aren't frozen, weapons on safety, and all grenades are secure in the pins. Okay, everybody set? Let's move out. <laughs> And so we did move out. The young one felt light in my hands, like I'd never realized how light and easy it was to carry a rifle before. The going was easy. The rice paddies were frozen over and covered with snow, and we stepped carefully between the clumps of rice stubble left over from the last harvest, so the dry straw made no noise. We walked steadily, quietly, maybe 200 yards without a sound regularly stepping up and over each low rice paddy wall as we came to it, each one bringing us just that much closer to the top. And then it happened. Hit! Down! Hit the dirt! Get down! Somebody must have tripped the wire because suddenly the inky black was transformed into the merciless white of the operating table. Everything seemed stopped and slowed down, just like an old movie before the projector blows up. I could see the other guys, the hills, and the deadly, winking fires of the guns. And then we fell down to the protection of the earth. And some of us fell with metal in our bodies. Crawl, crawl, you apes! Crawl to the mud tight and save all. They can't hit us there. And we crawled, digging our knees and fingers into the frozen mud until they were bruised and torn. We crawled closer to the ground and faster than we ever had before. We crawled to the sanctuary of a foot-high mud hill. Keep your heads down. They got a sprint. One's about 150 yards to our front. Where's the other? Yeah, there's 200 yards to the left. Uh, they got a sprint in a crossfire. We'll never get out of here. All right, all right. Now, don't panic. Keep your head down. We'll make it out. Walker, see if you can raise Lady Wolf on the walkie-talkie. Walker? Walker's laying out there in the middle of the paddy, Brownie. Uh, He's never going to have to worry about being warm again. Smith's out there, too. I saw him get it. I saw it when the flare went up. I saw him catch it in the face. Okay, okay, Harry, easy. He's still got the walkie-talkie. Can you see if it's all right? He's laying on it. It's hard to tell. Whitey, that flare is going to go out mighty quick. If a man was fast, he could probably streak out there and back before they put up another one. We could use that walkie-talkie to call up some artillery to get these monkeys off our back. I can't, Brownie. I must have been hit. I can't move my legs anymore. I, I can't even feel them. Easy. Are you bleeding bad? No. Harry, you all right? As far as I know. Stevens? Sure. I'd like to take a whirl at that walkie-talkie. Uh -huh. Wait till that flare burns out. It's dying now. Just a few more seconds. Go. By the time the flare lit the sky, Stevens was halfway back, the walkie-talkie dangling from his right hand. There, some huge, invisible hand slapped him to the ground. I'm hit. Oh, God, I'm hit. Easy, boy, quiet. Where'd they get you? I'm hit. I'm hit. Look him over, Harry. They busted his arm. See any other places? No, no, just his arm. Wrap a dressing around it and button it inside his jacket. Hand me that walkie-talkie. It's no good, Brownie. The walkie-talkie smash. What? It's useless. We're going to have to move out of here fast. Well, how are we going to pull out? 
If we can't crawl back down the paddy, they'll slaughter us. All right, all right, look. We'll move along the dike to the edge of the rice paddy. From there, we can duck into the underbrush and move back down the mountain. We'll never make it. They'll spot us when we try to make it across the clearing to the underbrush. They'll swing their guns around. We gotta try it. We can't stay here. Stevens, can you crawl? Yeah, I can make it. Okay, now you lead off and I'll follow you. I'll crawl backwards and pull Whitey along behind me. Whitey? You heard me. Well, we'll never make it with Quiet! It. All you have to do, Harry, is follow along behind and pick up the pieces. Take his weapon, it'll make him lighter. Keep your hands off me, Harry. Come on, Whitey, we have any time to fool around. I'm not fooling. I'm not going with you guys. Come on, you lost too much blood already. That's just it. Like you said, Brownie, it's only a matter of time. You can't get anywhere with me. You'll never even get past the clearing trying to drag me across. You're smart enough to know that, Brownie. It'll be tough enough, even with two good legs. We're not leaving you here. That's what I figured you'd say, Brownie. I'm still in charge here. I figured you'd say that, too. Brownie, you see this grenade? It doesn't have any pin in it. The only thing that keeps the spring from kicking the clip off is my hand. Now get out of here, Brownie, before I let it go. Oh, why do you like... You want me to let loose of this grenade? Now prop that VAR up on the dike in front of me. And scatter the clips where I can get at them. I'll wait until you guys get to the edge of the paddy before I open up. Look, no, baby. I'm still holding the grenade, Brownie. Time is running out. You're going to have to hurry. I feel like I want to fall asleep, and I don't know how much longer I can stay awake. Just wish me a, a very Merry Christmas and beat it. Merry Christmas, Whitey. All right, you guys, what are you waiting for? Let's move out. Yeah, that's right. This is Christmas. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see. What's the matter? Don't you people like Christmas carols? A well, machine gun fire always was better getaway music than Christmas carols. Above thy dark and dreaming... Whitey lay there until the others had crawled to the end of a low rice paddy wall. And then he threw his grenade. When it exploded, he opened up with a BAR, making enough noise to make the enemy think the patrol was launching an attack. Both machine gun nests zeroed in on him. But Whitey stayed well below the little mud wall of the rice paddy, humming his Christmas carol, loading the BAR with a fresh clip every time it went empty, and perhaps wondering briefly why he was going to die so far away from home. A little pond of frozen mud he didn't care about or even own. Still firing and singing. Even after the rest of the squad had escaped into the underbrush. And until either the machine gunners found their mark or else he finally fell asleep. quite a guy. No, I guess it was just a detail that had to be done and he had to do it. Well, there's my stop right there where that little road turns off up ahead. Your detachment's up that road? That's right, right at the end of it. You're sure I've seen that road before, but I didn't think there was anything up there. <laughs> well, just let me out here. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks a lot. No sweat. <laughs> Say, uh, if you ever want to look me up, remember my outfit's all the way up at the end of this road. I'll be right up there. Okay, I'll drop in sometime. Right. So long, and thanks again. I drove off figuring it would be a very cold day in Korea before I ever looked him up. Such a weird guy he gave me the creeps. I got about five miles down the road when I discovered he left his bag sitting on the floor of the deuce and a half. Took a lot of arguing with myself, but... Uh, I decided that the only decent thing I could do was to swing around and take it back to him. Besides, maybe I could stop in the orderly room and check him out. Find out what his story really was. back, I almost missed the road because it was so small and seldom used. I drove up it for about ten minutes. 
I was beginning to wonder if I hadn't gotten the wrong road after all. As I passed no other vehicles or GIs or anything to indicate there was an infantry company around. Just when I was ready to turn back to the main road, I saw lights twinkling up ahead from what looked like a couple of Quonsets. It seemed impossible that an infantry outfit could be housed in two Quonsets, but I pulled a deuce and a half to a hole outside the gate and cut off the motor. I picked up the AWOL bag, got out of the truck, trying to figure out which one was the orderly room. I walked across the hard-packed snow of the yard to the first Quonset. I still couldn't figure it out. Light and warmth seemed to pour from the windows along with the music I remembered from somewhere, but couldn't quite understand. I stepped up to the first window I came to and looked inside. There were kids all over the place, kids of all sizes and descriptions, kids just old enough to sit by themselves, kids just losing their first teeth, some just starting their teens. I stood in the snow spellbound, just watching them sing. Finally, I tore myself away and headed for the front door, eager to be inside. A plaque made out of the howitzer shell stopped me. In the faint light, I could just barely make out the words engraved on the polished brass. But finally, I read it all. It said, This orphanage has been erected and maintained in the memory of Corporal Richard Whitey Dombrowski who somewhere north of the village of Chengju ri Christmas night, 1951, willingly gave his life that others might live. Suddenly, I didn't know where I belonged anymore. The AWOL bag dragged at the end of my arm like a thousand-pound weight. I could figure what was in it, but I tore it open anyway. The bag full of candy, soap, and toothpaste and gum shined up at me, looking as rich and rare as frankincense and myrrh. I closed the bag. Laid it up against the door, close, so they wouldn't miss it. And then I banged on the door as loud and long as I could, until I was sure that they heard me. And then I ran. I ran back down the road to my truck as fast and as hard as I could. Suspense. You've been listening to a Korean Christmas Carol written for suspense by George Bamber. In a moment, the names of our players and a word about next week's story of Suspense. Tonight's story were Bill Lipton as Larry Connolly and Lyle Sudrow as Richard. Also heard were Larry Robinson, Lawson Zerby, Bill Meader, Alan Manson, and Guy Rett. Listen again next week when we return with Moonlight Sail, written especially for suspense by William N. Robeson. Another tale well calculated to keep you in... And now, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Listen now to Yuletide Miracle, starring Larry Haynes and Santos Ortega, and written especially for suspense by John Robert. Go ahead, laugh if you like. Only kids and old ladies believe in ghosts. Yeah, sure, that's what I thought, too. Until I met a chubby little guy with hair like cotton candy who called himself Sir Benjamin. But first, let me fill in the details about my meeting with Sir Benjamin. I was in one of those free eats missions along the Bowery. I ducked in there to escape a parole officer named Brannigan. Brannigan was out to hand me a merry set of bracelets for Christmas when he caught me. The mission was empty. I had it all to myself. Except for a skinny young punk hacking out a cough that made the benches jump. Hey. Hey, kid, you're sick. Yeah. Yeah, I know. You need a doctor. I've had a doctor. I'm wearing hospital pajamas under this suit. Oh? Yeah. 
Yeah, I went down the fire escape to the street to here. I want to get home for Christmas, finally. I've been years making up my mind to it. Uh, uh, what, what, what are those boxes you hold? Christmas presents for my mother, my sister Linda, my kid sister Linda. Hey, you like this? Oh, ladies' gold watch, huh? Yeah, it pins on a dress. Mm -hmm. I once stole my mother's watch and sold it. This, um, this squares it. Yeah. Uh, what, what's in the other box? Nylon stockings. My sister Linda's always had a... <coughs> hey, hey, <coughs> kid, now, come on, get hold of yourself. Huh? <coughs> come on, now. Hey, I can't get hold. Look, these presents. If you could get them to Mrs. B. Simmons for me. Tell her that Tommy, her son, Tommy, Mrs. B. Simmons. Kid. Hey, kid. Come on, Tommy, get hold. The coughing stopped. And it was right then that Sir Benjamin, the chubby little ghost with hair like cotton candy, happened. The first I knew of him was magic, as if as if he was announcing himself. It was music coming from an upright piano on a platform way down the mission hall. A Christmas hymn. But look, until my eyes popped out of my head, I couldn't see anybody. The piano was going, but nobody I could see was playing it. I went up to the piano and reached over the stool to see how the trick was worked. And my hands touched something solid, like, like somebody sitting on the stool. And then I saw fingers, hands, skipping along the keys. Only hands, as if they had a, a life of their own. I don't know why, but I grabbed at them. Ow! That hurt. I bruise easily. Hey, I'm... I'm saying things, and now I'm hearing voices. My voice, Chris. You're hearing me. Well, where are you? Right here, my boy. What? Just be patient, and I'll rematerialize. It, uh... It takes a moment or two. I saw the hands build. First arms, then elbows, shoulders... And then a body, slowly. And then the last thing, a head with little puffs of white hair. And then a face, a chubby face, rosy and smiling. Mm. Uh, well, here I am. Every bit of me, I trust. Who are you? Sir Benjamin. I'm sorry if I worried you. Hey, that, that trick, like like you were invisible. But I was invisible. Oh, come on. Nobody can do that. I can. And that's only one of my powers. But first, suppose we get right down to business, Chris? We have business? Of course. That boy over there on the bench, Tommy Simmons. Huh? Oh, oh, the kid, yeah. You know, I almost forgot. He, he's lying there like dead. I don't dare go outside, but somebody's got to call an ambulance. Do something. It's too late for Tommy. Well, now, we don't know that. We're not doctors. I know that. The problem now is, what are you going to do about his dying wish? What? Oh. Oh, you mean about delivering those presents to his family? It would be fine if you deliver those presents in person. Me? Hey, now, come off it, mister. It's not my job and it's none of my business. Besides, I... I got problems of my own. Brannigan? What? The parole officer? How did you know about Brannigan? <laughs> I'm a very versatile and talented ghost. I also have powers of conjuration. Come again. Turn the boy's dying wish aside, and I'll conjure up Brannigan. <laughs> you don't think I can? I don't think you even exist. How about that? I think I'm dreaming you up. Very well. 
I will demonstrate. Hold on to something, Chris. Conjuration is a very cataclysmic and strenuous business. You'll definitely be safer if you hold on to something. Don't ask me why, but I grabbed hold of the piano. <laughs> That's a good thing I did, too, because the joint began to rock like an earthquake was hitting it. finished now. Ah, this is quite a job of conjuring. But uh, here's Brannigan. What? See? On the street, peering through the plate glass window of the mission, watching you. Holy smoke. It is Brannigan. Hey, I gotta get out of here. I gotta find the back way Over up. Here, through this yard door. Quickly. I dived into the yard with Brannigan's police was blowing at me. The yard was a dead end. High building walls all around like a prison yard. No exit except a long, narrow alley to the street past Brannigan. I flattened in the shadows, a dead duck. I was listening to Brannigan shout orders at a couple of blue coats who'd come running when he whistled. Watch the exit, men, while I flush him out. D'Angelo, you're trapped. Better surrender peacefully. Do you hear me, D'Angelo? Trapped was the word, like a rat. Oh, a pity. <sighs> Too bad, Chris. What's the penalty for violation of parole? A year, maybe two. Oh, you were a big help shooing me into the yard. The... <laughs> Here I go, talking to myself. You're again. talking to me. I could really be a big help. Give up, D'Angelo. Don't make me take you the hard way. Think fast, Chris. You were to respect Tommy Simmons' dying wish. You were to go home for Christmas in his place. Okay, okay. If I was to, then what? Then Brannigan goes empty-handed. In order to catch you, he must first see you. Oh, sure, sure. Brannigan's suddenly going to go stone blind, huh? No. You are becoming invisible. It was a laugh. But the laugh was I was invisible. At least the Brannigan I was. He came right toward me with a flashlight in one hand and a gun in the other. Only he looked right through me as if he didn't see me. D'Angelo! I know you gotta be in this yard. I watched him search every inch. And then scratch his head and give up. Now, Chris, for your part of the bargain, here are Tommy's presents. Go deliver them. Now, look. I'll leave here and only run into Brannigan outside somewhere. Now, what about that? You remain invisible until you've arrived at your destination. That is, as long as you remain faithful to your mission. Go, Chris. Okay, okay. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where am I going? Where do I find this Mrs. B. Simmons? Not far. Just a brief train ride to a neighboring town. The town, Chris, is Bethlehem. As Sir Benjamin had promised, it was a brief train ride. But funny... I felt like I'd come a long, long way. There was a deserted train shed with snow packed high. The station sign turned silver by the moon read, Bethlehem. Not a soul in sight. Uh, no, no. There was someone. A girl. A girl in high boots, a snow hat, and the moon on her cheeks. She was coming toward me. Hello. Uh, Hello. Are you... Chris? Yeah, yeah, my name is Chris. I I'm Linda. Linda Simmons. I came to drive you home. Just like that? Just like what? Well, I mean, no, no explanations. Like you know I was here. And, and how come you know my name? Oh, I was told you were coming. And told your name, too. You were... told? Somebody telephoned. Oh. Yeah, he telephoned. He, he wasn't kidding when he said he was a talented ghost. Hmm? Say, you, uh, you, you came right at me just now. That means you saw me. You can see me, huh? See you? Yeah, yeah. Face, hands, body, me. I'm a guy. You, you look at me and you see a guy. No. I cannot see you. <sighs> then I am invisible. No. It's just that I'm blind. Uh, 
that drive home. Let's take it now, huh? There was a horse-drawn sleigh around the side of the shed. Silver bells on the reins and a horse whose name had to be Dobbin. Uh, you drove this rig all the way here by yourself? Oh, you don't drive Dobbin. He knows every inch of the way to the Bethlehem station. You see, we've been coming here every night for years. Nice and slow and easy. Mm -hmm. I'd been running since I was born, and now I was asking myself, what for? A guy can't stay tough in a horse-drawn rig in the snow. And when Linda put her hand on mine, I opened my fist for the first time I could remember. We reached home. A frame cottage, nothing fancy, with a candle burning brightly in the window. Come in, Chris. Mother! Uh, right here, Linda. Oh, uh, um, Mother, this is Chris. Welcome home, Chris. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's a nice place you got here, Mrs. Siddons. Oh, I'm so glad you like it. Yeah, I, uh... I don't exactly know how to say this, Mrs. Siddons. You see, I'm just a mug. I quit school the minute I learned how to tell the teacher off, so... If I ain't got the right words... Oh, you don't have to have the right words, Chris. You don't even have to get it said. You see, I know. You know? About Tommy? Yes, all about Tommy. Well, well, how? Oh. Oh, there's somebody... Somebody talked to you on the phone, too, huh? Yes, somebody telephoned me. Mm. Well, well, the last thing the kid thought about was you and Linda and uh, coming home for Christmas. Oh. And he asked me to give you these. Uh, gold watch for you, Mrs. Simmons. And oh, Chris. These for you, Linda. Nylon stockings. Thank you. It's uh, nothing big, I guess, but Tommy didn't have much to give the way it was with him. You're wrong, Chris. Tommy had a great deal to give, and in his way, he gave it. I don't follow. A boy come home. Tommy couldn't come home himself, so he sent you to us, Chris. You can say about me that I was born in 1935 and I stopped crying in 1936 at the ripe old age of one. And you can say about me that I let a tear go I never knew I had. Christmas, 1961. Linda. Yes, Chris? Uh, don't get me wrong. You know, it's, it's no crime being poor. Say it, Chris. Well, it, well, it's, it's, it's like this. It's Christmas, but I don't see any tree. And I've been sniffing close enough to the kitchen to know there's nothing roasting in that oven. You, you're disappointed? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, is it all right if I borrow Dobbin outside? All right. Of course it's all right, Chris. <laughs> Put me down as a guy who never knows when to shut up. A tree and a turkey? Sure, lady. Nothing to it. Presto, Mephisto, I'm a magician. Here's your tree, lady, and here's your bird. <laughs> what? Quite a remarkable feat of magic, Chris. Presto, Mephisto, eh? <laughs> Sir Benjamin, I was wondering when you'd show up the kibitz. Uh, you, you are here, Sir Benjamin. Yes, but immaterially. And please don't ask me to rematerialize, Chris. I daren't show my face in Bethlehem. Why not? I lived here once before my uh, present situation. I wasn't very popular with my townspeople, I'm afraid. Oh, what they have against you? Bills. I died owing the butcher, the baker, and even the undertaker. Oh. <laughs> Let's get back to your problem. Yeah, a tree and a turkey, and it's your problem. I'm dumping it right into your lap. You got me into this in the first place. I see. Have you any money? Not a plug nickel, and even if I had, the town is shut tight. But you're a talented ghost. A tree and a turkey ought to be a cinch. You got any ideas on it, Sir Benjamin? Only one. My customary way of acquiring necessary things while I was alive. Your customary way? Credit, Chris. And I hope never to be a borrower again. But I suppose it can't be helped. And, uh... 
Just where do we borrow this tree in Turkey? From Uncle Kale's poultry farm. It's just past the merchant's bank a short drive. Well, I'm a stranger here. Move over. I'll take the reins. Get there. There aren't any ghosts, and call me crazy, but Sir Benjamin drove the rig at a smart clip to a farm stacked with freshly cut trees. Take your pick of tree and carry it to the rig. And Chris... Yeah, what? No, uh... A necessary disturbance. I owe Uncle Kale a formidable bill already. I threw the tree on the rig and went back. Sir Benjamin was coming out of a poultry house carrying a great big fat turkey. <sighs> There's a job persuading this feathered fellow. Here, take the leash and be on your way. Well, wait a minute. Where are you going? To leave a receipt for Uncle Kale for one tree and one turkey. <laughs> I'd sure like to be there when he reads it. So would I, Chris. So would I. <laughs> I hurried back to the rig, right into the arms of trouble. Brannigan. Hello, D'Angelo. What? Uh, run and you won't get ten yards. Okay, okay. What did you do, look into a crystal ball to find out where I was? I didn't have to. I just took the same train you took. Ah, oh, baloney. You had to see me to be able to do that. I had to see you. What were you, invisible or something? Sure, sure, I was invisible. <laughs> the Angela, you killed me. Invisible. Oh, yeah? All right, what about me yard behind the mission? You walked right past me. You played your flash right on me, but you couldn't see me. How about that? I'll answer that one. Maybe I didn't see you because I didn't want to see you. And now what? That's the truth, the Angelo. I didn't want to catch you. I had to make noises like wanting to because I'm a cop. But I didn't want to make the arrest. Not on Christmas, D'Angelo. Yeah. Well, you're making the arrest now. Maybe I'm not. But why'd you tell me all the way here? To see what you were up to. To see if you really had a heart. Yeah. So, you're bringing the Simmons a tree and a turkey. Well, now, how do you know about the Simmons? I knew Tommy Simmons. I saw him pass you those presents in the mission before he died. I phoned Mrs. Simmons and Linda that you were coming. If, if, if it was you who telephoned? Me, sure. Who'd you think? What's it? I thought Sir Bench. You thought who, D'Angelo? Never mind. Skip it. Hmm. Now, I'll ask one question, and then maybe I'll leave. Now, think carefully before you answer. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask. If I arrange for you to keep in touch with the parole officer by mail, <laughs> providing those letters were postmarked Bethlehem, would you... Would you like it that way? Would I? Brandon, where else does a guy want to write letters from but home? That's almost all there is to the story of Sir Benjamin, me, Brannigan, Mrs. Simmons, and Linda. Well, we had to take the door down to get the tree into the house, and we had to find an extra stomach apiece to accommodate the turkey. And then later, with a fire going and the lights down low, Linda and I sat dreaming on the sofa. I had my fist open for keeps, and her hand was right in mine, like it belonged there. It's been a perfectly wonderful Christmas, Chris. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> and thanks to you, we had a tree and a turkey. Well, well thanks to me. Now, the tree and the turkey wasn't my trick. The tree and the turkey were? Mm -hmm. Chris, what are you saying? No, no, really, the thanks goes to another guy. A chubby little guy who sure has a talent for getting what he wants. His name's Sir Benjamin. Sir Benjamin? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> why? Well, the... The coincidence of, of, of names. Well, I used to call my father Sir Benjamin in play. Oh, we'd play Lord and Lady. My father and I, he'd call me Princess Linda, and I'd call him Sir Benjamin. The coincidence of names, you said, huh? Linda, suppose... Suppose it isn't a coincidence. But... But my father died years ago. Yeah, so did my Sir Benjamin. <laughs> Uh, the guy I'm talking about is a ghost. A ghost? Yeah. A ghost like I met in a mission when your brother Tommy died. All of a sudden, a piano started going. Piano music, but nobody I could see was playing. Chris? Huh? Our piano, he's playing. Yeah. Yeah, so it is. Hey, you want to 
about that. It's a pendulum. That? But how, how can you prove it? Well, easy. I toss a turkey wing at the piano stool. I bet you Sir Benjamin lets out a yell and complains about how easily he bruises. Do we bet? What will we bet, Chris? A kiss. That way, Linda. Nobody loses. Starring Larry Haynes and Santos Ortega and written especially for suspense by John Roberts. Next week, instead of another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense, a gala song fest well calculated to put you in a bright holiday mood. The seventh annual Christmas Sing with Bing will come your way over the CBS radio network next Sunday evening, Christmas Eve. Singing along with Bing, Catherine Crosby, the Norma Luboff Choir, and those two fugitives from the Met, Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. <laughs> Suspense is produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Featured in tonight's story were Rosemary Rice as Linda, Joe DeSantis as Brannigan, Catherine Roth as Mrs. Simmons, and Bill Lipton as Tommy. Two weeks from today, we'll return with The Old Man, written by Bob Corcoran. Another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Welcome to the Caltex Theatre, a full hour of dramatic entertainment broadcast over a nationwide network of stations throughout Australia. The Caltex Theatre is brought to you by Caltex Oil, marketers of over a thousand outstanding petroleum products, in association with Caltex dealers and distributors everywhere. Tonight in the Caltex Theatre, you will hear a new play based on Charles Dickens' famous classic, A Christmas Carol, and written by English Dickens expert, Eric Jones Evans. The play is Scrooge the Miser, and stars in the title role, John Alden. Your producer, Cressig Jenkinson. <laughs> The Caltex Theatre presents Scrooge the Miser, Act One. Oh, so cold in here, so bitterly cold. What a Christmas present it would be if he'd have a decent fire just this one day of the year. Oh, well. Merry Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. Oh, Mr. Scrooge. Oh. Get out of the way, you brat. Oh, I'd, I'd better get back to work. Get out of the way. I want no Christmas carols. Now be off with you. Yeah. Huh? Humbug. The whole thing's humbug, I say. Yeah. Well, Bob Cratchit, what's this I see? Oh, pardon, Mr. Scrooge? As so soon as I leave the office, you put more coals on the fire. Well, <laughs> yes, I did, sir, but only a few. Six new coals, I can count. You call that a few? Well, I'm afraid I was feeling very cold, sir. Yeah, I can see we shall have to part. You'll ruin me in coals. Ruin you, sir? It's a very small fire, and on a night like this... You could have warmed yourself with a candle if you were cold. Well, I tried to do so, sir, but not being a man of strong imagination, I failed. So I took the liberty of adding the coals. Liberty? Huh. You're always taking liberties. 
However, I heard the outer door closing. Go and see who's in the outer office. Yes, sir, at once. Uh, oh, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, Bob. Uh, is my uncle in? Yes, Mr. Fletcher. Yes, uh, come this way, sir. Cold, yes. biting weather, isn't it? Yes, but seasonable for Christmas. Uh, your nephew, Mr. Fred, to see you, sir. Well? I just called in to wish you a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Merry Christmas, hmm? Bad humbug. Oh, Uncle, you don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry, eh? Tell me now, what reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come, come, Uncle, what reason have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. Huh. Humbug. <laughs> oh, 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 don't be so cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools? Merry Christmas. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas to you but a time for paying debts with no money and for becoming a year older and not one penny the richer? But, Uncle... Hold your tongue, sir. Now, if I had my way, every fool who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled. Yes, boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Oh, now, really? Yes, he should. You keep Christmas your way if you must and leave me to keep it in mine. Keep it? But that's the trouble. You don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good may Christmas do you. Much good has it ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited. Christmas among the rest. But I'm sure I've always thought of Christmas as a good time. A kind of forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their hearts freely. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And so I say God bless it. Here, here, Mr. Fred, here, here. Let me hear another sound from you, Cratchit, and you keep your Christmas by losing your situation. I'm sorry, sir. And you, my dear nephew, you're such a powerful speaker, aren't you? <laughs> I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Oh, please don't be angry with me, Uncle. Now, I'll tell you what to do. Come and dine with us tomorrow. I'll see you damn first. Why, Uncle, why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. <laughs> Good evening. But you've never come to see and... Well, I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. I would just like us to be friends. Good evening. Well, I'm sorry. With all my heart, to find you so resolute. We've never had any quarrel to which I've been a party, but... Oh. Anyway, I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So once more, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Get out. And a Happy New Year. Out! Very well. A Merry Christmas to you and your family above. Thank you, sir. And the same to you and Mrs. Fred. Thanks. Oh, how's your youngest child, Tiny Tim, getting on? Oh, growing strong and hearty, thank you, sir. He, he seems to get better every day. Oh, that is good news. He'll soon be walking without his crutch, I shouldn't wonder. Oh, I hope so, sir. I do indeed. I'll see you out, sir. And a very Merry Christmas to you. Gentlemen, there's another fool. Cratchit, with 15 shillings a week and a wife and a large family, talking about a merry Christmas. Mm. I'll retire to Bedlam. Uh, excuse me, sir, but there's a gentleman to see you. Well, yes, yes, yes. Who is it? Well, he didn't give his name, sir. Very well, then show him in. Yes, sir. Uh, this way, sir, if you please. Good evening, sir. I hope I'm not intruding. You wish to see me? Yes. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Scrooge, sir. Mr. Marley's dead. He died, in fact, seven years ago on this very night. Indeed. I'm uh, sorry to hear that. No, you needn't be. He left me his sole executor, his sole residuary legatee, and his sole mourner. I see. Well, I have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. Uh, allow me to present my credentials, Mr. Scrooge. Liberality, credentials. I don't understand you, sir. At this festive season of the year, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at this present time. <laughs> Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts. Are there no prisons? <laughs> of course, far too many prisons, but... And the Union workhouses, are they still in operation? Unfortunately, yes. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor, then? Both very busy, sir. Good. I was afraid from what you'd said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. Very glad to hear it. Very glad indeed. Uh, yes. Well, uh, under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude... A few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We chose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. 
So, sir, what shall I put you down for? Nothing. You, uh, wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, that's my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make either people merry. I help support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, too, I might tell you. And those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they'd rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Now, good evening, sir. Uh, yeah, yes, of course, I, I'm sorry to have taken up your time, Mr. Scrooge. Pray accept my apologies. Uh, good evening. Uh, a happy Christmas to you. Ah, humbug. Well, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Scrooge, sir, I'll be on my way home now. Home? Yes, sir. It's nine o'clock, just striking. The church clock's fast. By my watch, it's five minutes to 9 p.m. My watch is never wrong. I can only repeat what I told you the other day, Cratchit. I don't pay you 15 shillings to leave before your time. No, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Ah. I suppose you'll want all day tomorrow off. If it's convenient, sir. It is not convenient, and it's not fair. If I were to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. I'll be bound. Uh, uh, you, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. Well, Christmas Day comes only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Ah, well, I suppose you must have it. But be here all the earlier the following morning. Oh, yes, sir, I will. Thank you, sir. Yeah. By the way, you completed that special invoice? Uh, no, not quite, sir. Then you'll come here tomorrow morning and finish it. Tomorrow's? Christmas Day? Yes, Christmas Day. Be here at eight o'clock sharp. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. A Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Scrooge. Shut the door. Yes, sir. And the outer door. Very well, sir. Ah, idiots, all of them. Raving idiots. Christmas nonsense should be stamped out. Makes me tired, the whole thing. Infernally tired. <sighs> oh, well. <sighs> Comfortable chair by the fire. The world mightn't seem such a silly place. Uh, mm. <laughs> Comfort. A little warmth. Mm. These coals should last the night. Mm. <coughs> yes, a little warmth. And a nice leisurely study of one's bank book. Mm. If only those fools celebrated their Christmas in the same way, they'd have something to show for their time. <laughs> Figures, editions, making thousands and hundreds of thousands. <gasps> For anyone with some sense, mm, there surely can't be a prettier sight in all the world than the pages of a successful bank book. I say, Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge, merciful God, for you. What do you want with me? Don't you recognize me, Ebenezer? You? You're the ghost of my partner, Jacob Marley. How kind of you not to forget my face, Ebenezer. The ghost? No. No, there's no such thing as a ghost in Yet, oh, great heavens. Yes, Ebenezer. You believe in ghosts? I, I, I must, because you are here. I, 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 I can see you. As you say, you can see me. But why? Why do spirits walk the earth? Why do you come to see me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad amongst his fellow men and travel far and wide. If that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. Doomed to wander through the world and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth, and turn to happiness. Jacob, you're fettered, chained. 
Why is that? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. Is its pattern strange to you? A chain of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, and ledgers. Is it strange, Ebenezer? <gasps> or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full and heavy as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. Oh, it's a ponderous chain we wear. Oh, Jacob, Jacob, I beg you. Jacob, speak comfort to me. I have none to give. It comes from other regions and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. What do you say? There is no hope for me. Is that what you mean? Like me, Ebenezer. You're a captive bound and double iron. In life, my spirit never walked beyond this counting house, never roved beyond the narrow limits of this money-changing hole. Oh, not to realize that no space of regret can make amends for life's opportunities misused. But, but you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? I should have realized mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. Why did I pass my fellow beings in life with eyes turned down? Never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode. Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Then, then if you cannot offer comfort to me, Jacob... Why have you come to haunt me? I come to warn you. <gasps> warn? To tell you that you have yet a chance to escape the fate that has been mine. I come to show you visions of a Christmas past. A Christmas present and a Christmas yet to come. Behold, Ebenezer. <laughs> And tell me what you see. I... I see a deserted schoolroom. And a lonely boy seated at a desk. You recognize the boy? Yes. Yes, I do. It, it, it's myself. My long-forgotten self as I once used to be. Alone. Always alone. When the other boys had gone home for their Christmas holidays, I... I was neglected. I... How I wish he... It's too late now. What do you wish? Well, seeing myself like this and remembering how I used to feel. There were some children singing carols outside my door tonight. I... I should have liked to have given them something. That's all. Ah, yes. And now, look again, Ebenezer. Who comes into your vision now? Ah. <sighs> Why, that's my sister Fanny, dearest Fanny. The only one who ever really cared for me. Your yeah, sister was always delicate, was she not? Yes, yes, that's true. She grew up to womanhood and married, and then, alas, died soon after the birth of her first child. Your nephew, Frederick. Yes. Frederick. Strange. He, he called on me tonight to wish me a, a Merry Christmas. A Merry Christmas? Out upon Merry Christmas. What is Christmas but a time for paying debts with no money, for becoming a year older and not one penny richer? You were here then. You you heard me. Shall I repeat everything else you said tonight? Everything else you said every day and night over the last seven years? No, no, don't. Please, please, don't. I can see now I... I was wrong, Jacob, so wrong. No, 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 please, please don't recall the other words. Then look again. There now, you see. Look upon her whom you once loved before avarice and gain displaced her in your heart. Look and hear her too. Elsa. <laughs> Our parting will mean little to you, Ebenezer. Yes, very little. I know you have never sought in words to be released from our engagement, but I have seen your nature slowly changing from day to day. 
your nobler ambitions falling off one by one, until at last the greed for wealth alone engrosses you. All that made my love of any worth in your sight has now been displaced by your love of gold. When you first declared your love for me, we were both poor and were content to be so. But now all that has changed. Were you to marry me, a girl whose only fortune is her wealth of love for you, you would regret it bitterly. Oh, yes, you would. And so I give you your freedom. May you be happy, Ebenezer. Very happy in the life you have chosen. Goodbye, Ebenezer. Goodbye. It, it's true. All of it. I cast her aside in my lust for money. And what has the money brought me? Nothing. I can see the error of my choice only too well now. Now when... When it's too late. What you have seen are shadows of the past. Your long forgotten past. And now you shall behold the Christmas of the present. You should see how your clerk, Bob Cratchit, spends his Christmas Day. How much do you pay him, Ebenezer? I, 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 I pay him 50 shillings a week. 15 shillings? Yes, well, may you look like that. Every Saturday you give that man who serves you so faithfully only 15 shillings with which to provide the bare necessities for his wife, his children, and himself. I... I don't suppose that provides much at all. I know it wouldn't provide enough for them. They've saved their pennies carefully throughout the year to buy a goose for their Christmas dinner tomorrow, Ebenezer. This is the one meal of the year when they eat reasonably well. The rest of the time, well... Well, you should be able to imagine. Yes, yes, I think I can. But now... Tomorrow's dinner. Look at them, Ebenezer. Look carefully. <laughs> I've mashed the potatoes, Mother. They're all ready. Good boy, Peter. Just give the apple sauce a stir. There's it, dear. Yes, all right, Mother. Mother! Hmm? The goose! The goose! Why, whatever's the matter, Mary? The goose, Mother. Our goose. It's not three houses away. <laughs> did you, darling? And how did you know it was ours? By the smell, Mother. Nobody else's goose could smell as beautiful as that. Well, let's hope it tastes as good as it smells. It'll well, soon be time to go and fetch it, won't it, Mother? Yes, dear. Very soon now. But whatever's happened to your father, I wonder? And Tiny Tim, where's he? And Martha. She wasn't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour. Hello, everyone. Merry Christmas. Oh, here she is. Here's Martha. Hurrah, hurrah. Hello, Mother. I was just wondering what had happened to you, Martha, dear. Oh, with a deal of work to finish up last night, we had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind, so long as you're here now. That's the main thing. Here, sit before the fire, dear, and have a warm guest you. Oh, Mother, I just saw Father pass the window. Oh, quickly, Mother, hide. Let him think you're not here. Yes, hide, Mother. Hide. Under the table. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you shouldn't tease your father so. Shh, shh. Here he comes. Here we are, here we are at last. Down you go, Tiny Tim. Ah, Merry Christmas, Merry Father. Father. And a Merry Christmas right back to you. I might have known you'd be waiting along the street for your father to carry you home on his shoulders, Tim. My father's the strongest man in the street. The way he swings me up on his shoulders so easily. <laughs> well, he is. Of course he is, darling. And you come over here by the fire and warm yourself. Oh, take your hat and coat off, Robert. Sit down by the fire. Dinner won't be long. Ah, yes, it's good to be in the warmth again. Oh, where's Martha? Isn't she here? Oh, Martha's not coming today, Father. Not coming? On Christmas Day? Oh. Well, uh, <laughs> hmm? Now, what's going on here? Here I am, Father. It was only a joke. Oh, oh Martha, love. Hello. <laughs> oh, and a good joke it was, too. And I'm so glad to see you, child. Christmas wouldn't be the same without you. Indeed, it would not. Now, who's going to fetch the goose from next door's oven? Oh, I will, Mother. And me. I want to fetch it, too. Come on, then. May I go, too, Mother? Of course, Tim, darling. Take my hand, Timmy. We'll go together. Come on, but look where you're going. Walk carefully. Yes, I'm all right. Oh, 
We're lucky to have such children. Indeed, we are. I meant to ask you, Robert, how did Tim behave in church early this morning? Oh, as good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. Oh? You know, he told me when we were coming home from the church that he hoped the people saw him there because he's a cripple. And it might be pleasant to them to remember on Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Oh, did he really say that? Yes, my dear. It almost seemed as if... But there, he's growing stronger every day, isn't he? You see that, don't you? Don't you, dear? Yes. Yes, Bob. I see it. Oh, yes, of course. Come on, my dear. Here it is. Yes. The most magnificent goose in England. Oh, smell that aroma. Look at it now. That's what I call a goose. Now, is everybody ready? Oh, are we ready? Is everybody ready. hungry? <laughs> then take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. The feast is about to begin. Uh, Hooray! Hooray! <laughs> Why, they vanished, Jacob. Oh, please, please show me more. More, Ebenezer? But what interest have you in them? They're poor, their clothes are patched and darned, their pleasures so simple and humble. But, but they're so happy, grateful, so, so pleased with one another and contented with the good time they're having. Oh, no, no, I beg you, let me see them once again. Very well, Ebenezer. You may see them again. <laughs> well, there we are. Oh, you all enjoyed the goose. Now you can all enjoy the pudding. <laughs> I do hope it will be all right. It looks a wonderful pudding, my dear. Wonderful. Uh, but before we partake of it, I suggest a toast. Oh, yes, a toast. And my toast is a Merry Christmas to us all. God bless us. God, God bless, bless us. us. God bless us, everyone. Jacob? Yes, Ebenezer? Tell me if this lad Tim will live. If the shadows you saw remain unaltered by the future, the child shall die. No. Oh, no, Jacob, that mustn't happen. Why are you so concerned about him? If he has to die, he'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. No, no, please, not, not those words. No, don't say them back to me. Your own words, were they not? Oh, Ebenezer, if you're a man in heart, not adamant, recall your words before it is too late. Have you discovered what the surplus is and where it is? Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? There's still time left for you to reconsider your life. Ebenezer, just one last chance. You must grasp that chance as a drowning man would grasp at a straw, for your drowning and this remaining chance is no more solid than the straw at present. But you can make it stronger. Oh, yes, you can. Accept the chance and save your soul, Ebenezer. Save your soul. And so the curtain falls on Act One of tonight's Caltex play, Scrooge the Miser. In a moment, we commence Act Two. The Caltex Theatre now presents John Alden in Scrooge the Miser. Act Two. Ebenezer, what of this one remaining chance you have? Do you accept it? I, I want to, Jacob, but I, I, I'm still not quite certain how I should go about it. Show me more of the Cratchit family. I thought you would have seen enough of them by now. No, not nearly enough. Then you shall have one more. Look.
<laughs> oh, a beautiful pudding, my dear. Remarkably beautiful. The greatest success you've achieved in all your years of cooking successful meals, if I may say so. Why, thank you, Robert. Yes, indeed. And now, my dears, another toast. I ask you to drink with me to the health of the founder of the feast, Mr. Scrooge. What? The founder of the feast? Well, I wish I had the founder of the feast here, that's all. I'd give him a piece of my mind he'd feast on, and I hope he'd have a good appetite oh, for it. Oh, come now, my dear, the children, Christmas Day. Yes, I'm sure it would be Christmas Day, I'm sure, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. Oh, now. And you should know he is, Robert. Nobody should know it better than you. My dear, I shouldn't have to remind you of all people that Christmas Day is a day of charity. Very well, then. I'll drink his health for your sake, and the day's, but not for his. Thank you, my dear. Then, here's long life to Mr. Scrooge. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to him. Mr. Mr. Scrooge. Scrooge! Jacob, Jacob, did you see that? Bob Cratchit toasted me. They drank my health. So they did, but I also noticed something else, Ebenezer. Hmm? Uh, what was that? That the mention of your name sufficed to cast a gloom upon their happiness. Oh, oh yes. Uh, so it did, yes. But, but still, Jacob, they drank to me. God bless them. Yes, they wished me well. True. Remember that. Remember how they wished you well. And now, Ebenezer, I want you to look at something else. A fleeting glimpse into the future to a Christmas yet to come. You are about to witness shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Oh, I fear these more than any I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope, somehow or other, to live from now on as a better man, I will take courage to look upon them and do so with a thankful heart. Very well. On then through the teeming city streets to the exchange, where wealthy merchants congregate to discuss the latest business of the day. Yes, it's certainly seasonable for Christmas. You should get some skating in the frost hole. Yes, well, I don't skate much, you know, too much to think of. Uh, by the way, I suppose you've heard he's dead. Dead? No. When did it happen? Last night, I believe. Well, well. You know, I thought he'd never die. Well, what's he done with his money? Lord only knows. Left it to his company, I suppose. He hasn't left it to me. I'm quite sure of that. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, it'll be a cheap funeral, I expect. Yes, sure to be. For the pun my soul, I don't know of anybody who'd want to go to it. I don't suppose you care to help make up a party? No. I wouldn't mind if a decent lunch were provided. <laughs> well, I never wear black and I never eat lunch, but I'm willing to go if you are. <laughs> All right. Let's talk it over tomorrow, shall we? Hmm. By the way, there's one thing you can be certain about. Hmm? What's that? The devil's got hold of his own at last, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, till tomorrow, then. Goodbye and a Merry Christmas. Who were they talking about, Jacob? Was it... was it you? How could that be, since I am of the past? Have you forgotten that I died seven years ago this very night? Of course not, but that... What you saw then was a vision of the future. Of a Christmas yet to come. But who was this man they spoke of as being dead? You shall know directly. Look once again into the time that lies ahead and you may profit by what you see. Evening, Joe. Why, rot me if it ain't Mrs. Dilber. Yes, Joe, it's me. Come to do business with you again. Have you now? What might your business be? Well, take a look at these first. Oh, yes. yes. Stolen goods, eh, Mrs. Dilber? And what if they are? Everyone has a right to take care of themselves, haven't they? He always did. Now, who might he be? Why, in what died last night, to be sure. In what I cleaned up for. So you've been robbing the corpse, have you? Well, why not? 
He won't be the worse for a loss of a few things like these. That may be true, Mrs. Dilber, but all the same... Oh, here now, here now. We ain't going to start picking holes in each other's coats, are we? Oh, I should hope not. But stolen goods is stolen goods. Oh, it weren't no sin taking them from him, Joe. If he wanted to keep them after he was dead, the wicked old so-and-so, why wasn't he like other people in his lifetime? Wasn't he? If he had been... He'd had someone to look after him when he was struck with death instead of lying there gasping out his last all alone by himself. It's a judgment on him, that's what it is. Now, how much are you going to give me, Joe? Oh, well, uh, let's see. A bunch of business seals, one pencil case, two old silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a scarf pin. Hmm. Oh, well, there you are, Mrs. Dilber. That's what I price him at. Uh, is that all? I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was to be boiled for not doing it. Ah, uh, uh, oh, well, all right, then. Uh, what else have you got? Yeah. Yeah. What do you call these, bed curtains? That's right, bed curtains. You don't mean to say you took them down rings and all with him lying there. I do, and why not? Oh, you were born to make your fortune, Mrs. Dilbert, and you certainly do it. I'd be a fool not to take what I can get from a man such as he was, Joe. Here, here, uh, mind that candle grease, don't drip on them there blankets. His blankets? Well, he ain't likely to take coal without her, my dear say. It's to be hoped he didn't die of nothing catching, Mrs. Dilbert. <laughs> Ah, don't you be afraid of that. I wasn't so fond of his company that I'd hang about his corpse if he had. Oh, yes, and, uh, and that shirt you're looking at now, you can look at that till you ache and you won't find no holes in it. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting it? Putting it on him to be buried in. Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. You did what? Took it off him. If Calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it ain't good enough for anything. Just as they come under the body, you know, and anyway, he can't look uglier than he did in that one. So, how much are you going to give me for the lot, Joe? That much, Mrs. Duba. And it's more than I should. I always give too much to the ladies. It's a weakness of mine. It's the way I ruined myself. You call this a fortune? That's your account, Mrs. Dilbert. I think you're so lucky to get it. But then things are worth double less. Not as stolen goods they ain't. And if you were to ask me for another penny, I'd repent to being so liberal and knock off half a crown. Ah, well, all right then, all right. Needs must when the devil drives, I suppose. <laughs> Ah, funny, ain't it, to think he frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit when he was dead, eh? Ha, 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 well, ah, good night, Joe. Good night. Good night. That's enough, Jacob. Show me no more. The case of that unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now, yes. Yes, I can see it all. The lonely figure stretched upon that bare, uncurtained bed, plundered, bereft of all his worldly goods, unwatched, unwept, uncared for. Oh, Jacob, is there no tenderness in death? Can you not reveal to me one instance in which it has no terror or remorse for those who look upon it? I can. Then show me, Jacob, show me. To do so, we must return once more to the humble home of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. There you shall see how death may be transformed by simple faith to something sweet. Which death? Tim. No. No, I, I don't want to see it. You'll see it now. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Oh, Mother, it's, it's nothing, Martha, dear, just a slight cold. I wonder where your father is. It must be near his time to come home. I don't think I'll read from the book any more tonight. I'd say it was past father's time to come home. But then I think he's walking home a little slower than he used to these last few evenings. I've known him to walk with... I've known him to walk with Tim upon his shoulders very fast indeed. Yes, very fast, Mother. Yes, that's true. But he was very light to carry, very light. And your father loved him so. 
It was no trouble. No trouble at all. Oh, here he is now. Hello, everyone. Hello, Father. Oh, Bob, how cold you are. Why, your hands are frozen. Come and get warm by the fire. Thank you, my dear. Oh, nearly finished your sewing, I see. You have been industrious. But I wish this dress you're sewing were in some other colour, not black. However, it'll be finished long before Sunday, won't it? Yes, yes. You... You went today, Robert. Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone too. It, it would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But then you'll see it often enough, I suppose. I promised him I'd walk there on a Sunday. I... Oh, there, there, dear. We must all try not to grieve so much. Yes, you. You're quite right, of course. There, I'm. I'm better now. Uh, by the way, you'll never guess who spoke to me today. Who, Robert? Mr. Scrooge's nephew. Oh, did he? Yes, I, I met him in the street and he must have noticed I was looking a little sad, for he stopped to ask what had happened to distress me. When I told him, he said, I'm sorry to hear of your tragic loss, Mr. Cratchit. Very sorry for you and your good wife. It was nice of him, I thought. Yes. Yes, very nice. I, I didn't know he knew so much about you, my dear. Hmm? What do you mean, Robert? That you're such a good wife. Oh. Why, everyone knows that, Father. Well, observe, Peter, my boy. I hope they do. And, and then he said, if I can be of service to you in any way, this is where I live. Be sure and come to me. And he gave me his card. He seems to be a very kind man. Oh, yes, very much so. It really seems as if he's actually known our Tim and felt our loss himself. It's a pity there aren't more like him about... The world would be a better place if there were. It would indeed. And you know, I shouldn't be at all surprised if he were to get our Peter a better situation. Oh, <laughs> did you hear that, Peter? Oh, do you, you really think so, Father? I do, my boy. And when that time comes and you have to leave us and go out into the world, I... Well, I'm sure none of us will forget Timmy or what this first great parting has meant to us. Never, Father. Yes, we shall always remember him. Always. I know you will. And that thought makes me happy. Yes, very happy. Jacob, this has been... It's a great revelation to me. I see now that gentle grief alone survives the passing of a loved one's soul. And that, that no terror or remorse can hold domination where there is love. Only good memories remain. Yes, Jacob, this has taught me quite a lesson. It is to be hoped so, Ebenezer. There now remains but one glimpse into the future before I take my leave. One more? What are you going to reveal to me this time? The name of that dead man, perhaps? Exactly. The name of that dead man. I, I fear to know it, Jacob. And yet I must. Show me. Merciful oh, heaven. What is this you're showing me? Lonely graveyard overrun by grass and weeds. Is this where he lies buried? It is. A worthy place for him. Am I... Am I to see the name on the headstone? You are. Draw closer. Look at it. Before I do, answer me one question, Jacob. Are these the shadows of things that will be? Or shadows of things that only may be? Look, Ebenezer. Yes, yes, I will. But, but give me some hope, Jacob. I know men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which if persevered in they must lead. But if the courses are departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. Look, Ebenezer. See the name. The name there is Ebenezer Scrooge. 
my own name. No, 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 say it won't be so, Jacob. I don't want to be the man who lay on that bed unwatched, unwept, uncared for. Only give me the one remaining chance to reform. And reform I will. Give me the chance to atone, and atone I will. In the past, the present, and the future, I swear it, Jacob. You hear me? I swear it. Have mercy on me, Jacob. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Huh? 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 Why? Huh? <laughs> Why? I must have been asleep. Uh, yes, yes, I was asleep. It was a dream. A dream. <laughs> I just sit in my own chair in which I fell asleep. This is my own room. All a dream. Mm, this room's so dark, I must have light. <sighs> yes, that's it. Light. Ah, oh, oh, there's no fog outside, no mist, only golden sunlight, sweet fresh air and merry bells. Glorious, glorious. Oh, I, I, I don't know what's come over me. Oh, save me, I feel as light as a feather, as merry as a schoolboy, as giddy as a drunken man. <laughs> oh, to think that I fell asleep last night, such a miserable old devil. And now today, today, <laughs> what is today? Hi, hi there, you, boy. You won't leave us up. Tell me, my fine fellow, what's today? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day, of course. Christmas Day. Thank God for that. Christmas Day. I haven't missed it after all. Missed it? What do you mean? No, oh, I, I, I mean more than you would ever understand, young fellow, me lad. <laughs> oh, Merry Christmas, Scrooge. A Merry Christmas to you, young man. Oh, bless me, a Merry Christmas to all the world. Oh, Jacob, Jacob, I thank you for your visit. Where would I be if you had not come? To think the time before me is all my own in which I can, I can make amends. Oh, yeah, are you feeling all right, mister? All right? As a young man, I feel on top of the world. Oh, well, that's all right, then. A Merry Christmas to you, mister. Uh, no, 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 don't go, laddie. Uh, uh, do something for me, will you? Oh, what is it? Well, um, you know the poultry shop at the corner? I should hope so. Oh, 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 the intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. <laughs> and you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging there? What, the one as big as me? Oh, 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 what a delightful boy, what a splendid fellow. It's a pleasure to talk to him. <laughs> yes, my buff, yes, 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 the one as big as you. It's still hanging there, far as I know. Excellent, then go and buy it. Oh, <laughs> get out of it. No, no, my dear young man, I'm in earnest. Here, here. There's a sovereign for it. Bring it back with you, and I'll give you a shilling. Bring it back in less than five minutes, and I'll make it half a crown. Cool. I'll be off like a shot, sir. Oh, oh admirable fellow. <laughs> oh, 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 but before you go, uh, y you see that, uh, that, that portly gentleman on the other side of the street? Yes, sir. Well, run after him like a good lad and tell him Mr. Scrooge would like to have a word with him. Uh, tell him to walk straight in. The doors are all unlocked. Oh, I forgot to lock the confounded things last night. The first time of my life. I'll tell him, sir. Oh, good lad, good lad. Oh, I give that jolly turkey to Bob Cratchit and start my new life by making them all happy. <sighs> May God be thanked for the reformation that shall now begin for Ebenezer Scrooge. <clears throat> Yes, 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 no, 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 let's see now, my, my, my checkbook. <sighs> and to think that only yesterday as I walked through the city streets, people would say, eh, you see what that is? That's Ebenezer Scrooge, eh, wicked old miser. <laughs> and now, with God's help and strength, they shall say, do you see who that is? That's Ebenezer Scrooge, the benevolent and good, the friend of widows and orphans. <gasps> My word, they shall. They shall indeed. Come in. Come straight in. I uh, understand you wish to see me, sir. Yes, I do. Come in, my dear sir. Pleasure to see you. Merry Christmas to you. Why? Why? A uh, Merry Christmas to you, too, sir. Thank you, my friend. Uh, my apologies for the way I treated you last time you were in this room. If you will accept my apologies... Uh, and I also hope that you will have the goodness to accept this check for your worthy fund. Oh, Chris, my dear Mr. Scrooge, 
Such a large sum? Are you serious? If you please, I will not allow you to accept a farthing less. There are a great many back payments included in it, I can assure you. But, my dear sir, I, I don't know what to say. Oh, 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 don't say anything, please. Except that you'll come to see me again sometime. Well, of course. Yes, most certainly I will. Then I'm very much obliged to you. I thank you 50 times. God bless you. May he bless you, Mr. Scrooge, for your great kindness. Goodbye, sir, and a Merry Christmas. Here we are, sir. Is a turkey. Oh, 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 excellent fellow. Oh, magnificent bird. <laughs> Twenty-five pounds if it's an ounce. Even bigger than I first thought. <laughs> and that deserves nothing less than five shillings for you. Five? Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Ha-ha, <laughs> Merry Christmas, sir. And to you, my lad. Ha-ha, <laughs> what do I see coming through the window? Oh, 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 that other than Bob Cratchit, and ten minutes late, no less. Oh, the very thing I wanted. <laughs> work. Now, 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 I must be at work when he gets in. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I'm, I'm very sorry. I... Cratchit. Yes, sir? What do you mean by being late? Well, I'm extremely sorry, Mr. Scrooge. I'm, I'm afraid I am a little behind my time. Ten minutes behind, to be exact. Uh, yes, sir, but it won't occur again, sir, I promise. You see, I, I was helping my wife pre prepare the goose for dinner. The and... devil you were. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, you have to take what's coming to you. Pick up that parcel on the table. Uh, uh, Pick it up. Uh, yes, sir. It's heavy, eh? Hey? Well, yes, it is, sir, but I, I don't understand what you mean. I, I mean it's yours, Bob. Turkey, that's what it is, a magnificent turkey. And, and, and furthermore, I'm going to raise your salary, Bob. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mr. Scrooge, you're not well. You... Well, I've never felt better in my life. <sighs> Merry Christmas, Bob, my friend. A merrier Christmas than I've ever given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and I'll... Oh, oh by the way... How's your son, Tim? Quite well, thank you, sir. Thank heaven for that. We must all see that he stays that way, and he shall. Oh, yes, he shall. Now, now, off you go. Go? Where to, sir? Home to your family. Of course, it's Christmas Day. <laughs> what about the invoice, sir? Oh, to the devil with that. It's Christmas Day, I say so. So off with you. As fast as your legs can carry you. Mr. Scrooge. Oh, Mr. Scrooge, may, may I shake your hand, sir? Thank you, Bob. It's a great honor for me to have you wish to shake my hand. Now, 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 go home, go home and enjoy yourself. Oh, I will, sir. And, uh, would you come with me? I, I mean, we'd be so happy to have you share our Christmas dinner with us. Next year, Bob. No, this year I'm going to my nephew's. If I'm still welcome there. Eh? You will be, sir. Yes, yes, Freddy's a good lad, yes. I suppose I will be. Of course. Oh, Mr. Scrooge, I've, I've never been so happy in my life. A, a, a Merry Christmas to you, sir. Thank you, Bob. The same to you with all my heart. And may God bless us, everyone. So ends our Caltex play, Scrooge the Miser. In a moment, we will give you tonight's cast. Ladies and gentlemen, the producer of tonight's Caltex play, Kresik Jenkinson. Thank you. Scrooge the Miser is a stage play adapted by Eric Jones Evans from the novel by Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. Tonight's radio adaptation was by John Crane. In the starring role, you heard... I played Ebenezer Scrooge. This was John Alden. <laughs> the supporting cast was as follows. Marley, John Gray... Bob Cratchit, Stuart Ginn. The gentleman, Hugh Stewart. Mrs. Dilber, Diana Perriman. Mrs. Cratchit, Neva Carglin. Martha, Jeanette Craig. Fred, Neil Fitzpatrick. Tiny Tim, and the little boy, Nairi Thompson.
Thank you, Mr. Jenkinson. Now this is your compere, Rick Hutton, inviting you to be listening for another outstanding Caltex Theatre presentation next week and bidding you good night on behalf of your hosts, Caltex Oil, marketers of Caltex Super Gasoline and Caltex Gasoline, the world-famous RPM 1030 Special Motor Oil and Marfac Lubrication. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! Howdy, this is Chad Remington. Of course, if you don't know who Chad Remington is, let's just say that I'm supposed to be a lawyer and that my headquarters are in the bustling and noisy frontier town called Dos Rios. Naturally, there's not too much law business in a cow town on the frontier, but I manage to get by what with the troubles most folks seem to stir up or run into. Of course, like most everyone else, I do own a ranch which was left me by my father, when he died a few years ago. And it's this combination, part-time attorney and part-time rancher, which plummeted me into the adventure I'd like to tell you about now. So settle back, close your eyes, and see if you can conjure up this mental picture. A few days back, I was riding for my ranch into Dos Rios, accompanied by the ex-medicine man, Cherokee O'Bannon. Counselor. I say, Chad. What is it, Cherokee? What brilliant idea have you thought up now? Oh, none, Chad. None at all. However, I was about to make an observation. <laughs> I thought it would be something like that. Every time I see the cooking sherry in my kitchen go down four or five inches, a few minutes later, you come up with a brilliant observation. <laughs> what is it this time? Uh, first off, sir, I suggest you refrain from poking fun at the healthy stimulation provided by alcoholic nectars. And in the second place, can you explain to me why, owning as nice a little ranch as you do, you continue to risk your life daily by the so-called practice of law? Probably for the same reason that you abandoned your medicine van and your genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil and bought out the Dozeria's livery stable. You mean the sheriff was about to catch up with you, too? No, no, I don't. And that isn't the real reason why you quit peddling patent medicine. You were looking for a permanent business you could build up just as I'm looking for a profession I can fall back on in my old age. Have you ever lived to an old age? Why, the crooks and desperados around this part of the country have taken more shots at you than Santa Ana and his whole army threw at the Alamo. One of these days, your luck is going to run a... Hey, Chad, you see what I see? Look, down there in the... Where I'm pointing on the road. A great big wagon. Now, what in the... Cherokee, it's a patent medicine van. A medicine wagon. Certainly is. Although from here, I'm unable to recognize who it might belong to. Hey, what do you say, Cherokee? Want to go down there and find out and have a little reunion? I most assuredly do. If I find it's an old friend of mine... Billy, places, Chad. Those rascals up on that hill are trying to ambush that way. They most assuredly are. All right, come on, Cherokee. Even for a medicine man, the odds down there are too doggone uneven. We're both wearing six irons. Let's see what we can do if we really try. (laughs) 
I don't know who it was trying to ambush the medicine show wagon or why. But when they found a pair of Colt 44s on the other side of the battle, they wasted no time beating a hasty retreat and vanishing into the woods. Cherokee and I chased them until we realized it was futile. Then we came back to where the medicine van had stopped. Well, what happened here? Was anybody hurt? Yeah, yeah they shot my man, my spiel, Doc. Was he killed or just shot up? For yourself, you had better see. I do not know. Still breathing, but a few inches higher, and he would have breathed at his last. Where'd they get him, Chad? Through the neck? Through the neck and the throat. Look, all right. He's alive. Yeah, he's alive right now, miss. But unless we get him into Dosarius and to the doctors, he certainly won't stay that way. Oh, poor dog. Cherokee, you trail my horse back to town. I'll get up here on the seat with this young lady and drive a wagon. As soon as we've gotten this man to the doctor's, I'll meet you back at my office. Right you are, Chad. I'll tell the doctor you're coming. All right, young lady. Up on the seat again. There we are. I'll drive as slowly as I can so we don't jostle him too much. But at the rate he's losing blood, unless we find the doctor and have him taken care of, this man's not going to last much longer. All right, get up there. Come on now. Ha! Ha! Fortunately, our town physician, our only physician, was in his office when we arrived in Dos Rios. He saved the poor chap's life, but he told us it would be a month or even two before he'd be able to use his voice again. Fine thing for a medicine show spieler, no voice. However, knowing that he would live was a relief to the young lady. And as soon as we had made the wounded man comfortable, we both went over to my office to meet Cherokee. Miss, I'm afraid in all the excitement out at Blue Bottle Canyon, I didn't get your name. Sheila. Gretchen Schiller. Schiller? Well, then you must be related to Alfred Schiller. Alfred Schiller was my father. Was? Papa died last spring. You knew Miss Schiller's father, Cherokee? No, I didn't know him, Chad, but I heard about him. In the fraternity, Alfred Schiller was supposed to be the only legitimate itinerant purveyor of medicines and nostrums. Oh, the way you talk, you sound like a medicine man yourself. <laughs> a former medicine man. Cherokee hawked his genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil to the unsuspecting public in nine states and two territories. Rattlesnake oil? <laughs> that is good? Well, I... I... Containing 85% alcohol, after drinking half a pint of Cherokee's rattlesnake oil, the patient thought he felt better. Oh. <laughs> what is it you sell? Well, my papa, he was a physician from Austria. But when he had office in Boston, he developed consumption, so he prescribed for himself. That is why we bought medicine wagon and came out west where Papa could get fresh air. That's true, Chad. I heard about Alfred Schiller from a lot of other medicine men who had the pleasure of knowing him. Schiller's prescriptions and remedies were legitimate. You can buy them just the way you can buy a prescription from a physician. But with my assistant, Doc, short so that he cannot talk, I'm afraid nobody will be able to buy Dr. Schiller's remedies because... There will be nobody to sell them. Ah, yes, that is unfortunately true. Is it Cherokee? Why couldn't you substitute for a few weeks until Doc gets his voice back? Hey, Cherokee, you are able to do that? You can mark what they call spiel? <laughs> I do not wish to seem immodest, Miss Gretchen, but uh, I have been known as the Silver Tongue Order wherever I have spoken. Oh. Yes, and after a successful day, they changed Silver Tongue to Thick Tongue. <laughs> oh, but seriously, Cherokee... Would you be willing to help me, Shelley? Ah, oh, it would be wonderful if you would do that for me. Because if I do not make sales, then I have no money. And if I have no money, I must sell out. You must sell out? Yeah. You see, there is another medicine man who now for two years has been trying to buy out my father's remedies on medicine show. Who might that be, Miss Shelley? A man Papa could not abide. And I do not like. He calls himself... Dr. Pasco. Drifter Pasco? You know him too, Cherokee? Do I? Why, Drifter Pasco was one of the most scurrilous, underhanded, vicious blots on the name of the entire fraternity of medicine man. Why, he's so crooked they wouldn't even let him run the shell game at a traveling fair. Well, uh, this is throwing a mighty wide loop. But that may supply the answer as to just who it was that shot up the wagon at Blue Bottle Canyon. No, no, no. This is hard to believe, even of a man like Pasco, nine. Ten, this is easy to believe. Mr. Pasco would 
Love nothing better than to get a hold of Dr. Schiller's legitimate formula so he can stay in business. Well, we're all getting exercised over something which is just pure guesswork. But if Grifter Pasco is around those Rios, we'd better help Miss Schiller get her wagon out to the exposition grounds and set up for her afternoon show. <laughs> There you are, Miss Gretchen. That's the exposition ground straight ahead. We'll just set the wagon... Billy Blue Blazers, Chad, do you see what's there? Seems to be another wagon in the exposition grounds ahead of us. Ah, this means trouble, real trouble. That wagon belongs to Pasco. Pasco, huh? Well, the way I'm feeling now, I'm glad he's here because I intend to make mighty short work of that gentleman. But you can't have two medicine wagons putting on two shows, Chad. I know that, Cherokee. And what I said before still goes. Ho, oh, oh ho there. Something on your mind, mister? Yes, are you Pasco? No, oh, the doctor's inside, in the wagon. Resting up for this afternoon show. Well, tell the doctor there's not going to be any afternoon show and that I want to see him. Yeah, well, I told you the doctor's resting. He's have to have a long rest, a permanent rest, unless he gets out here and talks to me. You think you're mighty sorely, don't you? Now, look, why don't you go and do as you're told? Why don't you go and stick your head in a well? Because I'm not calling Dr. Pasco for you or anybody else. Well, then I'll go in and get him out of there myself. Oh, no, you don't. Get back on that crummy wagon you drove in on. You're going to need to see the doctor professionally. You wouldn't want to bet on that, would you? Now, get out of the way. Why, you big mouth? Get I sure can try. And now, I'll just step over you and... Look out, the other one. I watched your little pugilistic exhibition from the window in my wagon. Oh, your wagon, huh? And you must be Dr. Pasco. Grifter Pasco, huh? Uh, hello, Cherokee. When did you get out of jail? It seems to me a more important question is, when are you going to jail, Pasco? I don't know who you are, but you sure don't make much sense. Oh, I believe that we've met before. Really? Well, you look like the kind of a lunkhead who wouldn't make a lasting impression on me anyhow. Probably at that distance, I didn't make the impression I was aiming to make. Cherokee and I ran you out of Blue Bottle Canyon this morning. <laughs> what did you do, mister? Drink a bottle of O'Bannon's alcoholic rattlesnake oil? I've never been in Blue Bottle Canyon, and what's more, I don't even know where it is. Well, we'll skip that for the moment and get down to what I've got to say to you right now. Yeah, Pasco, you'd better pack up your wagon and get out of the exposition grounds so Miss Schiller can use them before you get into real trouble. I always heard it was first come, first served. But if you think you can make me get out of here... Chad, look out. He's got a gun under his coat. Oh, you sneak and sniff. And don't try to pick that gun up, Pasco. Because now I'm taking it down to the sheriff's as Exhibit A in the mysterious shooting up at Blue Bottle Canyon this morning. You're a smart apple, ain't you? Well, go on. Go down to the sheriff's. Because I'm going down there myself and charging you with trespassing and with assault with intent to kill. We'll return to the second act of Stampede, our exciting frontier town adventure, in just a few moments. Frontier Town. I knew that Grifter Pasco's threat to have me up before the sheriff was just an idle one. Or so I thought. But when I realized he had no intention of being bluffed into moving off the exposition grounds, I did turn Gretchen Schiller's wagon around and head back to town. For town and the sheriff's office. I was running a bluff, too. 
and both Cherokee and Gretchen were disturbed about it. <laughs> but then, being a lawyer... Whoa, there, you eat crying. Whoa, hold it! This is the sheriff's office, Mr. Remington? It is, and I can see that the old gentleman is in. Chad, I wished you wouldn't go in there. You're just going to make a fool of yourself. No, I would not say make a fool of yourself, but... I am afraid it is wasted time and will be embarrassing. Well, I don't know how it is with lawyers in Austria, Miss Schiller. But out here on the frontier, 20% of a lawyer's success is Blackstone, and the other 80% is Bluff. All right, come on. Here, Miss Schiller, I'll open the door. Well, howdy there, boys. <laughs> Young lady, a new client of yours, Chad? Well, in a way, Sheriff, I guess you could say that she is. Oh, Miss Schiller, I'd like to introduce you to Tom Bemis, our sheriff. I am very pleased to make your acquaintance, Sheriff Bemis. Same here, Miss... Uh, what did you say her name was again, Chad? I am Gretchen Schiller, Sheriff. Oh, German, eh? No, uh, no, Tom. Miss Schiller's an Austrian. And she's over here in this country selling medicines. Medicine show gal, eh? Yes, sir, eh? And one of the best. That's Miss Gretchen's wagon outside. Wagon? Here in the street? Why, yes, yeah, Sheriff. Cherokee charges too much to put the wagon down at his livery stable. Well, I see here, Chad, you're a lawyer. You ought to know that no public exhibitions of any kind can use the streets of Dos Rios without a license. License? When did all of this happen? There's an ordinance been on the books of this town about seven years now. Well, I've never heard of it before. Can't be any public exhibitions without a license. Matter of fact, in town or out of the exposition grounds. Sweet suffering sassafras, Chad. This is the answer to our problem. What problem, Cherokee? Well, don't you see? If you've got to have a license for a public exhibition, we've got Drifter Pasco by the back of his neck. I golly, you're right. Sheriff, there's a man out at the exposition grounds right now without a license. Yes, I know all about it. And if you mean Dr. Pasco, he has got a license. He has? When did he get it? Oh, maybe 10, 15 minutes ago. Only so soon? Then you know what, Mr. Remington? Dr. Pasco must have ridden in on horseback when we were coming slow with the wagon. Well, I'm starting to see now why I never knew about that license ordinance before. This, uh, Pasco, Sheriff, he told you about it, didn't he? Well, not exactly, but he had me look it up, and it's true. Well, this isn't going to stop us from getting a license for Miss Gretchen. I'm afraid it is, Cherokee. There's no way of licensing two shows for Dos Rios at the same time. Oh, but if I cannot do my show here, sell some medicine and raise some money, all oh, this is frightening. Well, miss, I'm mighty sorry about it, but the law is the law. And there just ain't much I can do. But we've got proof this Pasco is a blankety-blank bushwhacker. Tried to raid Miss Schiller's wagon this morning as we are coming through Blue Bottle Canyon. You say you got proof? Uh, what's the use of bluffing anymore? No. No, we haven't got proof. Not the kind of proof you'd want, Sheriff. All right, come on, Miss Schiller. Since we can't get a license right now, we'll put your wagon in Cherokee's livery stable and then go up to my office and put on our thinking caps. Thinking caps? Now, that's just a matter of speaking, Miss Gretchen. It means to think hard. Oh. And in this case, if we think hard enough, a thinking cap might look like the hood they slip over a condemned man's head before he falls through the trap and the scaffold. <laughs> I mean, Mr. Remington. How about just making it Chad, Gretchen? We're all in this together, and we seem to be tired with the same stick. Mm, that's the trouble, Chad. There's no reason you should get... Um, how, how do you say over here? Involved on account of me? <laughs> if I'm involved at all, it's because of that poke I took at Pasco's bodyguard. No, Gretchen. We're in this now, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm not getting out. You don't mind my intruding again, Chad. You seem to be overlooking one irrefutable fact. With the doctor bills piling up for Gretchen's assistant and the recent lack of business she's had, she has to raise some money and raise it quickly. There is no way for me to do that without selling some of my remedies. That is not here in Dos Rios. And the next town is two days' ride away. Besides, what good would it do me without a medicine man to put on this show? I've just been thinking... There's nothing in that ordinance the sheriff suddenly found that could possibly prohibit our putting on a public exhibition on a private place. Private place? I, I mean, mean, I own a ranch not too far outside of town. 
Why couldn't you set up your wagon and show out there and leave it up to Cherokee and me to see that people get out? Oh, this is a wonderful idea. Do you think really we can do it? Well, if we can't do it, it's only because Pasco caught up with us and after this morning's practice, his aim's better. Cherokee, let's get busy. While you get the wagon harnessed up again, I'm going to drop into every store in town and see that everyone who is able to walk is out at my ranch for the medicine show before sundown tonight. <laughs> Rip I know what I'm talking about. It was in the grocery store when this lawyer came in. Yeah, well. well. Don't you see? The way he put it up to everybody, like it was a charity or something, they ain't gonna come to near our show now. They'll all traipse out to Remington's ranch and go to that Schiller gal's pitch. That interfering cheap lawyer. Why did he have to butt in here? I don't know. But if that girl has a good day over here, she won't have to sell out. And then where will we be? Well, I'll tell you one thing, Jumbo. I ain't going to waste six months' work. What do you mean, boss? I don't know what I mean exactly, but I'll figure out something. You sure had better. Go on, go. Go saddle up a couple of horses for us, Jumbo. You and me. We're taking a little ride. A ride out toward Remington's Ranch. Grifty, you've been thinking for an hour now. You got any bright ideas? Why don't you shut up? Okay, okay. So with nobody showing up at our show at the exposition grounds and everybody going out to Remington's ranch for the girl... Great Caesar's ghost, look at that, will you? Huh? See what I'm pointing? There's a whole mob of people around a wagon. I'll bet your pennies to popcorn we're on the road to Remington's ranch and that's the show going on down there. Yeah, look at him, will you? They must have a crowd of more than 200. Slow down, boy. Oh, Easy yeah. now. Oh. Well, if you're ever going to buy Schiller's business and his formulas after the business she's doing down there, we're wearing a long gray beard. Ah, uh, you think so, huh? Hold it. Whoa. What's gotten through you, Grifter? Nothing's gotten through me, Jumbo, except an idea. An idea how to bust up that sale. Put an end to Gretchen Schiller's business and get even with that tin horn lawyer. Oh, sure. You turned magician or something. Why don't you admit that you... Do you see what's on the other side of this fence, Jumbo? A lot of beef cattle. Why? <laughs> Let's suppose you and me crawled through the fence, got behind them cattle, and threw a few shots at them. What do you think would happen then? Happened? Them cows would stampede. Stampede all over the place. Uh-uh. <laughs> no, not all over the place, Jumbo, with us behind them. Them cows would make a beeline down the hill... And head right for where they're holding the show. <laughs> you get the idea now? <laughs> <laughs> I sure do, boys. A couple of hundred head of cattle stampeding down on that show would sure break that up. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me none if they just happened to trample a busybody like Remington to death. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you waiting out here for? Come on, Jumbo. Down off that horse and over the fence. We're going to give Remington and Miss Schiller some real trouble. All right, friends. In just a few minutes, my assistants will pass among you so that you can get your bottle of Dr. Alfred Schiller's internationally renowned Nossman Panacea. Not at the regular price of $5, nor at $2 and a half but at the special advertising price of one dollar a bottle. You say that's not enough? You say you want more for your money? Very well. Then I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Notice what I hold here in my left hand? Two-ounce bottle of Dr. Schiller's instantaneous headache remedy. You can see the price right on the label. One dollar and fifty cents. Now, just so none of you miss this extravagant value, this special introductory offer, with every bottle of Dr. Schiller's internationally renowned nostrum, I am going to give you absolutely free, at no cost whatsoever, this one dollar and a half size of Dr. Schiller's instantaneous headache remedy. You say you never have headaches? Well, let me read you a testimonial letter from a satisfied customer who bought Dr. Schiller's instantaneous headache remedy at the full price of one dollar and fifty cents. It says, Dear Doctor, I can't tell you how pleased I am with the results I've gotten from your headache remedy. Ever since I've been married, I've suffered from a constant headache. So after three doses of your remedy, taken by my mother-in-law, 
We buried her last week. Oh. <laughs> 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 of course I'm only fooling. It's just a joke. Part of the entertainment that we... Billy Blue blazes, Chad. Chad, come here quick. What is it, Cherokee? What's the matter? Look at all those cattle passing out the grass lot. They're stampeding and heading right this way. Oh, for the lover. Everybody quick. Scatter. Get behind the wagon. Cherokee, come on. We got to hit our horses right into the middle of that stampede and see if we can't turn them back before everyone down here is trampled in jelly. <laughs> Look at them cattle go. Yeah. Another ten seconds and we'll be down on top of the wagon and... Trouble. What's that? Somebody's down there with the cattle, shooting at them, turning them around. Well, I'll be... Trumbull, come on. Let's get back over the fence. we got to get out of here. Victor, we can't. The cattle are splitting up. They're all around us. Run, you fool. Run for the... Ah! It is too bad Pasco and his friend were trampled to death, Nikhra. I'm afraid, Gretchen, that's what they call poetic justice. Hey, verily. Oh, and another well-turned phrase. Hoist by their own petard. Talking about hoisting, Chad, don't you think that after all that excitement and exertion, I'm entitled to some sort of libation? Yeah, well, maybe you aren't that, Cherokee. Here, here's a nickel. Go get yourself a drink. A nickel? You say that's not enough? You say you want more of my money? <laughs> Very well, then, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you absolutely free one bottle of Dr. Schiller's instantaneous headache remedy. <laughs> because knowing what you'll be doing when we get back to town, Cherokee, you'll be needing a headache remedy tomorrow Frontier Town, starring Reed Hadley and featuring Wade Crosby, is a Bruce Ells production. Supervision and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Reed Hadley. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town comes to you from Hollywood. Let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. The signal oil program. The signal oil company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by the whistler. Tonight, lie or consequences. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Presently, I'll tell you of nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Within the human character, the line between good and evil is a thin and waving one. 
And very often the one small impulse for good will outweigh and nullify the bad. Such was the case with Michael Cobb. Mike wasn't bad, really. It happened while he was a kid before he knew any better. He'd gotten into trouble, gone to prison, served a stretch. Now he's out, then he's learned his lesson. He's proving that. He's going straight, working hard at his job in the office of a large department store. He's married to a girl he loves, and he's happy. Mmm, delicious, delicious. <laughs> oh, nobody can cook a better breakfast than you, darling. Thank you, sir. Now, Mike, don't bolt your coffee. I gotta run. I'll be late. Well, a couple of minutes won't make any difference. Well, maybe not most days, but today is gonna be a big one. The last shopping day before Christmas, you know. Stores will be jammed. We'll be swamped with work until late tonight. Besides, I don't want to spoil my record. Six months and I haven't been late to work once. I know, I know. It's fine. I'm sure the store appreciates it. Yeah, Lane, I... I think they do, too. I really think they like me down there. You know, like my work and everything. Oh, sure, Mike. How could they help liking you? No, no, I mean... Well, I'm beginning to feel like all that stuff is all forgotten. Almost like something that never happened. It is. It is forgotten, Mike. Everything's different now. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Oh, this is going to be a lot different Christmas than the last one, isn't it? Yes, Mike. You were wonderful, Elaine. Coming to see me, sticking by me. Oh, darling, I promise you there'll never be another Christmas like that. Never. I know there won't, Mike. From now on, they're, they're all going to be really Merry Christmas. Yeah, you bet. Oh, gosh, that reminds me. I haven't got your presents yet. I'll have to run out my lunch hour and find something. Now, now, Mike, you're not going to go spending a lot of money on me. Oh, maybe next year we'll be more on no, our feet. No, no, never you mind. I'll get you what I done, please. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Now I will be late if I don't run. Hey, hey, here's your, here's your hat. Oh, thanks. Well, goodbye, darling. If I don't get home before midnight, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Yes, it looks like a Merry Christmas for you at last, doesn't it, Mike? For the first time in your life, almost. A real Merry Christmas. You notice the smiles on people's faces as they walk down the street. You get sort of a kick out of the fancy red and green draped windows of the store. The holly smells good in the elevator. And you chuckle as you pass the toy department with a perspiring Santa Claus pulling on his red coat. Then into the office, everybody's smiling. Yeah, you know what, Mike? Maybe you're getting that thing they call the Christmas spirit. Well, morning, George. Merry Christmas. Hi, Mike. You're pretty cheerful this morning, aren't you? Oh, why not? It's almost Christmas, the day of good cheer. Well, what's the matter with you, sourpuss? Uh, nuts, humble. Uh-oh, the boss on the rampage again, huh? Yeah. Well, what is it this time? You haven't heard? No, what? Well, somebody lifted another thousand bucks out of the receipts last night. What, again? Yeah, it makes about ten grand that's been missing in the last six months. Well, no wonder Mr. Humboldt's upset. The detectives are in there with him right now, and they've got old Gus, a night watchman, in for questioning. I suppose we'll all be on the carpet like the last time. Oh, gee, that's not so good. Ten thousand dollars. Hey, that's grand larceny. Yeah, and the cops are probably getting pretty sore about not pinning it on somebody. Now, look, here comes old Gus, fresh from the Inquisition. Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Humboldt. Gus. Uh, hey, Gus. Yeah, Mr. Osborne? Are they playing questions and answers in there again, Gus? Uh, yeah. There was you this time, there was you that time. The only time I got to sleep when they called me down here for this. <laughs> what for would I want to steal money for? I got a wife. Fine wife. Four kids. I steal money, I go to jail. They starve. What for would I steal? Sure, sure, Gus. But I know why you're so worked up about it. Yeah? You probably had to admit where you were last night between 12 and 1 o'clock. How come you know that, where I was? Go on. Everybody in the store knows that, Gus. It's a standing joke. Everybody knows you eat your lunch every morning between 12 and 1. They know you go up to the 13th floor and stretch out on one of those divans in the Louis the 15th room, the classiest in the joint. Okay, so what's wrong with that? I got to eat. Why not in style? Sure, only for that hour. Anybody could come in and move out the other 12 floors and you'd never know it. All right, so what? Maybe that is when somebody stole money. I do not know. I only know I did not steal. And this is the only time I got to sleep when they have to go asking me questions. <laughs> what a character. Hey, uh, is that true about his breakfast from 12 to 1? Sure. <laughs> There's a night watchman for you. <laughs> That probably explains why they're so sure the thief is somebody inside the store. Somebody who knows about Gus and what time he won't be on this floor. Yeah, it could be. Uh-oh, that's Humboldt. Yes, Mr. Humboldt. 
Oh, yes. It's right away, sir. <laughs> Just as I thought. It's my turn now. Well, if I start screaming, you'll know he's putting me on the rack. Okay. I'll bring a branding iron to your rescue. Don't laugh yet. You'll probably be next. If Humboldt really decides to catch a thief, he'll catch one by hook or crook. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Mike. Oh, now, what's the matter? You don't seem as happy as you were. Something happened to dampen the Christmas spirit, maybe? Something you can't describe, can't even put your finger on? Just a funny, sinking feeling? Forget it. George Osborne has been in and out of Humboldt's office, and almost the whole day has gone by and nothing's happened. And everything seems to have calmed down. In fact, it's George's turn to have the Christmas spirit. I really didn't expect it this year, but there it was in my pay envelope. Nice and crisp and green. With the best Christmas wishes of the J.C. Devers store. Oh, gee, that's swell, George. Yeah, real honest to gosh Christmas bonus. I can sure use it. <laughs> Who couldn't? I don't know whether you'll get one or not, Mike. You've only been here six months. Then maybe. Uh, by the way, why don't you mosey in and pick up your pay? It's almost nine o'clock. We close in five minutes. Well, I guess I'd better wait for Mr. Humboldt to call me. Golly, I thought we'd get paid earlier. Still haven't bought Elaine's present. Ah, well, don't worry. Most of the smaller stores will still be open for a couple of hours. Yeah, sure. But I, uh, I thought I'd get her something she liked real well. A little store up on 10th Avenue. Oh, well, it'll be open till late. Say, I wonder if they found out anything about the 10 grand. Boy, they've really questioned everybody around, though. They didn't question me. In fact, they've never questioned me about it. I don't quite understand that. Oh, well, I don't know. I guess you got such an honest face or something. Yeah. Uh oh. Yes, Mr. Humble. Well, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'll send him right in. Well, maybe we spoke too soon. He wants to see you. Oh? On the other hand, maybe he just wants to hand you your Christmas bonus in person. After all, you are getting to be the fair haired boy around here these days. I better go in. <laughs> you might even be in line for a promotion. You can't tell. Okay, okay. You wanted to see me, Mr. Humble? Yes, oh, uh, yes, Cobb, Cobb. Uh, sit down, sit down. Uh, thank you, sir. Cobb, you've been with us uh, six months now. Yes, sir. And I must admit that in that time you've demonstrated an admirable aptitude for the work. Thanks, Mr. Humble. Yes, in fact, there's been some discussion of raising your salary, promoting you. I even talked to Mr. Prentice, the manager, about it myself. Well, thanks, Mr. Humble. Yes, and that's why I regret very much to tell you this. I must inform you that we're forced to dispense with your services as of tonight. Dispense? You... You mean I'm fired? I'm afraid that's it. Yeah, your two weeks' pay is in this envelope. Wait a minute. If I'm bed so good, why am I being fired? I'm not at liberty to offer any explanations. I have my order just It's got as... something to do with this missing money, hasn't it? I told this you This is your it's... way of telling me you think I took it, isn't it? Now, call my... That's I... it, isn't it, Mr. Humboldt? You've questioned everyone else in the department. With me, you figure questions are unnecessary, don't you? Well, since you put it that way, Cobb, naturally we must take into consideration your past. You know about my prison record. I told you about it. What I've told you about if I was going to steal again? I'm not accusing you of stealing again. I only say we can't afford to take chances. We simply find it advisable. All right. I understand. I understand a lot of things now, Mr. Humboldt. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Humboldt, for the Christmas bonus. Hey, hey, Mike. Mike, wait a minute. Well, did you get it? Did he give you a Christmas bonus? Yeah. Yeah, I got a Christmas bonus, all right. Hey, what's up? What's the matter? Oh, nothing. I'll, I'll tell you about it later. I'm leaving now. Oh, yeah, you're in a hurry. Uh, but wait, uh, I, I almost forgot. Uh, with my bonus, I can pay you that 30 bucks I owe you. Huh? Here. 10, 20, 30. That ought to help with that present for your wife, huh? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, George. Thanks. Merry Christmas, Mike. <laughs> yeah. That premonition you had this morning was right, wasn't it? That funny, sinking feeling. Now you know, don't you, Mike? You knew it all the time, really. All this past six months, you've been kidding yourself. The dream bubble has burst. Merry Christmas, Mike. The crowds are still cheerful on the streets. The windows are still bright and gay, and the holly still spices the air. But you don't see or feel or smell. No, there's only the sensation of a chill wind cutting you to the bone, 
as you wander the dark streets, not knowing or caring where you are. Hello, Michael. Merry Christmas. Huh? Oh. Oh, hello, Reverend Ewan. I... I didn't see you. So I noticed. I was just getting home from my last-minute shopping. Won't you come in for a moment? A cup of tea, perhaps? Why, no, I, I... Oh, come on. I haven't seen you for a long time. That is for a chat. Besides, it's chilly out. A cup of hot tea will warm you up. You look as if you could stand warming up, Michael. Come in. No, no, I... I've got to get along. Oh, come now. That lovely wife of yours will miss you for a few more minutes. I tell you, I've got to go. Well, very well, Michael. I won't keep you. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Reverend. I didn't mean to... You know... Well, I understand, son. You're troubled. Is there anything I can do? No. No, I'm all right. Well, I know you too well, Michael. I've known you all my life. Now, I've, I've helped you before, haven't I? Why... I don't know. I don't know whether you... Did or not? All that stuff you told me about turning over a new leaf, forgetting the past, I believed it. Oh, yes, of course. Hal, maybe you should have told it to some other people instead of me. It just don't work, Reverend. It just don't work. All that stuff about being good and doing good. It Hal, does. it don't pay you off. It does, Michael. It does. You must believe that. Even a little good done brings a great reward. Yeah, maybe to some people. Only maybe some of us are behind an eight ball we can't get around. Michael, please come in. I feel I must talk to Not you. Not tonight, we... Reverend. But all the talking I can stand. Now I'm going to do my own thinking. And I know what I'm going to do. You can bet your sweet life I know just what I'm going to do. Yes, your mind is made up now, isn't it, Mike? Humboldt made it up for you, didn't he? You hate him, don't you, Mike? And all the smug people like him who've never done a stretch in stir. They're your enemies, aren't they, Mike? Whether you wanted them to be or not. And you're just one of the cell rats. Okay, if that's the way it is, that's the way you'll play it. What's that? Footsteps following you? Maybe if you stop by this lighted window. Yeah, you were right, Mike. They're following you, all right, two of them. You saw them duck into that doorway when you stopped and turned around. Tail of me. They got dicks tail of me. Why, sure, you dope. They wouldn't let you just walk out of there. They think you took the money. They're going to tail you, hound you, track you down. Okay. Okay, if they think I took the money, I'll give them reason to. This time, I will take it. <laughs> You are listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company. Marketers of famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Christmas, Mike. <laughs> a very merry Christmas, isn't it? Six months of going straight and you've given it up. You're going back, back to the store and get your share of those day's receipts. Yes, it's all so simple, isn't it, Mike? It'll soon be 12 o'clock midnight and old Gus will be up in the Louis 15th room on the 13th floor. The safe in Humboldt's office will be a cinch. You've seen it many times. And as for the two dicks tailing you now, it'll be duck soup to shake them. Duck soup. That's right. You're heading up 10th Avenue now. You can double back and... What's wrong, Mike? Why are you stopping? Could it be that tune, the brightly lighted window, the old man standing back there? Of course, now you remember. 10th Avenue. This is old Mr. Samuel's little store. This is it, where you're going to buy Elaine her Christmas present. And there it is. What you heard, the music box, sitting on the counter next to the open door, playing. Well, good evening, Michael, and Merry Christmas. Hiya, Mr. Samuels. You came in just in time. I was just about to close up. I guess down at your big store, you've been closed for a long time. But here, well, we little fellows have to stay open to get all the business we can. 
What can I do for you? I, uh... Is this the music box that Elaine likes so well? Ah, yes, that is the one. She was very taken with it. Ah, how her eyes sparkled when she looked at it. Yeah, there's a powder puff of something inside, isn't it? Ah, that is right. And when you open it, it plays the little tune. So. Yes, she was saying how it was her favorite tune. Okay. How much is it? Well, it's, uh... It's usually priced at 75 but I'll give it to you and the young lady for 50 $50? Well, yes, you see, it's a genuine antique, and it's the best thing I have in this store. Well, I'm I'm sorry, but that's more than I figured oh, out. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, too. I, I would have let you have it for less if I could, but 50 is the lowest. Sure, sure. Well, okay, forget it. Well, I'm sorry. Come back again. Now what's the matter, Mike? Why are you stopping? Could it be you can't make up your mind? Could it be you're thinking about the music box, about Elaine, about Christmas? Yes. This may be your last Christmas with her, you know. Your last chance to give her a decent present with clean money. Money you earn. It might be a nice gesture, eh, Mike? A little token of all that might have been. Oh, Mr. Samuels, I'll take it. Wrap it up as a gift, and I'll take it. Merry Christmas, Mike. That's what's written across the packet. It was going to be a symbol for a wonderful new life, wasn't it? And now it's an ironic farewell. Your last attempt at doing good, as Reverend Hewitt called it. Too bad it won't bring you that great reward, he promised. It won't have a chance. Because there are those two dicks still following you. And you, you're heading for J.C. Deaver's department store, office of Henry Humble, and the interior of its safe. It's almost 12 midnight, and you have to duck those guys. 30 quick. girls, 30. The greatest little show in town, starring Tootsie Laverne and her 30 raving beauties. A new show just started. Only 40 cents. Ticket, mister? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Forty cents. Thank you, sir. A new show just started. Hurry, 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 ladies and gentlemen. You're doing great, Mike. Those dicks will follow you in, but you won't be there, will you? No. You're heading for that exit sign down at the side. Through the curtains, push out through the door, and there you are. In the alley. And free. Okay. Now, up to the street. Lose yourself in the crowd. Turn down fifth toward the store. You're okay now. No need to look back. Or is there? They're there. You didn't shake them after all. They were wise to that trick, and they were waiting for you outside the theater. Yes, you should have known. Now what? Have you got an idea? Yes. A good idea, a honey. Why not lead them to the store? Sure, that's where they expect you to go. But beat them there and hide, down in the freight dock, behind one of those big crates. They'll never find you in that mess. Then when they get tired looking, you'll be able to slip in and do the job. How's that? Brilliant. Yes, brilliant. Here's the store, and there they are, a quarter of a block behind. When you hit the alley, you'll run for it. Make a dash back to the back, and you'll be so far ahead then, they won't know whether you got in or not. And you'll fool them entirely. You'll have them searching the whole store. Okay, here it is. Okay, you made it. You left them way behind. Here's the freight dock. Okay, come on, coppers. Just try and find me in here. Come on, find it. Now he's left. I told you he knew we were following him. Sure, sure. But let's not waste time. He had plenty of time to get in, probably with his employee's key. Okay, okay. Get out your skeleton and let's go in after him. Worked like a charm, didn't it, Mike? You're sitting here in your crate, comfortably waiting, while they search the entire store. They've been there long enough to do it. It's almost one. 
If they don't hurry, you'll have Gus to worry about. Not that that's too much of a worry. But wait, hold it. Well, that does it. Yeah, too bad. Hey, flash your lighter out. He could have ducked into one of these crates here. Yeah, 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 but we never find him that mess. He could play hide and seek with us there for days. Yeah, you're right. I guess we might as well call it a day. It's a fine way to spend Christmas Eve anyway. Come on, let's go home. Okay, I'm right beside you. Well, Mike, Merry Christmas. This is better than you expected. They're leaving, actually going away. Leaving the place to your tender mercies. You won't have to dodge them coming out. They aren't going to camp out in Humboldt's office. They're actually walking away, down the alley, and you're set. Good Lord, the music box. Something's wrong that's going. I can't stop. I can't. Hey, hey, Joe. Joe, listen. Yeah. I hear it. Come on, right over here. I've got to stop it. i got to. Okay, right here. In this crate. Too late. Okay, Cobb. We finally cornered you. Come on out. No use hiding in there now, Cab. Come on, come on, come on. We want to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, I know. I got the idea. Okay. Okay, you got me. Yeah. Thanks for the music. Led us right to the dance floor. Yeah. That's the great reward the minister was talking about. Great. I don't get you. Oh, you wouldn't. It's a private little joke on me. Yeah? Well, that music maybe did you a big favor, Cobb. Favor? That's right. Maybe you'll see what I mean if you'll answer a few questions for us. I don't see why I should. You got nothing to be afraid of, kid, if you'll just answer a couple of questions straight. I'll answer one. I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with okay, it. Okay, okay. You had nothing to do with it. We didn't ask you that question. We'll answer this. You bought that music box at a store on 10th Avenue a while ago, didn't you? You know I did. You saw me buy it. And you paid for it with two 20s and a 10, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, part of that money was marked. It was money that had been stolen from Deaver's department store. I tell you, it wasn't stolen. That was the dough. I got my pay envelope. All of it? Didn't somebody else give you part of it? No, I just earned the whole thing. Didn't George Osborne give you part of it? Osborne? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did. Oh. He paid me $30. He owed it. Okay. Now, this is very important. How'd Osborne pay you? In what denomination of bills? Well, I... Yeah. Yeah, I remember. He gave me three tens. Tens? You're sure? Sure, I'm sure. And the twenties came to you in your pay envelope, huh? Yeah. You'll swear to that in court? Of course. Okay. That does it. Thanks, Cobb. Hey, wait. You mean... That's all you wanted me for? It was enough. You just proved for us who stole that ten grand from the store. And the way you were acting, we did. almost thought it was you. We hadn't have known better all the time. <laughs> That's not the end of the story. The Whistler will bring it to you in just a moment. Meantime, Signal Oil Company joins with 1,800 Signal gasoline dealers throughout the West from Canada to Mexico in hoping that this has been a good Christmas for you. It wasn't the Christmas we had all hoped and prayed for. There were too many empty places at the table, too many empty places in our hearts. As we look back, we may wonder if perhaps we didn't give quite enough. Not quite enough of our effort of our money, and of our blood, which can mean life itself to a boy at the front. Yet even the regrets that may tinge this season's gladness can prove its greatest blessing if they fire us to new determination, to new and greater effort through the coming year until our prayers are finally answered and peace again returns to heal this confused and torn world. Yes, if, as this Christmas of 1944 draws to a close, we will rededicate ourselves to this, our job. We may, each of us, hasten the realization of that ancient promise. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, quite surprising, isn't it? The police didn't suspect Mike at all. You see, it was this way. Because of his record, the cops began to tail Mike in the very beginning, when the money first began to be missed. Twice they had him under observation at the very time the money was stolen, though they knew he didn't do it. But they kept watching him in the hope he would lead them to the real thief. 
And he did. Yes, because when things got hot, the thief finally tried to frame Mike by giving him some of the stolen money. Marked money this time. George Osborne? Oh, no. In fact, Osborne almost gummed things up by paying his debts. The detectives hadn't counted on that. That's why they had to be sure which bills Osborne gave Mike. The tens weren't marked. The twenties were. The twenties Mike got in his pay envelope from Humboldt. Yes, Henry Humboldt, the office manager. You see, things were getting too hot for him. The trail was getting too close. He knew the money was marked, and he knew the detectives were watching Mike. So he gave him some of the marked bills in his severance pay, trying to frame him. It couldn't have worked, of course, but Humboldt didn't know that. And neither did Mike. And Mike almost did something he'd have regretted all his life. He almost went back to a life of crime. Yes, if the music box hadn't have jammed and started playing just when it did, and the detectives had gone off, Mike's life would have gone down the skids. Because it did play when it did. Well, next week he'll be back at the store in a better job. Yes, and he got a Christmas bonus, too. They saw to that after Humboldt was arrested. And all because the music box played. Maybe that's why Mike said... <laughs> no, sir. That music box sits right there on the table where everybody can see it. <laughs> Darling, I really think it means as much to you as it does to me. Oh, I guess maybe it does, Elaine. Just like the Reverend Hewitt says, a little good brings a great reward. Yeah. For the rest of my life, that little gadget's going to mean... A Merry Christmas. Darling, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Mike. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, the Signal Oil program will bring you another strange tale by The Whistler. The Signal Oil program is broadcast for your entertainment by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous Go Father gasoline and motor oil, and by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer, who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil program, produced by George W. Allen, with music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome. Doubly welcome this special eve, of course. If you look in Webster's Dictionary under the word miracle, you can read the definition, an event or effect contrary to the established order of things. A wonder or a wonderful thing. This is the story of a miracle that took place at Christmas time. The very best of all possible times for miracles. And it begins with an ad which has appeared for ten years in the Dawson City Times and the Thomasville Courier. We'll begin the advertisement with, If the owner of the Santa Claus suit rented to Jennifer Swallow will present his copy of the receipt to me, Jasper Crown, he will be re- Oh, you'd have to include your address and your phone number, etc., of course, Jenny will include that. He will be remunerated to whatever degree he asks, up to a million dollars. Does that seem fair? Oh, it isn't fair. It's silly. 
The rental was less than a dollar. Why should it be worth any more than that? Maybe you'll never know, but I will. And everyone else who hears this story will know. Our mystery drama, A Very Private Miracle, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. This is a story of a very special time and a very special love affair between a bright and artless ten-year-old and a bitter, soured man who made himself old before his time. But however it ends, it begins with hate. What was that, Arthur? Uh, a, a rock through the window. That's an ugly mob outside. Well, yeah, no goods, inadequates, ingrates. Because you've taken their livelihood away from them. My livelihood as well. I can't go on losing money with the mill. Since Robert walks out on me, I don't need any more. But Thomasville does. Good Lord, it's the only real industry we have left to keep the town alive. Are you my lawyer or theirs? You know whose lawyer I am. My friend or theirs? That's a question which gets more and more difficult to answer. Jasper, it's Christmas. And Robert had good ideas for the mill. I don't want to hear any more about the mill or about Robert, my son, or my daughter. Most of all, I don't want to hear about Christmas. That cheap, tawdry, pagan celebration. There, at last. The riot. They'll break up that no-good rabble. That's my Christmas present to them. Finally, the police have dispersed them. Cowards all. A mob has no courage. Well, what are you going to do about the window? Close the room off. Heaven knows there are enough other rooms for me to wander through alone since I've been deserted by my family. Well, that's scarcely fair to Emily. Emily? Did I once really have a wife? Was there some warmth in this house? While my sister lived. Well, she's dead. Too many years ago for me to want to count. There's no one left but my housekeeper and me. At least Mrs. Murchison hasn't deserted me, as you want to. Go then, Arthur, go. It's safe now. The papers are all signed. Uh, I won't execute these till after the holiday. The day after Christmas. The day after Christmas is Sunday, so I can't do anything till Monday. Very well, but the execution is signed, sealed, and delivered. When I sell the mill, I'll be not a millionaire, but a multi-millionaire. Or do you mean that crowd of hicks the police just chased away? You think I'm frightened of them? Oh, I didn't mean physically, and I didn't mean concerned either. I mean terrified for your immortal soul. Oh, don't trouble. I'll let myself out. Oh, this is my turn. If I don't see you again before the great day, Merry Christmas. And a Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Daly. Who was on the phone, Mrs. Murchison? Oh, such good news for you, sir. It's little Mary herself. What did she want? Sure, she's still on the phone waiting to tell you herself. I have no wish to talk to my daughter. Ah, but when you hear her news... What uh, news? Well, uh, uh, she, she wanted to tell you herself. If she's leaving that damn foreigner and coming home alone, I'll talk to her. Otherwise, go and hang up. Without listening to what she has to say? There's only one thing I want to hear from her... An apology. Oh, you're not going to talk to Miss Mary? No. I wanted to save the news for her to give you. Oh, but now, sure, I have to say it myself. It's a baby she's going to have. She wanted you to know you're going to be a grandfather. No, oh, some penniless foreigner. No, thank you. You can tell Mrs. Blumenthal it won't work. 
She's still as completely cut out of my will as her brother. When you hang up the phone, you can bring me a cup of tea. I'll be in the library. Oh. The good Lord favor me and put the words in my mouth. Uh, uh, Mary, sweetheart, forgive me for being gone this long. Well, that's all right, Mert, honey. Is Dad there? Well, uh, Mother, I mean, to tell you the truth, he's after having a little bit of a light on, and, um... Well, it's all right. I know what he's lying down on. Any reconciliation with me. I thought... Maybe the time of year and the baby. Did you tell him about the baby? Well, I I didn't want to. I, I wanted it to be your surprise, but... Uh... Okay. Forget it. I get the whole picture. Maybe I knew before I tried again. Now I know it's hopeless. Merry Christmas to you, Merch, love, anyway. And a happy new year. Oh, Mary, my darling. Oh, what's the use? How long can you fight? If he just wasn't so stubborn. If only Mr. Crown could forget himself and accept someone else into his heart. Come in. It's your tea, Mr. Crown. No, thanks. Just put it on the table. Yes, sir. Well, was there something else? Yes, Mr. Clown. This next Christmas would be my 25th that I've served your family. Oh, in heaven's name, spare me the Christmas spirit. It's choking me. Well, it's choking some of the rest of us, too, Mr. Clown. Everyone has a limit. You're not alone in that. I've just been talking to Mary, and I've lived through a long, difficult time in your family. I'm given my notice. Before dinner? I honestly don't care if you ever eat again or live. I just have time to catch the next bus. I'll send someone else to clear out everything that's left of mine in this house. I want no part of it or you ever again. A little while later, the front doorbell rang. With Mrs. Murchison gone, Jasper was tempted not to answer it. But when it rang again, some secret urgency drew him down the long corridor. On the walk, he winced. His elbow pained him, and the arthritis in his right leg jumped in 